Part One of the Introduction to Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part One of the Introduction to Plato's Republic, translated by Benjamin Jowett. The Republic of Plato is the longest of his works, with the exception of the Laws, and is certainly the greatest of them. There are nearer approaches to modern metaphysics in the philibus and in the sophist. The politicus, or statesman, is more ideal. The form and institutions of the state are more clearly drawn out in the laws. As works of art, the symposium and the protagoras are of higher excellence. But no other dialogue of Plato has the same largeness of view and the same perfection of style. No other shows an equal knowledge of the world, or contains more of those thoughts which are new as well as old, and not of one age only, but of all. Nowhere in Plato is there a deeper irony, or a greater wealth of humor, or imagery, or more dramatic power. Nor in any other of his writings is the attempt made to interweave life and speculation, or to connect politics with philosophy. The Republic is the center around which the other dialogues may be grouped, here philosophy reaches the highest point, to which ancient thinkers ever attained. Plato among the Greeks, like Bacon among the moderns, was the first who conceived a method of knowledge, although neither of them distinguished the bare outline or form from the substance of truth, and both of them had to be content with an abstraction of science which was not yet realized. He was the greatest metaphysical genius whom the world has ever seen, and in him, more than in any other ancient thinker, the germs of future knowledge are contained. The sciences of logic and psychology, which have supplied so many instruments of thought to after ages, are based upon the analyses of Socrates and Plato. The principles of definition, the law of contradiction, the fallacy of arguing in a circle, the distinction between the essence and accidents of a thing or notion, between means and ends, between causes and conditions, also the division of the mind into the rational, concupiscent, and irascible elements, or of pleasures and desires into necessary and unnecessary. These, and other great forms of thought, are all of them to be found in the Republic, and were probably first invented by Plato. The greatest of all logical truths, and the one of which writers on philosophy are most apt to lose sight, the difference between words and things, has been most strenuously insisted on by him, although he has not always avoided the confusion of them in his own writings. But he does not bind up truth in logical formulae. Logic is still veiled in metaphysics, and the science which he imagines to contemplate all truth and all existence is very unlike the doctrine of the syllogism which Aristotle claims to have discovered. Neither must we forget that the Republic is but the third part of a still larger design, which was to have included an ideal history of Athens, as well as a political and physical philosophy. The fragment of the Critias has given birth to a world-famous fiction, second only in importance to the tale of Troy and the legend of Arthur, and is said as a fact to have inspired some of the early navigators of the 16th century. This mythical tale, of which the subject was a history of the wars of the Athenians against the island of Atlantis, is supposed to be founded upon an unfinished poem of Solon, to which it would have stood in the same relation as the writings of the logographers to the poems of Homer. It would have told of a struggle for liberty, intended to represent the conflict of Persia and Hellas. We may judge from the noble commencement of the Timaeus, from the fragment of the Critias itself, and from the third book of the Laws, in which manner Plato would have treated this high argument. We can only guess why the great design was abandoned, perhaps because Plato became sensible of some incongruity in a fictitious history, or because he had lost his interest in it, or because advancing years forbade the completion of it. We may please ourselves with the fancy that, had this imaginative narrative ever been finished, we would have found Plato himself sympathizing with the struggle for Hellenic independence singing a hymn of triumph over Marathon and Salamis, perhaps making the reflection of Herodotus where he contemplates the growth of the Athenian Empire, 
how brave a thing is freedom of speech which has made the athenians so far exceed every other state of hellas in greatness or more probably attributing the victory to the ancient good order of athens and to the favor of apollo and athena again plato may be regarded as the captain or leader of a goodly band of followers for in the republic is to be found the original of cicero's de republica of st augustine's city of god of the utopia of sir thomas more and of the numerous other imaginary states which are framed upon the same model the extent to which aristotle or the aristotelian school were indebted to him in the politics has been little recognized and the recognition is the more necessary because it is not made by aristotle himself the two philosophers had more in common than they were conscious of and probably some elements of plato remain still undetected in aristotle in english philosophy too many affinities may be traced not only in the works of the cambridge platonists but in the great original writers like berkeley or coleridge to plato and his ideas that there is a truth higher than experience of which the mind bears witness to herself is a conviction which in our generation has been enthusiastically asserted and is perhaps gaining ground of the greek authors who at the renaissance brought a new life into the world plato has had the greatest influence the republic of plato is also the first treatise upon education of which the writings of milton and locke rousseau jean paul and Goethe are the legitimate descendants like dante or bunyan he has a revelation of another life like bacon he is profoundly impressed with the unity of knowledge in the early church he exercised a real influence on theology and at the revival of literature on politics even the fragments of his words when repeated at second hand have in all ages ravished the hearts of men who have seen reflected in them their own higher nature he is the father of idealism in philosophy in politics in literature and many of the latest conceptions of modern thinkers and statesmen such as the unity of knowledge the reign of law and the equality of the sexes have been anticipated in a dream by him the argument of the republic is the search after justice the nature of which is first hinted at by cephalus the just and blameless old man then discussed on the basis of proverbial morality by socrates and polemarchus then caricatured by thrasymachus and partially explained by socrates reduced to an abstraction by glaucon and adeimantus and having become invisible in the individual reappears at length in the ideal state which is constructed by socrates the first care of the rulers is to be education of which an outline is drawn after the old hellenic model providing only for an improved religion and morality and more simplicity in music and gymnastic a manlier strain of poetry and greater harmony of the individual and the state we are thus led on to the conception of a higher state in which no man calls anything his own and in which there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage and kings are philosophers and philosophers are kings and there is another and higher education intellectual as well as moral and religious of science as well as of art and not only of youth but of the whole life such a state is hardly to be realized in this world and quickly degenerates to the perfect ideal succeeds the government of the soldier and the lover of honor this again declining into democracy and democracy into tyranny into an imaginary but regular order having not much resemblance to the actual facts when the wheel has come full circle we do not begin again with a new period of human life but we have passed from the best to the worst and there we end the subject is then changed and the old quarrel of poetry and philosophy which has now been more lightly treated in the earlier books of the republic is now resumed and fought out to a conclusion poetry is discovered to be an imitation thrice removed from the truth and homer as well as the dramatic poets having been condemned as an imitator is sent into banishment along with them and the idea of the state is supplemented by the revelation 
of a future life. The division into books, like all similar divisions, is probably later than the age of Plato. The natural divisions are five in number. Book one and the first half of book two down to the paragraph beginning, I had always admired the genius of Glaucon and Adeimantus, which is introductory. The first book containing a refutation of the popular and sophistical notions of justice, and concluding, like some of the earlier dialogues, without arriving at any definite result. To this is appended a restatement of the nature of justice according to common opinion, and an answer is demanded to the question, what is justice, stripped of appearances? The second division, too, includes the remainder of the second and the whole of the third and fourth books, which are mainly occupied with the construction of the first state and the first education. The third division, three, consists in the fifth, sixth, and seventh books, in which philosophy, rather than justice, is the subject of inquiry, and the second state is constructed on principles of communism and ruled by philosophers, and the contemplation of the idea of good takes the place of the social and political virtues. In the eighth and ninth books, four, the perversions of states and of the individuals who correspond to them are reviewed in succession, and the nature of pleasure and the principle of tyranny are further analyzed in the individual man. The tenth book, five, is the conclusion of the whole, in which the relations of philosophy to poetry are finally determined, and the happiness of the citizens in this life, which has now been assured, is crowned by the vision of another. Or, a more general division into two parts may be adopted. The first, books one through four, containing the description of a state framed generally in accordance with Hellenic notions of religion and morality, while in the second, the Hellenic state is transformed into an ideal kingdom of philosophy, of which all other governments are the perversions. These two points of view are really opposed, and the opposition is only veiled by the genius of Plato. The Republic, like the Phaedrus, is an imperfect whole. The higher light of philosophy breaks through the regularity of the Hellenic temple, which at last fades away into the heavens. Whether this imperfection of structure arises from an enlargement of the plan, or from the imperfect reconcilement in the writer's own mind of the struggling elements of thought which are now first brought together by him, or perhaps from the composition of the work at different times, are questions like the similar question about the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are worth asking, but which cannot have a distinct answer. In the age of Plato there was no regular mode of publication, and an author would have less scruple in altering or adding to a work which was known only to a few of his friends. There is no absurdity in supposing that he might have laid his labors aside for a time, or turned from one work to another, and such interruptions would be more likely to occur in the case of a long than of a short writing. In all attempts to determine the chronological order of the Platonic writings on internal evidence, this uncertainty about any single dialogue being composed at any one time is a disturbing element, which must be admitted to affect longer works, such as the Republic and the Laws, more than the shorter ones. But on the other hand, the seeming discrepancies of the Republic may only arise out of the discordant elements which the philosopher has attempted to unite in a single whole, perhaps without being himself able to recognize the inconsistency which is obvious to us. For there is a judgment of after ages which few great writers have ever been able to anticipate for themselves. They do not perceive the want of connection in their own writings, or the gaps in their own systems, which are visible enough to those who come after them. In the beginnings of literature and philosophy, amid the first efforts of thought and language, more inconsistencies occur than now, when the paths of speculation are well worn in the meaning of words precisely defined. For consistency, too, is the growth of time, and some of the greatest creations of the human mind have been wanting only in unity. Tried by this test, several of the platonic dialogues according to our modern ideas appear to be defective but the deficiency is no proof that they were composed at different times or by different hands and the supposition that the republic was written uninterruptedly and by continuous effort 
is in some degrees confirmed by the numerous references from one part of the work to another. The second title, Concerning Justice, is not the one by which the Republic is quoted, either by Aristotle or generally in antiquity, and, like the other second titles of the Platonic Dialogues, may therefore be assumed to be of later date. Morgenstern and others have asked whether the definition of justice, which is the professed aim or the construction of the state, is the principal argument of the work. The answer is that the two blend in one, and are two faces of the same truth, for justice is the order of the state, and the state is the visible embodiment of justice under the conditions of human society. The one is the soul, and the other is the body, and the Greek ideal of the state as of the individual, is a fair mind and a fair body. In Hegelian phraseology, the state is the reality of which justice is the idea. Or, described in Christian language, the kingdom of God is within, yet develops in a church or external kingdom. The house not made with hands, internal in the heavens, is reduced to the proportions of an earthly building. Or, to use a Platonic image, justice and the state are the warp and the woof, which run through the whole texture. And when the constitution of the state is completed, the conception of justice is not dismissed, but reappears under the same or different names throughout the work, both as the inner law of the individual soul, and finally as the principle of rewards and punishments in another life. The virtues are based on justice, of which common honesty in buying and selling is the shadow, and justice is based on the idea of good, which is the harmony of the world, and is reflected both in the institutions of states and the, in the motions of the heavenly bodies. The Timaeus, which takes up the political rather than the ethical side of the Republic, is chiefly occupied with hypotheses concerning the outward world, yet contains many indications that the same law is supposed to reign over the state, over nature, and over man. Too much, however, has been made of this question, both in ancient and modern times. There is a stage of criticism in which all works, whether of nature or of art, are referred to design. Now, in ancient writings, and indeed in literature generally, there remains often a large element which was not comprehended in the original design, for the plan grows under the author's hand. New thoughts occur to him in the act of writing. He has not worked out the argument to the end before he begins. The reader who seeks to find one idea under which the whole may be conceived must necessarily seize on the vaguest and most general. Thus Staubaum, who is dissatisfied with the ordinary explanations of the argument of the Republic, imagines himself to have found the true argument in the representation of human life in a state perfected by justice and governed according to the idea of good. There may be some use in such general descriptions, but they can hardly be said to express the design of the writer. The truth is that we may as well speak of many designs as of one, nor need anything be excluded from the plan of a great work to which the mind is naturally led by the association of ideas, and which does not interfere with the general purpose. What kind or degree of unity is to be sought after in a building, in the plastic arts, in poetry, in prose? is a problem which has to be determined relatively to the subject matter. To Plato himself, the inquiry, what was the intention of the writer, or what was the principal argument of the Republic, would have been hardly intelligible, and therefore had better be at once dismissed. End of Introduction, Part 1Part 2 of the Introduction to Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 2 of the Introduction to Plato's Republic. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Is not the Republic the vehicle of three or four truths, which, to Plato's own mind, are most naturally represented in the form of the state? just as in the Jewish prophets the reign of Messiah, or the day of the Lord, or the suffering servant, or people of God, or the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, only convey to us at least their great spiritual ideals. 
So, through the Greek state, Plato reveals to us his own thoughts about divine perfection, which is the idea of good, like the sun in the visible world, about human perfection, which is justice, about education beginning in youth and continuing in later years, about poets and sophists and tyrants, who are the false teachers and evil rulers of mankind, about the world, which is the embodiment of them, about a kingdom which exists nowhere upon earth, but is laid up in heaven to be the pattern and rule of human life. No such inspired creation is at unity with itself, any more than the clouds of heaven when the sun pierces through them. Every shade of light and dark, of truth and of fiction, which is the veil of truth, is allowable in a work of philosophical imagination. It is not all on the same plane. It easily passes from ideas to myths and fancies, from facts to figures of speech. It is not prose but poetry, at least a great part of it, and ought not to be judged by the rules of logic or the probabilities of history. The writer is not fashioning his ideas into an artistic whole. They take possession of him and are too much for him. We have no need, therefore, to discuss whether a state such as Plato has conceived is practicable or not, or whether the outward form or the inward life came first into the mind of the writer. For the practicality of his ideas has nothing to do with their truth, and the highest thoughts to which he attains may be truly said to bear the greatest marks of design, justice more than the external framework of the state, the idea of good more than justice. The great science of dialectic, or the organization of ideas, has no real content. It is only a type of the method or spirit in which the higher knowledge is to be pursued by the spectator of all time and all existence. It is in the fifth, sixth, and seventh books that Plato reaches the summit of speculation, and these, although they fail to satisfy the requirements of a modern thinker, may therefore be regarded as the most important, as they are also the most original, portions of the work. It is not necessary to discuss at length a minor question which has been raised by Boeck respecting the imaginary date at which the conversation was held. The year 411 B.C., which is proposed by him, will do as well as any other. For a work of fiction, and especially a writer who, like Plato, is notoriously careless of chronology, only aims at general probability. Whether all the persons mentioned in the Republic could ever have met at any one time is not a difficulty which would have occurred to an Athenian reading the work forty years later, or to Plato himself at the time of his writing, any more than to Shakespeare respecting one of his dramas, and need not greatly trouble us now. Yet this may be a question having no answer, which is still worth asking, because the investigation shows that we cannot argue historically from the dates in Plato. It would be useless, therefore, to waste time in inventing far-fetched reconcilements of them in order to avoid chronological difficulties, such, for example, as the conjecture of C. F. Herman that Glaucon and Adeimantus are not the brothers but the uncles of Plato, or the fancy of Stahlbaum that Plato intentionally left anachronisms indicating the dates at which some of his dialogues were written. The principal characters in the Republic are Cephalus, Polemarchus, Thrasymachus, Socrates, Glaucon, and Adeimantus. Cephalus appears in the introduction only. Polemarchus drops at the end of the first argument, and Thrasymachus is reduced to silence at the close of the first book. The main discussion is carried on by Socrates, Glaucon, and Adeimantus. Among the company is Lysias, the orator, and Euthydemus, the sons of Cephalus and the brothers of Polemarchus, an unknown Charmantides. These are mute auditors. There is also a Clytophon, who at once interrupts, where, is in the dialogue which bears his name, he appears as the friend and ally of Thrasymachus. Cephalus, the patriarch of the house, has been appropriately engaged in offering a sacrifice. He is the pattern of an old man who has almost done with life, and is at peace with himself and with all mankind. He feels that he is drawing nearer to the world below, and seems to linger about the memory of the past. He is eager that Socrates should come to visit him, fond of the poetry of the last generation. 
happy in the consciousness of a well-spent life, glad at having escaped from the tyranny of youthful lusts. His love of conversation, his affection, his indifference to riches, even his garrulity, are interesting traits of character. He is not one of those who have nothing to say, because their whole mind has been absorbed in making money. Yet he acknowledges that riches have the advantage of placing men above the temptation to dishonesty or falsehood. The respectful attention shown to him by Socrates, whose love of conversation, no less than the mission imposed upon him by the oracle, leads him to ask questions of all men, young and old alike, should also be noted. Who better suited to raise the question of justice than Cephalus, whose life might seem to be the expression of it? The moderation with which old age is pictured by Cephalus as a very tolerable portion of existence is characteristic not only of him, but of Greek feeling generally, and contrasts with the exaggeration of Cicero in De Senectute. The evening of life is described by Plato in the most expressive manner, yet with the fewest possible touches. As Cicero remarks, the aged Cephalus would have been out of place in the discussion which follows, and which he could neither have understood nor taken part in, without a violation of dramatic propriety. His son and heir, Polemarchus, has the frankness and impetuousness of youth. He is for detaining Socrates by force in the opening scene, and will not let him off on the subject of women and children. Like Cephalus, he is limited in his point of view, and represents the proverbial stage of morality, which has rules of life rather than principles, and he quotes Simonides, as his father had quoted Pindar. But after this he has no more to say. The answers which he makes are only elicited from him by the dialectic of Socrates. He has not yet experienced the influence of the Sophists like Glaucon and Adeimantus, nor is he sensible of the necessity of refuting them. He belongs to the pre-Socratic or pre-dialectical age. He is incapable of arguing, and is bewildered by Socrates to such a degree that he does not know what he is saying. He is made to admit that justice is a thief, and that the virtues follow the analogy of the arts. From his brother Lysias we learn that he fell a victim to the thirty tyrants, but no allusion is made here to his fate, nor to the circumstance that Cephalus and his family were of Syracusian origin, and had migrated from Thurii to Athens. The Chalcedonian giant, Thrasymachus, of whom we had already heard in the Phaedrus, is the personification of the sophists, according to Plato's conception of them, in some of their worst characteristics. He is vain and blustering, refusing to discourse unless he is paid, fond of making an oration, and hoping thereby to escape the inevitable Socrates, but a mere child in argument, and unable to foresee that the next move, to use a platonic expression, will shut him up. He has reached the stage of framing general notions, and in this respect is in advance of Cephalus and Polemarchus, but he is incapable of defending them in a discussion, and vainly tries to cover his confusion with banter and insolence. Whether such doctrines as are attributed to him by Plato were really held either by him or by any other sophist is uncertain. In the infancy of philosophy, serious airs about morality might easily grow up. They are certainly put into the mouths of speakers in Thucydides, but we are concerned at present with Plato's description of him, and not with the historical reality. The inequality of the contest adds greatly to the humor of the scene. The pompous and empty sophist is utterly helpless in the hands of the great master of dialectic, who knows how to touch all the springs of vanity and weakness in him. He is greatly irritated by the irony of Socrates, but his noisy and imbecile rage only lays him more and more open to the thrust of his assailant. His determination to cram down their throats, or put bodily into their souls his own words, elicits a cry of horror from Socrates. The state of his temper is quite as worthy of remark as the process of the argument. Nothing is more amusing than his complete submission when he has been once thoroughly beaten. At first he seems to continue the discussion with reluctance, but soon with apparent good will, and he even testifies his interest at a later stage by one or two occasional remarks. When attacked by Glaucon, he is humorously protected by Socrates, as one 
who has never been his enemy and is now his friend. From Cicero and Quintilian, and from Aristotle's rhetoric, we learn that the sophist whom Plato has made so ridiculous was a man of note, whose writings were preserved in later ages. The play on his name, which has been made by his contemporary Herodicus, was Wast ever bold in battle, seems to show that the description of him is not devoid of verisimilitude. When Thrasymachus has been silenced, the two principal respondents, Glaucon and Adeimantus, appear on the scene. Here, as in Greek tragedy, three actors are introduced. At first sight, the two sons of Ariston may seem to wear a family likeness, like the two friends Simeus and Cabes in the Phaedo. But on a nearer examination of them, the similarity vanishes, and they are seen to be distinct characters. Glaucon is the impetuous youth who can just never have enough of fetching. The man of pleasure who is acquainted with the mysteries of love, the Juvenis qui gaudet canibus, who improves the breed of animals, the lover of art and music who has all the experiences of youthful life. He is full of quickness and penetration, piercing easily below the clumsy platitudes of Thrasymachus to the real difficulty. He turns out to the light, the seamy side of human life, and yet does not lose faith in the just and true. It is Glaucon who seizes what may be termed the ludicrous relation of the philosopher to the world, to whom a state of simplicity is a city of pigs, who is always prepared with a jest when the argument offers him an opportunity, and who is ever ready to second the humor of Socrates, and to appreciate the ridiculous, whether in connoisseurs of music, or in the lovers of theatricals, or in the fantastic behavior of the citizens of democracy. His weaknesses are several times alluded to by Socrates, who, however, will not allow him to be attacked by his brother, Adeimantus. He is a soldier, and, like Adeimantus, has been distinguished at the Battle of Megara. The character of Adeimantus is deeper and graver, and the profounder objections are commonly put into his mouth. Glaucon is more demonstrative, and generally opens the game. Adeimantus pursues the argument further. Glaucon has more of the liveliness and quick sympathy of youth. Adeimantus has the maturer judgment of a grown-up man of the world. In the second book, when Glaucon insists that justice and injustice shall be considered without regard to their consequences, Adeimantus remarks that they are regarded by mankind in general only for the sake of their consequences, and, in a similar vein of reflection, he urges at the beginning of the fourth book that Socrates fails in making his citizens happy, and is answered that happiness is not the first, but the second thing, not the direct aim, but the indirect consequence of the good government of a state. In the discussion about religion and mythology, Adeimantus is the respondent, but Glaucon breaks in with a slight jest, and carries on the conversation, in a lighter tone, about music and gymnastic to the end of the book. It is Adeimantus again who volunteers the criticism of common sense on the Socratic method of argument, and who refuses to let Socrates pass lightly over the question of women and children. It is Adeimantus who is the respondent in the more argumentative, as Glaucon in the lighter and more imaginative portions of the dialogue. For example, throughout the greater part of the sixth book, the causes of the corruption of philosophy and the conception of the idea of good are discussed with Adeimantus. Glaucon resumes his place of principal respondent, but he has a difficulty in apprehending the higher education of Socrates, and makes some false hits in the course of the discussion. Once more, Adeimantus returns with the allusion to his brother Glaucon, whom he compares to the contentious state. In the next book, he is again superseded, and Glaucon continues to the end. Thus, in a succession of characters, Plato represents the successive stages of morality, beginning with the Athenian gentleman of the olden time, who is followed by the practical man of that day, regulating his life by proverbs and saws. To him succeeds the wild generalization of the sophists, and lastly come the young disciples of the great teacher, who know the sophistical arguments, but will not be convinced by them, and desire to go deeper into the nature of things. These two, like Cephalus, Polemarchus, and Thrasymachus, are clearly distinguished from one another. 
neither in the Republic nor in any other dialogue of Plato is a single character repeated. The delineation of Socrates in the Republic is not wholly consistent. In the first book we have more of the real Socrates, such as he is depicted in the memorabilia of Xenophon, in the earliest dialogues of Plato, and in the Apology. He is ironical, provoking, questioning, the old enemy of the sophists, ready to put on the mask of Silenus, as well as to argue seriously. But in the sixth book his enmity towards the sophists abates. He acknowledges that they are the representatives rather than the corruptors of the world. He also becomes more dogmatic and constructive, passing beyond the range either of the political or the speculative ideas of the real Socrates. In one passage Plato himself seems to intimate that the time has now come for Socrates, who had passed his whole life in philosophy, to give his own opinion, and not to be always repeating the notions of other men. There is no evidence that either the idea of good, or the conception of a perfect state, were comprehended in the Socratic teaching, though he certainly dwelt on the nature of the universal, and of final causes. And a deep thinker like him, in his thirty or forty years of public teaching, could hardly have failed to touch on the nature of family relations, for which there is also some positive evidence in the memorabilia. The Socratic method is nominally retained, and every inference is either put into the mouth of the respondent, or represented as the common discovery of him and Socrates. But any one can see that this is a mere form, of which the affectation grows wearisome as the work advances. The method of inquiry has passed into a method of teaching, in which, by the help of interlocutors, the same thesis is looked at from various points of view. The nature of the process is truly characterized by Glaucon, when he describes himself as a companion who is not good for much in an investigation, but can see what he has shown, and may perhaps give the answer to a question more fluently than another. Neither can we be absolutely certain that Socrates himself taught the immortality of the soul, which is unknown to his disciple Glaucon in the Republic. Nor is there any reason to suppose that he used myths or revelations of another world as a vehicle of instruction, or that he would have banished poetry, or have denounced the Greek mythology. His favorite oath is retained, and a slight mention is made of the daimonium, or internal sign, which is alluded to by Socrates as a phenomena peculiar to himself. A real element of Socratic teaching, which is more prominent in the Republic than in any other dialogues of Plato, is the use of example and illustration. Let us apply the test of common interests. You, says Adeimantus, ironically in the sixth book, are so unaccustomed to speak in images. And this use of examples, or images, though truly Socratic in origin, is enlarged by the genius of Plato, into the form of an allegory or parable, which embodies in the concrete, which has been already described, or is about to be described, in the abstract. Thus the figure of the cave in Book 7 is a recapitulation of the divisions of knowledge in Book 6. The composite animal, in Book 9, is an allegory of the parts of the soul. The noble captain, and the ship, and the true pilot, in Book 6, are a figure of the relation of the people to the philosophers in the state, which has been described. Other figures, such as the dog, or the marriage of the portionless maiden, or the drones and wasps in the eighth and ninth book, also form links of connection in long passages, or are used to recall previous discussions. Plato is most true to the character of his master when he describes him as not of this world. And with this representation of him, the ideal state and the other paradoxes of the Republic are quite in accordance, though they cannot be shown to have been speculations of Socrates. To him, as to the other great teachers, both philosophical and religious, when they looked upward, the world seemed to be the embodiment of error and evil. The common sense of mankind has revolted against this view, or has only partially admitted it. And even in Socrates himself, the sterner judgment of the multitude at times passes into a sort of ironical pity or love. Men in general are incapable of philosophy, and are therefore at enmity with the philosopher. But their misunderstanding of him is unavoidable, for they have never seen him as he truly is in his own image. 
they are only acquainted with artificial systems, possessing no native force of truth, words which admit of many applications. Their leaders have nothing to measure with, and are therefore ignorant of their own stature. But they are to be pitied or laughed at, not to be quarreled with. They mean well with their nostrums, if they could only learn that they are cutting off a hydra's head. This moderation towards those who are in error is one of the most characteristic features of Socrates in the Republic. In all the different representations of Socrates, whether in Xenophon or Plato, and amid the differences of the earlier or later dialogues, he always retains the character of the unwearied and disinterested seeker after truth, without which he would have ceased to be Socrates. Persons in the Republic Dialogue Socrates, who is the narrator? Glaucon, Adeimantus, Polemarchus, Cephalus, Thrasymachus, Clytophon, and others who are mute auditors. The scene is laid in the house of Cephalus, at the Piraeus, and the whole dialogue is narrated by Socrates the day after it actually took place, to Timaeus, Hermocrates, Critias, and a nameless person, who are introduced in the Timaeus. End of Introduction Book One, Part One of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M.B. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book One, Part One. I went down yesterday to the Piraeus with Glaucon, the son of Ariston, that I might offer up my prayers to the goddess, Bendis, the Thracian Artemis, and also because I wanted to see in what manner they would celebrate the festival, which was a new thing. I was delighted with the procession of the inhabitants, but that of the Thracians was equally, if not more, beautiful. When we had finished our prayers and viewed the spectacle, we turned in the direction of the city, and at that instant Polymarchus, the son of Cephalus, chanced to catch sight of us from a distance as we were starting on our way home, and told his servant to run and bid us wait for him. The servant took hold of me by the cloak behind, and said, Polymarchus desires you to wait. I turned round and asked him where his master was. There he is, said the youth, coming after you, if you will only wait. Certainly we will, said Glaucon, and after a few minutes, Polymarchus appeared, and with him Adamantus, Glaucon's brother, Nicaratus, the son of Nicias, and several others who had been at the procession. Polymarchus said to me, I perceive, Socrates, that you and your companion are already on your way to the city. You are not far wrong, I said. But do you see, he rejoined, how many we are? Of course. And are you stronger than all these? For if not, you will have to remain where you are. May there not be the alternative, I said, that we may persuade you to let us go? But can you persuade us if we refuse to listen to you, he said? Certainly not, replied Glaucon. Then we are not going to listen. Of that you may be assured. Adamantus added, Has no one told you of the torch race on horseback in honor of the goddess which will take place in the evening? With horses, I replied, that is a novelty. Will horsemen carry torches and pass them one to another during the race? Yes, said Polymarchus, and not only so, but a festival will be celebrated at night, which you certainly ought to see. Let us rise soon after supper and see this festival. There will be a gathering of young men, and we will have a good talk. Stay, then, and do not be perverse. Glaucon said, I suppose, since you insist, that we must. Very good, I replied. Accordingly, we went with Polymarchus to his house, and there we found his brothers, Lysias and Euthydemus, and with them Thrasymachus the Chalcedonian, Charmantides the Paneian, 
and Clitophon, the son of Aristolimus. There was, too, Cephalus, the father of Polemarchus, whom I had not seen for a long time, and I thought him very much aged. He was seated on a cushioned chair, and had a garland on his head, for he had been sacrificing in the court. And there were some other chairs in the room arranged in a semicircle upon which we sat down by him. He saluted me eagerly, and then he said, You don't come to see me, Socrates, as often as you ought. If I were still able to go and see you, I would not ask you to come to me. But at my age I can hardly get to the city, and therefore you should come oftener to the Piraeus. For let me tell you that the more the pleasures of the body fade away, the greater to me is the pleasure and charm of conversation. Do not then deny my request, but make our house your resort, and keep company with these young men. We are old friends, and you will be quite at home with us. I replied, There is nothing which for my part I like better, Cephalus, than conversing with aged men, for I regard them as travellers who have gone a journey which I too may have to go, and of whom I ought to inquire whether the way is smooth and easy or rugged and difficult and this is a question which I should like to ask of you who have arrived at that time which the poets call the threshold of old age. Is life harder towards the end, or what report do you give of it? I will tell you, Socrates, he said, what my own feeling is. Men of my age flock together. We are birds of a feather, as the old proverb says and at our meetings the tale of my acquaintance commonly is i cannot eat i cannot drink the pleasures of youth and love are fled away there was a good time once but now that is gone and life is no longer life some complain of the slights which are put upon them by relations and they will tell you sadly of how many evils their old age is the cause but to me socrates these complainers seem to blame that which is not really in fault for if old age were the cause, I too being old, and every other old man would have felt as they do. But this is not my own experience, nor that of others whom I have known. How well I remember the aged poet Sophocles when in answer to the question, How does love suit with age? Sophocles, are you still the man you were? Peace, he replied, most gladly have I escaped the thing of which you speak. I feel as if I had escaped from a mad and furious master. His words have occurred to my mind since, and they seem as good to me now as at the time when he uttered them, for certainly old age has a great sense of calm and freedom. When the passions relax their hold, then, as Sophocles says, we are freed from the grasp not of one mad master only, but of many. The truth is, Socrates, that these regrets, and also the complaints about relations, are to be attributed to the same cause, which is not old age, but men's characters and tempers. For he who is of a calm and happy nature will hardly feel the pressure of age, but to him who is of an opposite disposition, youth and age are equally a burden. I listened in admiration, and wanting to draw him out that he might go on, Yes, Cephalus, I said, but I rather suspect that people in general are not convinced by you when you speak thus. They think that old age sits lightly upon you not because of your happy disposition, but because you are rich, and wealth is well known to be a great comforter. You are right, he replied. They are not convinced and there is something in what they say. Not, however, so much as they imagine. I might answer them as Themistocles answered the Serfian who was abusing him and saying that he was famous, not for his own merits, but because he was an Athenian. If you had been a native of my country or I of yours, neither of us would have been famous. And to those who are not rich and are impatient of old age, the same reply may be made. For to the good poor man old age cannot be a light burden, nor can a bad rich man ever have peace with himself. May I ask, Cephalus, whether your fortune was for the most part inherited or acquired by you? Acquired. Socrates, do you want to know how much I acquired? 
in the art of making money i have been midway between my father and grandfather for my grandfather whose name i bear doubled and trebled the value of his patrimony that which he inherited being much what i possess now but my father lysanias reduced the property below what it is at present and i shall be satisfied if i leave to these my sons not less but a little more than i received that is why i asked you the question i replied because i see that you are indifferent about money which is a characteristic rather of those who have inherited their fortunes than of those who have acquired them the makers of fortunes have a second love of money as a creation of their own resembling the affection of authors for their own poems or of parents for their children besides that natural love of it for the sake of use and profit which is common to them and all men and hence they are very bad company for they can't talk about anything but the praises of wealth that is true he said yes that is very true but may i ask another question what do you consider to be the greatest blessing which you have reaped from your wealth one he said of which i could not expect easily to convince others for let me tell you socrates that when a man thinks himself to be near death fears and cares enter into his mind which he never had before the tales of a world below and punishment which is exacted there of deeds done here were once a laughing matter to him but now he is tormented with the thought that they may be true either from the weakness of age or because he is now drawing nearer to that other place he has a clearer view of these things suspicions and alarms crowd thickly upon him and he begins to reflect and consider what wrongs he has done to others and when he finds that the sum of his transgressions is great he will many a time like a child start up in his sleep for fear and he is filled with dark forebodings but to him who is conscious of no sin sweet hope as pindar charmingly says is the kind nurse of his age hope he says cherishes the soul of him who lives in justice and holiness and is the nurse of his age and the companion of his journey hope which is the mightiest to sway the restless soul of man how admirable are his words and the great blessing of riches i do not say to every man but to a good man is that he has no occasion to deceive or to defraud others either intentionally or unintentionally and when he departs to the world below he is not in any apprehension about offerings due to the gods or debts which he owes to men now to this peace of mind the possession of wealth greatly contributes and therefore i say that setting one thing against another of the many advantages which wealth has to give to a man of sense this is in my opinion the greatest well said cephalus i replied but as concerning justice what is it to speak the truth and to pay your debts no more than this and even to this are there not exceptions suppose that a friend when in his right mind has deposited arms with me and he asks for them when he is not in his right mind ought i to give them back to him no one would say that i ought or that i should be right in doing so any more than he would say that i ought always to speak the truth and to one who is in his condition you are quite right he replied but then i said speaking the truth and paying your debts is not a correct definition of justice quite correct socrates if simonides is to be believed said polemarchus interposing i fear said cephalus that i must go now for i have to look after the sacrifices and i hand over the argument to polemarchus and the company is not polemarchus your heir i said to be sure he answered and went away laughing to the sacrifices tell me then o thou heir of the argument what did simonides say and according to you truly say about justice he said that the repayment of a debt is just and in saying so he appears to me to be right 
I should be sorry to doubt the word of such a wise and inspired man, but his meaning, though probably clear to you, is the reverse of clear to me, for he certainly does not mean, as we were just now saying, that I ought to return a deposit of arms, or anything else, to one who asks for it when he is not in his right senses. And yet a deposit cannot be denied to be a debt. True. Then when the person who asks me is not in his right mind, I am by no means to make the return? Certainly not. When Simonides said that the repayment of a debt was justice, he did not mean to include that case? Certainly not, for he thinks that a friend ought always to do good to a friend and never evil. You mean that the return of a deposit of gold, which is to the injury of the receiver, if the two parties are friends, is not the repayment of a debt? That is what you would imagine him to say? Yes. And are enemies also to receive what we owe to them? To be sure, he said, they are to receive what we owe them. And an enemy, as I take it, owes to an enemy that which is due or proper to him. That is to say, evil. Simonides, then, after the manner of poets, would seem to have spoken darkly of the nature of justice for he really meant to say that justice is the giving to each man what is proper to him, and this he termed a debt. That must have been his meaning, he said. By heaven, I replied, and if we asked him what due or proper thing is given by medicine and to whom, what answer do you think that he would make to us? He would surely reply that, medicine gives drugs and meat and drink to human bodies and what due or proper thing is given by cookery and to what seasoning to food and what is that which justice gives and to whom if socrates we are to be guided at all by the analogy of the preceding instances then justice is the art which gives good to friends and evil to enemies that is his meaning, then? I think so. And who is best able to do good to his friends and evil to his enemies in time of sickness? The physician. Or when they are on a voyage amid the perils of the sea? The pilot. And in what sort of actions, or with a view to what result, is the just man able to do harm to his enemy and good to his friend? in going to war against the one and in making alliances with the other but when a man is well my dear polemarchus there is no need of a physician no and he who is not on a voyage has no need of a pilot no then in time of peace justice will be of no use i am very far from thinking so you think that justice may be of use in peace as well as in war Yes. Oh, like husbandry for the acquisition of corn? Yes. Or like shoemaking for the acquisition of shoes? That is what you mean? Yes. And what similar use or power of acquisition has justice in time of peace? In contracts, Socrates, justice is of use. And by contracts you mean partnerships? Exactly. But is the just man or the skilful player a more useful and better partner at a game of drafts? The skilful player. And in the laying of bricks and stones, is the just man a more useful or better partner than the builder? Quite the reverse. Then in what sort of partnership is the just man a better partner than the harp player? As in playing the harp, the harp player is certainly a better partner than the just man. In a money partnership? Yes, Polemarchus, but surely not in the use of money, for you do not want a just man to be your counsellor in the purchase or sale of a horse. A man who is knowing about horses would be better for that, would he not? Certainly. And when you want to buy a ship, the shipwright or the pilot would be better? True. 
then what is that joint use of silver or gold in which the just man is to be preferred when you want a deposit to be kept safely you mean when money is not wanted but allowed to lie precisely that is to say justice is useful when money is useless that is the inference and when you want to keep a pruning hook safe then justice is useful to the individual and to the state but when you want to use it then the art of the vine dresser clearly and when you want to keep a shield or a liar but not to use them you would say that justice is useful but when you want to use them then the art of the soldier or the musician certainly and so of all other things justice is useful when they are useless and useless when they are useful that is the inference then justice is not good for much end of book one part one book one part two of plato's republic this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. B. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book One, Part Two. But let us consider this further point. Is not he who can best strike a blow in a boxing match or in any kind of fighting best able to ward off a blow? Certainly. And he who is most skillful in preventing or escaping from a disease is best able to create one? True. And he is the best guard of a camp who is best able to steal a march upon the enemy? Certainly then he who is a good keeper of anything is also a good thief that i suppose is to be inferred then if the just man is good at keeping money he is good at stealing it that is implied in the argument then after all the just man has turned out to be a thief and this is a lesson which i suspect you must have learnt out of homer for he speaking of Autolycus, the maternal grandfather of odysseus who is a favorite of his, affirms that he was excellent above all men in theft and perjury. And so you and Homer and Simonides are agreed that justice is an art of theft, to be practiced, however, for the good of friends and for the harm of enemies. That was what you were saying? No, certainly not that, though I do not know what I did say but i still stand by the latter words well there is another question by friends and enemies do we mean those who are so really or only in seeming surely he said a man who may be expected to love those whom he thinks good and to hate those whom he thinks evil yes but do not persons often err about good and evil many who are not good seem to be so and conversely that is true then to them the good will be enemies and the evil will be their friends true and in that case they will be right in doing good to the evil and evil to the good clearly but the good are just and would not do an injustice true then according to your argument it is just to injure those who do no wrong nay socrates the doctrine is immoral then i suppose that we ought to do good to the just and harm to the unjust i like that better but see the consequence many a man who is ignorant of human nature has friends who are bad friends and in that case he ought to do harm to them and he has good enemies whom he ought to benefit but if so we shall be saying the very opposite of what we have affirmed to be the meaning of simonides very true he said and i think that we had better correct an error into which we seem to have fallen in the use of the words friend and enemy 
What was the error, Polymarchus? I asked. We assumed that he is a friend who seems to be, or who is thought, good. And how is the error to be corrected? We should rather say that he is a friend who is, as well as seems, good, and that he who seems only and is not good, only seems to be and is not a friend. And of an enemy the same may be said. You would argue that the good are our friends and the bad our enemies? Yes. And instead of saying simply as we did at first that it is just to do good to our friends and harm to our enemies, we should further say it is just to do good to our friends when they are good and harm to our enemies when they are evil? Yes, that appears to me to be the truth. But ought the just to injure any one at all? Undoubtedly he ought to injure those who are both wicked and his enemies. When horses are injured, are they improved or deteriorated? The latter. Deteriorated, that is to say, in the good qualities of horses, not of dogs. Yes, of horses. And dogs are deteriorated in the good qualities of dogs and not of horses? Of course. And will not men who are injured be deteriorated in that which is the proper virtue of man? Certainly. And that human virtue is justice? To be sure then men who are injured are out of necessity made unjust that is the result but can the musician by his art make men unmusical certainly not or the horseman by his art make them bad horsemen impossible and can the just by justice make men unjust, or, speaking generally, can the good by virtue make them bad? Assuredly not. Any more than heat can produce cold? It cannot. Or drought, moisture? Clearly not. Nor can the good harm anyone? Impossible. And the just is the good. Certainly. Then to injure a friend or any one else is not the act of a just man, but of the opposite, who is the unjust. I think what you say is quite true, Socrates. Then if a man says that justice consists in the repayment of debts, and that good is the debt which a just man owes to his friends, and evil the debt which he owes to his enemies to say this is not wise for it is not true if as has been clearly shown the injuring of another can be in no case just i agree with you said polemarchus then you and i are prepared to take up arms against any one who attributes such a saying to simonides or bias or pittacus or any other wise man or seer? I am quite ready to do battle at your side, he said. Shall I tell you whose I believe the saying to be? Whose? I believe that Periander, or Perdiccas, or Xerxes, or Ismenius the Theban, or some other rich and mighty man who had a great opinion of his own power, was the first to say that justice is doing good to your friends and harm to your enemies. Most true, he said. Yes, I said, but if this definition of justice also breaks down, what other can be offered? Several times in the course of the discussion, Thrasymachus had made an attempt to get the argument into his own hands, and had been put down by the rest of the company who wanted to hear the end. But when Polemarchus and I had done speaking, and there was a pause, he could no longer hold his peace, and gathering himself up, he came at us like a wild beast, seeking to devour us. 
we were quite panic-stricken at the sight of him. He roared out to the whole company, What folly, Socrates, has taken possession of you all? And why, silly billies, do you knock under to one another? I say that if you really want to know what justice is, you should not only ask, but answer, and you should not seek honour to yourself from the refutation of an opponent, but have your own answer, for there is many a one who can ask and cannot answer. And now I will not have you say that justice is a duty or advantage or profit or gain or interest, for this sort of nonsense will not do for me. I must have clearness and accuracy. I was panic-stricken at his words, and could not look at him without trembling. Indeed, I believe that if I had not fixed my eye upon him, I should have been struck dumb. But when I saw his fury rising, I looked at him first, and was therefore able to reply to him. Thrasymachus, I said with a quiver, don't be hard upon us. Polemarchus and I may have been guilty of a little mistake in the argument, but I can assure you that the error was not intentional. If we were seeking for a piece of gold, you would not imagine that we were knocking under to one another and so losing our chance of finding it. And why, when we are seeking for justice, a thing more precious than many pieces of gold, do you say that we are weakly yielding to one another and not doing our utmost to get at the truth? nay my good friend we are most willing and anxious to do so but the fact is that we cannot and if so you people who know all things should pity us and not be angry with us how characteristic of socrates he replied with a bitter laugh that's your ironical style have i not already told you that whatever he was asked he would refuse to answer and try irony or any other shuffle in order that he might avoid answering you are a philosopher thrasymachus i replied and well know that if you ask a person what numbers make up twelve taking care to prohibit him whom you ask from answering twice six or three times four or six times two or four times three for this sort of nonsense will not do for me then obviously if that is your way of putting the question no one can answer you but suppose that he were to retort, The Thracomachus, what do you mean? If one of these numbers which you interdict be the true answer to the question, am I falsely to say some other number which is not the right one? Is that your meaning? How would you answer him? Just as if the two cases were at all alike, he said. Why should they not be, I replied, and even if they are not? but only appear to be so to the person who is asked, ought not he to say what he thinks, whether you and I forbid him or not? I presume, then, that you are going to make one of the interdicted answers. I dare say that I may, notwithstanding the danger, if upon reflection I approve of any of them. But what if I give you an answer about justice other and better, he said, than any of these? What do you deserve to have done to you? Done to me? As becomes the ignorant, I must learn from the wise. That is what I deserve to have done to me. What, and no payment? A pleasant notion. I will pay when I have the money, I replied. But you have, Socrates, said Glaucon. And you, Thrasymachus, need be under no anxiety about money, for we will all make a contribution for Socrates. Yes, he replied, and then Socrates will do as he always does, refuse to answer himself, but take and pull to pieces the answer of someone else. Why, my good friend, I said, how can any one answer who knows and says that he knows just nothing, and who even if he has some faint notions of his own, is told by a man of authority not to utter them. The natural thing is that the speaker should be some one like yourself, who professes to know and can tell what he knows. Will you then kindly answer for the edification of the company and of myself? Glaucon and the rest of the company joined in my request, and Thrasymachus, as any one might see, was in reality eager to speak for he thought that he had an excellent answer and would distinguish himself. 
but at first he affected to insist on my answering. At length he consented to begin. Behold, he said, the wisdom of Socrates. He refuses to teach himself, and goes about learning of others, to whom he never even says thank you. That I learn of others, I replied, is quite true, but that I am ungrateful I wholly deny. Money I have none, and therefore I pay in praise, which is all I have, and how ready I am to praise any one who appears to me to speak well, you will very soon find out when you answer, for I expect that you will answer well. Listen, then, he said, I proclaim that justice is nothing else than the interest of the stronger. And why now do you not praise me? But of course you won't. Let me understand you, I replied. Justice, as you say, is the interest of the stronger. What, Thrasymachus, is the meaning of this? You cannot mean to say that because Polydamus, the Pancratiast, is stronger than we are, and finds the eating of beef conducive to his bodily strength, that to eat beef is therefore equally for our good, who are weaker than he is, and right and just for us. That's abominable of you, Socrates. You take the words in the sense which is most damaging to the argument. No, not at all, my good sir, I said. I am trying to understand them, and I wish that you would be a little clearer. Well, he said, have you never heard that forms of government differ? There are tyrannies, and there are democracies, and there are aristocracies. Yes, I know. And the government is the ruling power in each state? Certainly. And the different forms of government make laws democratical, aristocratical, tyrannical, with a view to their several interests, and these laws which are made by them for their own interests are the justice which they deliver to their subjects, and him who transgresses them they punish as a breaker of the law and unjust. And that is what I mean when I say that in all states there is the same principle of justice, which is the interest of the government. And as the government must be supposed to have power, the only reasonable conclusion is that everywhere there is one principle of justice, which is the interest of the stronger. Now I understand you, I said, and whether you are right or not I will try to discover but let me remark that in defining justice you have yourself used the word interest which you forbade me to use. It is true, however, that in your definition the words of the stronger are added. A small addition you must allow, he said. Great or small, never mind about that. We must first inquire whether what you are saying is the truth. Now we are both agreed that justice is interest of some sort, but you go on to say, of the stronger. About this addition I am not so sure, and must therefore consider further. Proceed. I will. And first, tell me, do you admit that it is just for subjects to obey their rulers? I do. But are the rulers of states absolutely infallible, or are they sometimes liable to err? To be sure, he replied, they are liable to err. Then in making their laws, they may sometimes make them rightly and sometimes not. True. When they make them rightly, they make them agreeably to their interest. When they are mistaken, contrary to their interest, you admit that? Yes. And the laws that they make must be obeyed by their subjects. And that is what you call justice? Doubtless. Then justice, according to your argument, is not only obedience to the interest of the stronger, but the reverse. What is that you are saying? he asked. I am only repeating what you are saying, I believe. But let us consider... Have we not admitted that the rulers may be mistaken about their own interest in what they command, and also that to obey them is justice? Has that not been admitted? 
Yes. Then you must also have acknowledged justice not to be for the interest of the stronger when the rulers unintentionally command things to be done which are to their own injury. For if, as you say, justice is the obedience which the subject renders to their commands, in that case, O oh, wisest of men, is there any escape from the conclusion that the weaker are commanded to do not what is for the interest, but what is for the injury of the stronger? Nothing can be clearer, Socrates, said Polemarchus. Yes, said Clitophon, interposing, if you are allowed to be his witness. But there is no need of any witness, said Polemarchus, for Thrasymachus himself acknowledges that rulers may sometimes command what is not for their own interest, and that for subjects to obey them is justice. Yes, Polemarchus, Thrasymachus said that for subjects to do what was commanded by their rulers is just. Yes, Clitophon, but he also said that justice is the interest of the stronger, and while admitting both these propositions, he further acknowledged that the stronger may command the weaker, who are his subjects, to do what is not for his own interest. Whence follows that justice is the injury, quite as much as the interest, of the stronger. But, said Clitophon, he meant by the interest of the stronger that the stronger thought to be his interest. This was what the weaker had to do, and this was affirmed by him to be justice. Those were not his words, rejoined Polemarchus. Never mind, I replied, if he now says that they are, let us accept his statement. Tell me, Thrasymachus, I said, did you mean by justice what the stronger thought to be his interest, whether really so or not? Certainly not, he said. Do you suppose that I call him who is mistaken the stronger at the time when he is mistaken? Yes, I said. My impression was that you did so, when you admitted that the ruler was not infallible, but might be sometimes mistaken. End of Book One, Part Two Book One, Part Three of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. B. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book One, Part Three. You argue like an informer, Socrates. Do you mean, for example, that he who is mistaken about the sick is a physician in that he is mistaken? Or that he who errs in arithmetic or grammar is an arithmetician or grammarian at the time when he is making the mistake, in respect of the mistake? True, we say that the physician or arithmetician or grammarian has made a mistake, but this is only a way of speaking. For the fact is that neither the grammarian nor any other person of skill ever makes a mistake in so far as he is what his name implies. They none of them err unless their skill fails them, and then they cease to be skilled artists. No artist or sage or ruler errs at the time when he is what his name implies. Though he is commonly said to err, and I adopted the common mode of speaking, but to be perfectly accurate, since you are such a lover of accuracy, we should say that the ruler, in so far as he is a ruler, is unerring, and, being unerring, always commands that which is for his own interest. And the subject is required to execute his commands, and therefore, as I said at first, and now repeat, justice is the interest of the stronger. Indeed, Thrasymachus, and do I really appear to you to argue like an informer? Certainly, he replied. And do you suppose that I ask these questions with any design of injuring you in the argument? Nay, he replied, suppose is not the word, I know it. 
but you will be found out and by sheer force of argument you will never prevail i shall not make the attempt my dear man but to avoid any misunderstanding occurring between us in future let me ask in what sense do you speak of a ruler or stronger whose interest as you were saying he being the superior it is just that the inferior should execute is he a ruler in the popular or in the strict sense of the term in the strictest of all senses he said and now cheat and play the informer if you can i ask no quarter at your hands but you never will be able never and do you imagine i said that i am such a madman as to try and cheat thrasymachus i might as well shave a lion why he said you made the attempt a minute ago and you failed enough i said of these civilities it will be better that i should ask you a question is the physician taken in that strict sense of which you are speaking a healer of the sick or a maker of money and remember that i am now speaking of the true physician a healer of the sick he replied and the pilot that is to say the true pilot is he a captain of sailors or a mere sailor a captain of sailors the circumstance that he sails in the ship is not to be taken into account neither is he to be called a sailor the name pilot by which he is distinguished has nothing to do with sailing but is significant of his skill and of his authority over the sailors very true he said now i said every art has an interest certainly for which the art has to consider and provide yes that is the aim of art and the interest of any art is the perfection of it this and nothing else what do you mean i mean what i may illustrate negatively by the example of the body suppose you were to ask me whether the body is self-sufficing or has wants i should reply certainly the body has wants for the body may be ill and require to be cured and has therefore interests to which the art of medicine ministers and this is the origin and intention of medicine as you will acknowledge am i not right quite right he replied but is the art of medicine or any other art faulty or deficient in any quality in the same way that the eye may be deficient in sight or the ear fail of hearing and therefore requires another art to provide for the interests of seeing and hearing has art in itself i say any similar liability to fault or defect and does every art require another supplementary art to provide for its interests and that another and another without end or have the arts to look only after their own interests or have they no need either of themselves or of another having no faults or defects they have no need to correct them either by the exercise of their own art or of any other they have only to consider the interest of their subject matter for every art remains pure and faultless while remaining true that is to say while perfect and unimpaired take the words in your precise sense and tell me whether i am not right yes clearly then medicine does not consider the interest of medicine but the interest of the body true he said nor does the art of horsemanship consider the interests of the art of horsemanship but the interests of the horse neither do any other arts care for themselves for they have no needs they care only for that which is the subject of their art true he said but surely thrasymachus the arts are the superiors and rulers of their own subjects to this he assented with a good deal of reluctance then i said no science or art considers or enjoins the interest of the stronger or superior but only the interest of the subject and weaker he made an attempt to contest this proposition also but finally acquiesced then i continued no physician in so far as he is a physician considers his own good in what he prescribes but the good of his patient 
for the true physician is also a ruler having the human body as a subject and is not a mere money-maker that has been admitted yes and the pilot likewise in the strict sense of the term is a ruler of sailors and not a mere sailor that has been admitted and such a pilot and ruler will provide and prescribe for the interest of the sailor who is under him and not for his own or the ruler's interest he gave a reluctant yes then i said thrasymachus there is no one in any rule who in so far as he is a ruler considers or enjoins what is for his own interest but always what is for the interest of his subject or suitable to his art to that he looks and that alone he considers in everything which he says and does when we had got to this point in the argument and every one saw that the definition of justice had been completely upset thrasymachus instead of replying to me said tell me socrates have you got a nurse why do you ask such a question i said when you ought rather to be answering because she leaves you to snivel and never wipes your nose she has not even taught you to know the shepherd from the sheep what makes you say that i replied because you fancy that the shepherd or neatherd fattens or tends the sheep or oxen with a view to their own good and not to the good of himself or his master and you further imagine that the rulers of states if they are true rulers never think of their subjects as sheep and that they are not studying their own advantage day and night oh no and so entirely astray are you in your ideas about the just and unjust as not even to know that justice and the just are in reality another's good that is to say the interest of the ruler and stronger and the loss of the subject and servant and injustice the opposite for the unjust is lord over the truly simple and just he is the stronger and his subjects do what is for his interest and minister to his happiness which is very far from being their own consider further most foolish socrates that the just is always a loser in comparison with the unjust first of all in private contracts whenever the unjust is the partner of the just you will find that when the partnership is dissolved the unjust man has always more and the just less secondly in their dealings with the state when there is an income tax the just man will pay more and the unjust less on the same amount of income and when there is anything to be received the one gains nothing and the other much observe also what happens when they take an office there is the just man neglecting his affairs and perhaps suffering other losses and getting nothing out of the public because he is just moreover he is hated by his friends and acquaintances for refusing to serve them in unlawful ways but all this is reversed in the case of the unjust man i am speaking as before of injustice on a large scale in which the advantage of the unjust is most apparent and my meaning will be most clearly seen if we turn to that highest form of injustice in which the criminal is the happiest of men and the sufferers or those who refuse to do injustice are the most miserable that is to say tyranny which by fraud and force takes away the property of others not little by little but wholesale comprehending in one things sacred as well as profane private and public for which acts of wrong if he were detected perpetrating any one of them singly he would be punished and incur great disgrace they who do such wrong in particular cases are called robbers of temples and man-stealers and burglars and swindlers and thieves but when a man besides taking away the money of the citizens has made slaves of them then instead of these names of reproach he is termed happy and blessed not only by the citizens but by all who hear of his having achieved the consummation of injustice for mankind censure injustice fearing that they may be the victims of it and not because they shrink from committing it and thus as i have shown socrates injustice when on a sufficient scale has more strength and freedom and mastery than justice 
and as I said at first, justice is the interest of the stronger, whereas injustice is a man's own profit and interest. Thrasymachus, when he had thus spoken, having, like a bathman, deluged our eyes with his words, had a mind to go away. But the company would not let him, they insisted that he should remain and defend his position, and I myself added my own humble request that he would not leave us. Thrasymachus, I said to him, excellent man, how suggestive are your remarks, and are you going to run away before you have fairly taught or learned whether they are true or not? Is the attempt to determine the way of man's life so small a matter in your eyes, to determine how life may be passed by each of us to the greatest advantage? And do I differ from you, he said, as to the importance of the enquiry? You appear, rather, I replied, to have no care or thought about us, Thrasymachus, whether we live better or worse from not knowing what you say you know, is to you a matter of indifference. Prithee, friend, do not keep your knowledge to yourself. We are a large party, and any benefit which you confer upon us will be amply rewarded. For my own part I openly declare that I am not convinced, and that I do not believe in justice, to be more gainful than justice, even if uncontrolled and allowed to have free play. For granting that there may be an unjust man who is able to commit injustice either by fraud or force, still this does not convince me of the superior advantage of injustice. And there may be others who are in the same predicament with myself. Perhaps we may be wrong. If so, you in your wisdom should convince us that we are mistaken in preferring justice to injustice. And how am I to convince you, he said, if you are not already convinced by what I have just said? What more can I do for you? Would you have me put the proof bodily into your souls? Heaven forbid, I said, I would only ask you to be consistent, or if you change, change openly, and let there be no deception, for I must remark, Thrasymachus, if you will recall what was previously said, that although you began by defining the true position in an exact sense, you did not observe a like exactness when speaking of the shepherd. You thought that the shepherd, as a shepherd, tends the sheep not with a view to their own good, but like a mere diner or banqueter, with a view to the pleasures of the table or again as a trader for sale in the market, and not as a shepherd. Yet surely the art of the shepherd is concerned only with the good of his subjects. He has only to provide the best for them, since the perfection of the art is already ensured whenever all the requirements of it are satisfied. And that was what I was saying just now about the ruler. I conceived that the art of the ruler, considered as ruler, whether in a state or in private life, could only regard the good of his flock or subjects, whereas you seem to think that the rulers in states, that is to say, the true rulers, like being in authority. Think, nay, I am sure of it. Then why in the case of lesser offices do men never take them willingly without payment? unless under the idea that they govern for the advantage not of themselves but of others. Let me ask you a question. Are not the several arts different, by reason of their each having a separate function? And, my dear illustrious friend, do say what you think, that we may make a little progress. Yes, that is the difference, he replied. And each art gives us a particular good, and not merely a general one. Medicine, for example, gives us health, navigation, safety at sea, and so on. Yes, he said. And the art of payment has the special function of giving pay. But we do not confuse this with other arts any more than the art of the pilot is to be confused with the art of medicine, because the health of the pilot may be improved by a sea voyage. You would not be inclined to say, would you, that navigation is the art of medicine, at least if we are to adopt your exact use of language? Certainly not. Or because a man is in good health when he receives pay, you would not say that the art of payment is medicine? I should not. 
nor would you say that medicine is the art of receiving pay because a man takes fees when he is engaged in healing certainly not and we have admitted i said that the good of each art is specially confined to the art yes then if there be any good which all artists have in common that is to be attributed to something of which they all have the common use true he replied and when the artist is benefited by receiving pay the advantage is gained by an additional use of the art of pay which is not the art professed by him he gave a reluctant assent to this then the pay is not derived by the several artists from their respective arts but the truth is that while the art of medicine gives health and the art of the builder builds a house another art attends them which is the art of pay the various arts may be doing their own business and benefiting that over which they preside but would the artist receive any benefit from his art unless he were paid as well i suppose not but does he therefore confer no benefit when he works for nothing certainly he confers a benefit then now thrasymachus there is no longer any doubt that neither arts nor governments provide for their own interests but as we were before saying they rule and provide for the interests of their subjects who are the weaker and not the stronger to their good they attend and not to the good of the superior and this is the reason my dear thrasymachus why as i was just now saying no one is willing to govern because no one likes to take in hand the reformation of evils which are not his concern without remuneration for in the execution of his work and in giving his orders to another the true artist does not regard his own interest but always that of his subjects and therefore in order that rulers may be willing to rule they must be paid in one of three modes of payment money or honour or a penalty for refusing what do you mean socrates said glaucon the first two modes of payment are intelligible enough but what the penalty is i do not understand or how a penalty can be a payment you mean that you do not understand the nature of this payment which to the best men is the great inducement to rule of course you know that ambition and avarice are held to be as indeed they are a disgrace very true and for this reason i said money and honour have no attraction for them good men do not wish to be openly demanding payment for governing and so to get the name of hirelings nor by secretly helping themselves out of the public revenues to get the name of thieves and not being ambitious they do not care about honour wherefore necessity must be laid upon them and they must be induced to serve from the fear of punishment and this as i imagine is the reason why the forwardness to take office instead of waiting to be compelled has been deemed dishonourable now the worst part of the punishment is that he who refuses to rule is liable to be ruled by one who is worse than himself and the fear of this as i conceive induces the good to take office not because they would but because they cannot help not under the idea that they are going to have any benefit or enjoyment themselves but as a necessity and because they are not able to commit the task of ruling to any one who is better than themselves or indeed as good for there is reason to think that if a city were composed entirely of good men then to avoid office would be as much an object of contention as to obtain office is at present then we should have plain proof that the true ruler is not meant by nature to regard his own interest but that of his subjects and every one who knew this would choose rather to receive a benefit from another than to have the trouble of conferring one so far am i from agreeing with thrasymachus that justice is the interest of the stronger the latter question need not be further discussed at present 
But when Thrasymachus says that the life of the unjust is more advantageous than that of the just, his new statement appears to me to be of a far more serious character. Which of us has spoken truly? And which sort of life, Glaucon, do you prefer? I, for my part, deem the life of the just to be the more advantageous, he answered. Did you hear all of the advantages of the unjust which Thrasymachus was rehearsing? Yes, I heard him, he replied, but he has not convinced me. Then shall we try to find some way of convincing him, if we can, that he is saying what is not true? Most certainly, he replied. If, I said, he makes a set speech, and we make another recounting all the advantages of being just, and he answers and we rejoin, there must be a numbering and measuring of the goods which are claimed on either side, and in the end we shall want judges to decide. But if we proceed in our enquiry as we lately did, by making admissions to one another, we shall unite the offices of judge and advocate in our own persons. Very good, he said. And which method do I understand you to prefer? I said. That which you propose. End of Book One, Part Three. Book One, Part Four of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. B. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book One, Part Four. Well then, Thrasymachus, I said, suppose you begin at the beginning and answer me. You say that perfect injustice is more gainful than perfect justice? Yes, that is what I say, and I have given you my reasons. And what is your view about them? Would you call one of them virtue and the other vice? Certainly. I suppose that you would call justice virtue and injustice vice. What a charming notion! So likely, too, seeing that I affirm injustice to be profitable and justice not. What else, then, would you say? The opposite, he replied. And would you call justice vice? No, I would rather say sublime simplicity. Then you would call injustice malignity? No, I would rather say discretion. And do the unjust appear to you to be wise and good? Yes, he said. At any rate, those of them who are able to be perfectly unjust, and who have the power of subduing states and nations. But perhaps you imagine me to be talking of cut purses. Even this profession, if undetected, has advantages, though they are not to be compared with those of which I was just now speaking. I do not think that I misapprehend your meaning, Thrasymachus, I replied, but still I cannot hear without amazement that you class injustice with wisdom and virtue, and justice with the opposite. Certainly I do so class them. Now, I said, you are on more substantial and almost unanswerable ground, for if the injustice which you were maintaining to be profitable had been admitted by you as by others to be vice and deformity, an answer might have been given to you on received principles. But now I perceive that you will call injustice honorable and strong, and to the unjust you will attribute all the qualities which were attributed by us before to the just, seeing that you do not hesitate to rank injustice with wisdom and virtue. You have guessed most infallibly, he replied. Then I certainly ought not to shrink from going through with the argument so long as I have reason to think that you, Thrasymachus, are speaking your real mind. 
for i do believe that you are now in earnest and are not amusing yourself at our expense i may be in earnest or not but what is that to you to refute the argument is your business very true i said that is what i have to do but will you be so good as answer yet one more question does the just man try to gain any advantage over the just far otherwise if he did he would not be the simple amusing creature which he is and would he try to go beyond just action he would not and how would he regard the attempt to gain an advantage over the unjust would that be considered by him as just or unjust he would think it just and would try to gain the advantage but he would not be able whether he would or would not be able i said is not to the point my question is only whether the just man while refusing to have more than another just man would wish and claim to have more than the unjust yes he would and what of the unjust does he claim to have more than the just man and to do more than is just of course he said for he claims to have more than all men and the unjust man will strive and struggle to obtain more than the unjust man or action in order that he may have more than all true we may put the matter thus i said the just does not desire more than his like but more than his unlike whereas the unjust desires more than both his like and his unlike nothing he said can be better than that statement and the unjust is good and wise and the just is neither good again he said and is not the unjust like the wise and good and the just unlike them of course he said he who is of a certain nature is like those who are of a certain nature he who is not not each of them i said is such as his like is certainly he replied very good thrasymachus i said and now to take the case of the arts you would admit that one man is a musician and another not a musician yes and which is wise and which is foolish clearly the musician is wise and he who is not a musician is foolish and he is good in as far as he is wise and bad in as far as he is foolish yes and you would say the same sort of thing of the physician yes and do you think my excellent friend that a musician when he adjusts the lyre would desire or claim to exceed or go beyond a musician in the tightening and loosening the strings i do not think that he would but he would claim to exceed the non-musician of course and what would you say of the physician in prescribing meats and drinks would he wish to go beyond another physician or beyond the practice of medicine he would not but he would wish to go beyond the non-physician yes and about knowledge and ignorance in general see whether you think that any man who has knowledge ever would wish to have the choice of saying or doing more than another man who has knowledge would he not rather say or do the same as his like in the same case that i suppose can hardly be denied and what of the ignorant would he not desire to have more than either the knowing or the ignorant i dare say and the knowing is wise yes and the wise is good true 
then the wise and good will not desire to gain more than his like but more than his unlike and opposite i suppose so whereas the bad and ignorant will desire to gain more than both yes but did we not say thrasymachus that the unjust goes beyond both his like and unlike were not these your words they were and you also said that the just will not go beyond his like but his unlike yes then the just is like the wise and good and the unjust like the evil and ignorant that is the inference and each of them is such as his like is that was admitted then the just has turned out to be wise and good and the unjust evil and ignorant thrasymachus made all these admissions not fluently as i repeat them but with extreme reluctance it was a hot summer's day and the perspiration poured from him in torrents and then i saw what i had never seen before thrasymachus blushing as we were now agreed that justice was virtue and wisdom and injustice vice and ignorance i proceeded to another point well i said thrasymachus that matter is now settled but were we not also saying that injustice had strength do you remember yes i remember he said but do not suppose that i approve of what you are saying or have no answer if however i were to answer you would be quite certain to accuse me of haranguing therefore either permit me to have my say out or if you would rather ask do so and i will answer very good as they say to story-telling old women and will nod yes and no certainly not i said if contrary to your real opinion yes he said i will to please you since you will not let me speak what else would you have nothing in the world i said and if you are so disposed i will ask and you shall answer proceed then i will repeat the question which i asked before in order that our examination of the relative nature of justice and injustice may be carried on regularly a statement was made that injustice is stronger and more powerful than justice but now justice having been identified with wisdom and virtue is easily shown to be stronger than injustice if injustice is ignorance this can no longer be questioned by any one but i want to view the matter thrasymachus in a different way you would not deny that a state may be unjust and may be unjustly attempting to enslave other states or may have already enslaved them and may be holding many of them in subjection true he replied and i will add that the best and most perfectly unjust state will be most likely to do so i know i said that such was your position but what i would further consider is whether this power which is possessed by the superior state can exist or be exercised without justice or only with justice if you are right in your view and justice is wisdom then only with justice but if i am right then without justice i am delighted thrasymachus to see you are not only nodding assent and dissent but making answers which are quite excellent that is out of civility to you he replied you are very kind i said and would you have the goodness also to inform me whether you think that a state or an army or a band of robbers and thieves or any other gang of evil-doers could act at all if they injured one another no indeed he said they could not but if they abstained from injuring one another they might act together better yes and this is because injustice creates divisions and hatreds and fighting and justice imparts harmony and friendship is that not true thrasymachus 
I agree, he said, because I do not wish to quarrel with you. How good of you, I said, but I should like to know also whether injustice, having this tendency to arouse hatred wherever existing, among slaves or among freemen, will not make them hate one another and set them at variance and render them incapable of common action. And certainly. And even if injustice be found in two only, will they not quarrel and fight and become enemies to one another and to the just? They will. And suppose injustice abiding in a single person. Would your wisdom say that she loses or that she retains her natural power? Let us assume that she retains her power. Yet is not the power which injustice exercises of such a nature that wherever she takes up her abode, whether in a city, in an army, in a family, or in any other body, that body is, to begin with, rendered incapable of united action by reason of sedition and distraction? And does it not become its own enemy, and at variance with all that opposes it, and with the just? Is this not the case? Yes, certainly. And is not injustice equally fatal when existing in a single person? In the first place, rendering him incapable of action because he is not at unity with himself? And in the second place, making him an enemy to himself and the just? Is that not true, Thrasymachus? Yes. And, oh, my friend, I said, surely the gods are just? granted that they are but if so the unjust will be the enemy of the gods and the just will be their friend feast away in triumph and take your fill of the argument i will not oppose you lest i should displease the company well then proceed with your answers and let me have the remainder of my repast for we have already shown that the just are clearly wiser and better and abler than the unjust and that the unjust are incapable of common action nay more that to speak as we did of men who are evil acting at any time vigorously together it is not strictly true for if they had been perfectly evil they would have laid hands upon one another but it is evident that there must have been some remnant of justice in them which enabled them to combine if there had not been, they would have injured one another as well as their victims. They were but half villains in their enterprises, for had they been whole villains and utterly unjust, they would have been utterly incapable of action. That, as I believe, is the truth of the matter and not what you said at first. But whether the just have a better and happier life than the unjust is a further question which we also proposed to consider. I should think that they have, and for the reasons which I have given, but still I should like to examine further, for no light matter is at stake, nothing less than the rule of human life. Proceed. I will proceed by asking a question. Would you not say that a horse has some end? I should. And the end or use of a horse or of anything? would be that which could not be accomplished, or not so well accomplished, by any other thing? I do not understand, he said. Let me explain. Can you see, except with the eye? Certainly not. Or hear, except with the ear? No. Then these may be truly said to be the ends of these organs they may but you can cut off a vine branch with a dagger or with a chisel and in many other ways of course and yet not so well as with a pruning hook made for the purpose true may we not say that this is the end of a pruning hook we may then now i think you will have no difficulty in understanding my meaning when i asked the question whether the end of anything would be that which could not be accomplished, or not so well accomplished, by any other thing? I understand your meaning, he said, 
and assent. And that to which an end is appointed also has an excellence. Need I ask again whether the eye has an end? It has. And has not the eye an excellence? Yes. And the ear has an end and an excellence also? True. And the same is true of all other things. They have each of them an end and a special excellence. That is so. Well, and can the eyes fulfill their end if they are wanting in their own proper excellence and have a defect instead? How can they, he said, if they are blind and cannot see? You mean to say, if they have lost their proper excellence, which is sight, but I have not arrived at that point yet. I would rather ask the question more generally, and only enquire whether the things which fulfill their ends fulfill them by their own proper excellence, and fail of fulfilling them by their own defect. Certainly, he replied. I might say the same of the ears. When deprived of their own proper excellence, they cannot fulfill their end. True. And the same observation will apply to all other things? I agree. Well, and has not the soul an end which nothing else can fulfill? For example, to superintend and command and deliberate and the like? Are not these functions proper to the soul? And can they be rightly assigned to any other? To no other. And is not life to be reckoned among the ends of the soul? Assuredly, he said. And has not the soul an excellence also? Yes. And can she or can she not fulfill her own ends when deprived of that excellence? She cannot. Then an evil soul must necessarily be an evil ruler and superintendent, and the good soul a good ruler. Yes, necessarily. And we have admitted that justice is the excellence of the soul, and injustice the defect of the soul. That has been admitted. Then the just soul and the just man will live well, and the unjust man will live ill. That is what your argument proves. And he who lives well is blessed and happy, and he who lives ill the reverse of happy? Certainly. Then the just is happy, and the unjust miserable. So be it. But happiness and not misery is profitable. Of course. Then, my blessed Thrasymachus, injustice can never be more profitable than justice. Let this, Socrates, he said, be your entertainment at the Bendidea, for which I am indebted to you, I said, now that you have grown gentle towards me and have left off scolding. Nevertheless, I have not been well entertained, but that was my own fault and not yours. As an epicure snatches a taste of every dish which is successively brought to table, he not having allowed himself time to enjoy the one before, so have I gone from one subject to another without having discovered what I sought at first, the nature of justice. I left that enquiry and turned away to consider whether justice is virtue and wisdom, or evil and folly. And when there arose a further discussion about the comparative advantages of justice and injustice, I could not refrain from passing on to that, and the result of the whole discussion has been that I know nothing at all, for I know not what justice is, and therefore I am not likely to know whether it is or is not a virtue, nor can I say whether the just man is happy or unhappy. End of Book One Book Two, Part One of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M.B. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Two, Part One. With these words I was thinking that I had made an end of the discussion. But the end, in truth, proved to be only a beginning. For Glaucon, who is always the most pugnacious of men, was dissatisfied at Thrasymachus' retirement. He wanted to have the battle out. So he said to me, Socrates, do you really wish to persuade us, or only to seem to have persuaded us, that to be just is always better than to be unjust. I should wish really to persuade you, I replied, if I could. Then you certainly have not succeeded. Let me ask you how. How would you arrange goods? Are there not some which we welcome for their own sakes and independently of their consequences, as, for example, harmless pleasures and enjoyments, which delight us at the time, although nothing follows from them? I agree in thinking that there is such a class, I replied. Is there not only a second class of goods, such as knowledge, sight, health, which are desirable not only in themselves, but also for their results? Certainly, I said. And would you not recognize a third class, such as gymnastic, and the care of the sick, and the physician's art, also the various ways of money-making. These do us good, but we regard them as disagreeable, and no one would choose them for their own sakes, but only for the sake of some reward, or result which flows from them. There is, I said, this third class also. But why do you ask? Because I want to know in which of the three classes you would place justice. In the highest class, I replied, among those goods which he who would be happy desires both for their own sake and for the sake of their results. Then the many are of another mind. They think that justice is to be reckoned in the troublesome class, among goods which are to be pursued for the sake of rewards and of reputation, but in themselves are disagreeable and rather to be avoided. I know, I said, that this is their manner of thinking, and that this was the thesis Thrasymachus was maintaining just now when he censured justice and praised injustice, but I am too stupid to be convinced by him. I wish, he said, that you would hear me as well as him, and then I shall see whether you and I agree, for Thrasymachus seems to me like a snake to have been charmed by your voice sooner than he ought to have been. But to my mind the nature of justice and injustice have not yet been made clear. Setting aside their rewards and results, I want to know what they are in themselves, and how they inwardly work in the soul. If you please, then, I will revive the argument of Thrasymachus and first I will speak of the nature and origin of justice according to the common view of them. Secondly, I will show that all men who practice justice do so against their will of necessity, but not as a good. And thirdly, I will argue that there is reason in this view, for the life of the unjust is after all better far than the life of the just. If what they say is true, Socrates, since I myself am not of their opinion, but still I acknowledge that I am perplexed when I hear the voices of Thrasymachus and myriads of others dinning in my ears. And on the other hand, I have never yet heard the superiority of justice to injustice maintained by any one in a satisfactory way. I want to hear justice praised in respect of itself. Then I shall be satisfied and you are the person from whom I think that I am most likely to hear this, and therefore I will praise the unjust life to the utmost of my power, and my manner of speaking will indicate the manner in which I desire to hear you too praising justice and censuring injustice. Will you say whether you approve of my proposal? Indeed I do nor can I imagine any theme about which a man of sense would oftener wish to converse. 
I am delighted, he replied, to hear you say so, and shall begin by speaking, as I proposed, of the nature and the origin of justice. They say that to do injustice is by nature good, to suffer injustice evil, and that the evil is greater than the good. And so when men have both done and suffered injustice, and have had experience of both, not being able to avoid the one and obtain the other, they think that they had better agree among themselves to have neither. Hence there arise laws and mutual covenants, and that which is ordained by law is termed by them lawful and just. This they affirm to be the origin and nature of justice. It is a mean or compromise between the best of all, which is to do injustice and not be punished, and the worst of all, which is to suffer injustice without the power of retaliation. And justice, being at a middle point between the two, is tolerated not as good, but as the lesser evil, and honoured by reason of the inability of men to do injustice. For no man who is worthy to be called a man would ever submit to such an agreement if he were able to resist. He would be mad if he did. Such is the received account, Socrates, of the nature and origin of justice. Now, that those who practice justice do so involuntarily and because they have not the power to be unjust, will best appear if we imagine something of this kind. Having given both to the just and the unjust power to do what they will, let us watch and see whither desire will lead them. Then we shall discover, in the very act, the just and unjust man to be proceeding along the same road, following their interest, which all natures deem to be their good, and are only diverted into the path of justice by the force of law. The liberty which we are supposing may be most completely given to them in the form of such a power as is said to have been possessed by Gyges, the ancestor of Croesus the Lydian. According to the tradition, Gyges was a shepherd in the service of the king of Lydia. There was a great storm, and an earthquake made an opening in the earth at the place where he was feeding his flock. Amazed at the sight, he descended into the opening, where, among other marvels, he beheld a hollow brazen horse, having doors, at which he, stooping and looking in, saw a dead body of stature as it appeared to him more than human, and having nothing on but a gold ring. This he took from the finger of the dead, and reascended. Now the shepherds met together according to custom that they might send their monthly report about the flocks to the king. Into their assembly he came, having the ring on his finger, and as he was sitting among them he chanced to turn the collet of the ring inside his hand, when instantly he became invisible to the rest of the company, and they began to speak of him as if he were no longer present. He was astonished at this, and again touching the ring, he turned the collet outwards and reappeared. He made several trials of the ring, and always with the same result. When he turned the collet inwards, he became invisible. When outwards, he reappeared. Whereupon he contrived to be chosen one of the messengers who were sent to the court whereas soon as he arrived he seduced the queen, and with her help conspired against the king and slew him, and took the kingdom. Suppose now that there were two such magic rings, and the just put on one of them, and the unjust the other. No man can be imagined to be of such an iron nature that he would stand fast in justice. No man would keep his hands off what was not his own, when he could safely take what he liked out of the market, or go into houses and lie with any one at his pleasure, or kill or release from prison whom he would, and in all respects be like a god among men. Then the actions of the just would be as the actions of the unjust. They would both come at last to the same point and we may truly affirm to be a great proof that a man is just, not willingly or because he thinks that justice is any good to him individually, but of necessity. For wherever anyone thinks that he can safely be unjust, 
there he is unjust. For all men believe in their hearts that injustice is far more profitable to the individual than justice. And he who argues as I have been supposing will say they are right. If you could imagine any one obtaining this power to become invisible and never doing any wrong or touching what was another's, he would be thought by the lookers-on to be a most wretched idiot, although they would praise him to one another's faces and keep up appearances with one another from a fear that they too might suffer injustice. Enough of this. Now, if we are to form a real judgment of the life of the just and unjust, we must isolate them. There is no other way. And how is the isolation to be effected? I answer, let the unjust man be entirely unjust, and the just man entirely just. Nothing is to be taken away from either of them, and both are to be perfectly furnished for the work of their respective lives. First, let the unjust be like other distinguished masters of craft, like the skilful pilot or physician who knows intuitively his own powers and keeps within their limits, and who, if he fails at any point, is able to recover himself. So let the unjust make his unjust attempts in the right way, and lie hidden if he means to be great in his injustice. He who is found out is nobody. For the highest reach of injustice is to be deemed just when you are not. Therefore I say that in the perfectly unjust man we must assume the most perfect injustice. There is to be no deduction, but we must allow him, while doing the most unjust acts, to have acquired the greatest reputation for justice. If he have taken a false step, he must be able to recover himself. He must be one who can speak with effect, if any of his deeds come to light, and who can force his way where force is required by his courage and strength, and command of money and friends. And at his side let us place the just man in his nobleness and simplicity, wishing, as Aeschylus says, to be and not to seem good. There must be no seeming, for if he seem to be just, he will be honoured and rewarded, and then we shall not know whether he is just for the sake of justice or for the sake of honours and rewards. Therefore let him be clothed in justice only, and have no other covering, and he must be imagined in a state of life the opposite of the former. Let him be the best of men, and let him be thought the worst. Then he will have been put to the proof, and we shall see whether he will be affected by the fear of infamy and its consequences. And let him continue thus to the hour of death, being just and seeming to be unjust. When both have reached the uttermost extreme, the one of justice and the other of injustice, let judgment be given which of them is the happier of the two. Heavens, my dear Glaucon, I said, how energetically you polished them up for the decision, first one and then the other, as if they were two statues. I do my best, he said, and now that we know what they are like, there is no difficulty in tracing out the sort of life which awaits either of them. This I will proceed to describe, but as you may think the description a little too coarse, I ask you to suppose, Socrates, that the words which follow are not mine. Let me put them into the mouths of the eulogists of injustice. They will tell you that the just man who is thought unjust will be scourged, racked, bound, will have his eyes burnt out, and, at last, after suffering every kind of evil, he will be impaled. Then you will understand that he ought to seem only, and not to be, just, for the words of Aeschylus may be more truly spoken of the unjust than of the just. For the unjust is pursuing a reality. He does not live with a view to appearances. He only wants to be really unjust and not to seem only. His mind has a soil deep and fertile out of which spring his prudent counsels. In the first place he is thought just, 
and therefore bears rule in the city. He can marry whom he will, and give in marriage to whom he will, and also he can trade and deal where he likes, and always to his own advantage, because he has no misgivings about injustice, and at every contest, whether in public or private, he gets the better of his antagonists, and gains at their expense, and is rich, and out of his gains he can benefit his friends and harm his enemies. Moreover, he can offer sacrifices and dedicate gifts to the gods abundantly and magnificently, and can honor the gods or any man whom he wants to honor in a far better style than the just, and therefore he is likely to be dearer than they are to the gods. And thus, Socrates, gods and men are said to unite in making the life of the unjust better than the life of the just. I was going to say something in answer to Glaucon, when Adamantus, his brother, interposed. Socrates, he said, do you not suppose that there is nothing more to be urged? Why, what else is there? I answered. The strongest point of all has not been even mentioned, he replied. Well then, according to the proverb, let brother help brother. If he fails in any part, do you assist him? although I must confess that Glaucon has already said quite enough to lay me in the dust and take from me the power of helping justice. Nonsense, he replied, but let me add something more. There is another side to Glaucon's argument about the praise and censure of justice and injustice, which is equally required in order to bring out what I believe to be his meaning. Parents and tutors are always telling their sons and their wards that they are to be just. But why? Not for the sake of justice, but for the sake of character and reputation, in the hope of obtaining for him who is reputed just some of those offices, marriages, and the like which Glaucon has enumerated among the advantages accruing to the unjust from the reputation of justice. More, however, is made of appearances by this class of persons than by the others, for they throw in the good opinion of the gods, and will tell you of a shower of benefits which the heavens, as they say, rain upon the pious. And this accords with the testimony of the noble Hesiod and Homer, the first of whom says that the gods make the oaks of the just to bear acorns at their summit and bees in the middle, and the sheep are bowed down with the weight of their fleeces. And many other blessings of a like kind are provided for them. And Homer has a very similar strain, for he speaks of one whose fame is as the fame of some blameless king who, like a god, maintains justice, to whom the black earth brings forth wheat and barley, whose trees are bowed with fruit, and his sheep never to fail, and the sea gives him fish. Still grander are the gifts of heaven which Musaeus and his son vouchsafe to the just. They take them down into the world below, where they have the saints lying on couches at a feast, everlastingly drunk, crowned with garlands. Their idea seems to be that an immortality of drunkenness is the highest meed of virtue. Some extend their rewards yet further. The posterity, as they say, of the faithful and just shall survive to the third and fourth generation. This is the style in which they praise justice. But about the wicked there is another strain. They bury them in a slough in Hades, and make them carry water in a sieve. Also, while they are yet living, they bring them to infamy, and inflict upon them the punishments which Glaucon described as the portion of the just, who are reputed to be unjust. Nothing else does their invention supply. Such is their manner of praising the one and censuring the other. Once more, Socrates, I will ask you to consider another way of speaking about justice and injustice, which is not confined to the poets, but is found in prose writers. The universal voice of mankind is always declaring that justice and virtue are honorable, but grievous and toilsome, and that the pleasures of vice and injustice are easy of attainment, and are only censured by law and opinion. 
They say also that honesty is for the most part less profitable than dishonesty, and they are quite ready to call wicked men happy, and to honour them both in public and private when they are rich, or in any other way influential, while they despise and overlook those who may be weak and poor, even though acknowledging them to be better than the others. But most extraordinary of all is their mode of speaking about virtue and the gods. They say that the gods apportion calamity and misery to many good men, and good and happiness to the wicked, and the mendicant prophets go to rich men's doors and persuade them that they have a power committed to them by the gods of making an atonement for a man's own or his ancestors' sins by sacrifices and charms, with rejoicings and feasts, and they promise to harm an enemy, whether just or unjust, at a small cost, with magic arts and incantations binding heaven, as they say, to execute their will. And the poets are the authorities to whom they appeal, now smoothing the path of vice with the words of Hesiod. Vice may be had in abundance without trouble, the way is smooth and her dwelling place is near, but before virtue the gods have set toil, and a tedious and uphill road, then citing Homer as a witness that the gods may be influenced by men, for he also says, The gods, too, may be turned from their purpose, and men pray to them and avert their wrath by sacrifices and soothing entreaties, and by libations and the odour of fat, when they have sinned and transgressed. And they produce a host of books written by Musius and Orpheus, who were children of the moon and the muses, that is what they say, according to which they perform their ritual, and persuade not only individuals but whole cities that expiations and atonements for sin may be made by sacrifices and amusements which fill a vacant hour, and are equally at the service of the living and the dead. The latter sort they call mysteries, and they redeem us from the pains of hell, but if we neglect them, no one knows what awaits us. He proceeded, and now, when the young hear all this said about virtue and vice, and the way in which gods and men regard them, how are their minds likely to be affected, my dear Socrates? Those of them, I mean, who are quick-witted and like bees on the wing light on every flower, and from all that they hear are prone to draw conclusions as to what manner of persons they should be, and in what way they should walk if they make the best of life. Probably the youth will say to himself in the words of Pindar, Can I by justice or by crooked ways of deceit ascend a loftier tower which may be a fortress to me all my days? For what men say is that, if I am really just and am not also thought just, profit there is none, but the pain and loss, on the other hand, are unmistakable. But if, though unjust, I acquire the reputation of justice, a heavenly life is promised to me. Since then, as philosophers prove, appearance tyrannizes over truth, and is lord of happiness, to appearance I must devote myself. I will describe around me a picture and shadow of virtue, to be the vestibule and exterior of my house. Behind I will trail the subtle and crafty fox, as Archilochus, greatest of sages, recommends. But I hear someone exclaiming that the concealment of wickedness is often difficult, to which I answer, nothing great is easy. Nevertheless, the argument indicates this, if we would be happy, to be the path along which we should proceed. With a view to concealment, we will establish secret brotherhoods and political clubs, and there are professors of rhetoric who teach the art of persuading courts and assemblies, and so, partly by persuasion and partly by force, I shall make unlawful gains and not be punished. Still I hear a voice saying that the gods cannot be deceived, neither can they be compelled. But what if there are no gods? Or suppose them to have no care of human things? Why, in either case, should we mind about concealment? And even if there are gods and they do care about us, 
yet we know of them only from tradition and the genealogies of the poets and these are the very persons who say they may be influenced and turned by sacrifices and soothing entreaties and by offerings let us be consistent then and believe both or neither if the poets speak truly why then we had better be unjust and offer of the fruits of injustice for if we are just although we may escape the vengeance of heaven we shall lose the gains of injustice but if we are unjust we shall keep the gains and by our sinning and praying and praying and sinning the gods will be propitiated and we shall not be punished but there is a world below in which either we or our posterity must suffer for our unjust deeds yes my friend will be the reflection but there are mysteries and atoning deities and these have great power that is what mighty cities declare and the children of the gods who were their poets and prophets bear a like testimony on what principle then shall we any longer choose justice rather than the worst injustice when if we only unite the latter with a deceitful regard to appearances we shall fare to our mind both with gods and men in life and after death as the most numerous and the highest authorities tell us knowing all this socrates how can a man who has any superiority of mind or person or rank or wealth be willing to honour justice or indeed to refrain from laughing when he hears justice praised and even if there should be some one who is able to disprove the truth of my words and who is satisfied that justice is best still he is not angry with the unjust but is very ready to forgive them because he also knows that men are not just of their own free will unless peradventure there be some one whom the divinity within him may have inspired with a hatred of injustice or who has attained knowledge of the truth but no other man he only blames injustice who owing to cowardice or age or some weakness has not the power of being unjust and this is proved by the fact that when he obtains the power he immediately becomes unjust as far as he can be the cause of all this socrates was indicated by us at the beginning of the argument when my brother and i told you how astonished we were to find that of all the professing panegyrists of justice beginning with the ancient heroes of whom any memorial has been preserved to us and ending with the men of our own time no one has ever blamed injustice or praised justice except with a view to the glories honours and benefits which flow from them no one has ever adequately described either in verse or prose the true essential nature of either of them abiding in the soul and invisible to any human or divine eye or shown that of all the things of a man's soul which he has within him justice is the greatest good and injustice the greatest evil had this been the universal strain had you sought to persuade us from this from our youth upwards we should not have been on the watch to keep one another from doing wrong but every one would have been his own watchman because afraid if he did wrong of harbouring in himself the greatest of evils i dare say that thrasymachus and others would seriously hold the language which i have been merely repeating and words even stronger than these about justice and injustice grossly as i conceive perverting their true nature but i speak in this vehement manner as i must frankly confess to you because i want to hear from you the opposite side and i would ask you to show not only the superiority which justice has over injustice but what effect they have on the possessor of them which makes the one to be a good and the other an evil to him and please as glaucon requested of you to exclude the reputations for unless you take away from each of them his true reputation and add on the false we shall say that you do not praise justice but the appearance of it we shall think that you are only exhorting us to keep injustice dark and that you really agree with thrasymachus in thinking that justice is another's good and the interest of the stronger 
and that injustice is a man's own profit and interest, though injurious to the weaker. Now, as you have admitted that justice is one of the highest class of goods which are desired indeed for their results, but in a far greater degree for their own sakes, like sight or hearing or knowledge or health, or any other real and natural and not merely conventional good, I would ask you, in your praise of justice, to regard one point only. I mean the essential good and evil, which justice and injustice work in the possessors of them. Let others praise justice and censure injustice, magnifying the rewards and honors of the one and abusing the other. That is a manner of arguing which, coming from them, I am ready to tolerate, but from you who have spent your whole life in the consideration of this question, unless I hear the contrary from your own lips, I expect something better. And therefore, I say, not only prove to us that justice is better than injustice, but show what they either of them do to the possessor of them, which makes the one to be a good and the other an evil, whether seen or unseen by gods and men. End of Book Two, Part One Book two, part two of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Veron Real. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book two, part two. I had always admired the genius of Glaucon and Adimantus, but on hearing these words I was quite delighted, and said, Sons of an illustrious father, that was not a bad beginning of the elegiac verses, which the admirer of Glaucon made in honour of you, after you had distinguished yourselves at the battle of Megara. Sons of Ariston, he sang, divine offspring of an illustrious hero. The epithet is very appropriate, for there is something truly divine in being able to argue, as you have done for the superiority of injustice, and remaining unconvinced by your own arguments. And I do believe that you are not convinced. This I infer from your general character, for had I judged only from your speeches, I should have mistrusted you. But now, the greater my confidence in you, the greater is my difficulty in knowing what to say. For I am in a strait between two. On the one hand, I feel that I am unequal to the task, and my inability is brought home to me by the fact that you were not satisfied with the answer which I made to Thrasymachus, proving, as I thought, the superiority which justice has over injustice. And yet I cannot refuse to help, while breath and speech remain to me. I am afraid that there would be an impiety in being present when justice is evil spoken of, and not lifting up a hand in her defence and therefore I had best give such help as I can. Glaucon and the rest entreated me, by all means not to let the question drop, but to proceed in the investigation. They wanted to arrive at the truth, first, about the nature of justice and injustice, and secondly, about their relative advantages. I told them what I really thought that the inquiry would be of a serious nature, and would require very good eyes. Seeing then, I said, that we are no great wits, I think that we had better adopt a method, which I may illustrate thus. Suppose that a short-sighted person had been asked by someone to read small letters from a distance, and it occurred to someone else, 
that they might be found in another place which was larger and in which the letters were larger if they were the same and he could read the larger letters first and then proceed to the lesser this would have been thought a rare piece of good fortune very true said adimantus but how does this illustration apply to our inquiry i will tell you i replied just this which is the subject of our inquiry is as you know sometimes spoken of as a virtue of an individual and sometimes as a virtue of a state true he replied and is not a state larger than an individual it is then in the larger the quantity of justice is likely to be larger and more easily discernible i propose therefore that we inquire into the nature of justice and injustice first as they appear in the state and secondly in the individual proceeding from the greater to the lesser and comparing them that he said is an excellent proposal and if we imagine the state in process of creation we shall see the justice and injustice of the state in process of creation also i dare say when the state is completed there may be a hope that the object of our search will be more easily discovered yes far more easily but ought we to attempt to construct one i said for to do so as i am inclined to think will be a very serious task reflect therefore i have reflected said adamantus and am anxious that you should proceed a state i said arises as i conceive out of the needs of mankind no one is self-sufficing but all of us have many wants can any other origin of a state be imagined there can be no other then as we have many wants and many persons are needed to supply them one takes a helper for one purpose and another for another and when these partners and helpers are gathered together in one habitation the body of inhabitants is termed a state true he said and they exchange with one another and one gives and another receives under the idea that the exchange will be for their good very true then i said let us begin and create an idea a state and yet the true creator is necessity who is the mother of our invention of course he replied now the first and greatest of necessities is food which is the condition of life and existence certainly the second is a dwelling and the third clothing and the like true and now let us see how our city will be able to supply this great demand we may suppose that one man is a husbandman another a builder some one else a weaver shall we add to them a shoemaker or perhaps some other purveyor to our bodily wants quite right the barest notion of a state must include four or five men clearly and how will they proceed will each bring the result of his labours into a common stock the individual husbandman for example producing for four and labouring four times as long and as much as he need in the provision of food with which he supplies others as well as himself or will he have nothing to do with others and not be at the trouble of producing for them but provide for himself alone a fourth of the food in a fourth of the time and in the remaining three fourths of his time be employed in making a house or a coat or a pair of shoes having no partnership with others but supplying himself all his own wants Odimantus thought that he should aim at producing food only and not at producing everything probably i replied that would be the better way 
and when i hear you say this i am myself reminded that we are not all alike there are diversities of natures among us which are adapted to different occupations very true and will you have a work better done when the workman has many occupations or when he has only one when he has only one further there can be no doubt that a work is bought when not done at the right time no doubt for business is not disposed to wait until the doer of the business is at leisure but the doer must follow up what he is doing and make the business his first object he must and if so we must infer that all things are produced more plentifully and easily and of a better quality when one man does one thing which is natural to him and does it at the right time and leaves other things undoubtedly then more than four citizens will be required for the husbandman will not make his own plough or mattock nor other implements of agriculture if they are to be good for anything neither will the builder make his tools and he too needs many and in like manner the weaver and shoemaker true then carpenters and smiths and many other artisans will be sharers in our little state which is already beginning to grow true yet even if we add levites shepherds and other herdsmen in order that our husbandmen may have oxen to plough with and builders as well as husbandmen may have draught cattle and couriers and weavers fleeces and hides still our state will not be very large that is true yet neither will it be a very small state which contains all these then again there is the situation of the city to find a place where nothing needs to be imported is well nigh impossible impossible then there must be another class of citizens who will bring the required supply from another city there must but if the trader goes empty-handed having nothing which they require who would supply his need he will come back empty-handed that is certain and therefore what they produce at home must be not only enough for themselves but such both in quantity and quality as to accommodate those from whom their wants are supplied very true then more husbandmen and more artisans will be required they will not to mention the importers and exporters who are called merchants yes then we shall want merchants we shall and if merchandise is to be carried over the sea skilful sailors will also be needed and in considerable numbers yes in considerable numbers then again within the city how will they exchange their productions to secure such an exchange was as you will remember one of our principal objects when he formed them into a society and constituted a state clearly they will buy and sell then they will need a market-place and a money token for purposes of exchange certainly suppose now that a husbandman or an artisan brings some production to market and he comes at a time when there is no one to exchange with him is he to leave his calling and sit idle in the market-place not at all he will find people there who seeing the want undertake the office of salesmen in our ordered state they are commonly those who are the weakest in bodily strength and therefore of little use for any other purpose their duty is to be in the market and to give money in exchange for goods to those who desire to sell and to take money from those who desire to buy this want then 
creates a class of retail traders in our state is not the tailor the term which is applied to those who sit in the market-place engaged in buying and selling while those who wander from one city to another are called merchants yes he said and there is another class of servants who are intellectually hardly on the level of companionship still they have plenty of bodily strength for labour which accordingly they sell and are called if i do not mistake hirelings hire being the name which is given to the price of their labour true then hirelings will help to make up our population yes and now adimantus is our state matured and perfected i think so End of book two, part two. Recording by Vernon Wheel. Book two, part three of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Allman. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Two, Part Three. Where then is justice? And where is injustice? And in what part of the state did they spring up? Probably in the dealings of these citizens with one another. I cannot imagine that they are more likely to be found anywhere else. I dare say that you are right in your suggestion, I said. We had better think the matter out and not shrink from the inquiry. Let us consider, first of all, what will be their way of life, now that we have thus established them. Will they not produce corn, and wine, and clothes, and shoes, and build houses for themselves? And when they are housed, will they work, in summer, commonly, stripped and barefoot, but in winter substantially clothed and shod? They will feed on barley meal and flour of wheat, baking and kneading them, making noble cakes and loaves. These they will serve up on a mat of reeds or of clean leaves, themselves reclining the while upon beds strewn with the yew or myrtle and they and their children will feast drinking of the wine which they have made wearing garlands on their heads and hymning the praise of the gods in happy converse with one another and they will take care that their families do not exceed their means having an eye to poverty or war but said glaucon interposing you have not given them a relish to their meal true i replied i had forgotten of course they must have a relish salt and olives and cheese and they will boil roots and herbs such as country people prepare for dessert we shall give them figs and peas and beans, and they will roast myrtle berries and acorns at the fire, drinking in moderation, and with such a diet they may be expected to live in peace and health to a good old age, and bequeath a similar life to their children after them. Yes, Socrates, he said, and if you were providing for a city of pigs, how else would you feed the beasts? But what would you have, Glaucon? I replied. Why, he said, you should give them the ordinary conveniences of life. People who are to be comfortable are accustomed to lie on sofas and dine off tables, and they should have sauces and sweets in the modern style. Yes, I said, now I understand. The question which you would have me consider is, not only how a state, but how a luxurious state is created. And possibly there is no harm in this, for in such a state we shall be more likely to see how justice and injustice originate. In my opinion, the true and healthy constitution of the state is the one which I have described. But if you wish to also see a state at fever heat, I have no objection. For I suspect that many will not be satisfied with the simpler way of life. They will be for adding sofas and tables and other furniture, also dainties and perfumes and incense and courtesans and cakes, all these not of one sort only, but in every variety. We must go beyond the necessities of which I was first speaking, such as houses and clothes and shoes. The arts of the painter and the embroiderer will have to be set in motion and gold and ivory and all sorts of material must be procured. True, he said. Then we must enlarge our borders, for the original healthy state is no longer sufficient. Now will the city have to fill and swell with a multitude of callings which are not required by any natural want, such as the whole tribe of hunters and actors, of whom one large class have to do with forms and colors, another will be the votaries of music, poets, and their attendant train of rhapsodists, players, dancers, contractors also makers of diverse kinds of articles, including women's dresses. And we shall want more servants, 
Will not tutors also be in request, and nurses wet and dry, tire-women and barbers, as well as confectioners and cooks, and swineherds too, who are not needed and therefore had no place in the former edition of our state, but are needed now? They must not be forgotten, and there will be animals of many other kinds if people eat them. Certainly. And living in this way we shall have much greater need of physicians than before, much greater and the country which was enough to support the original inhabitants will be too small now, and not enough. Quite true. Then a slice of our neighbor's land will be wanted by us for pasture and tillage, and they will want a slice of ours, if, like ourselves, they exceed the limit of necessity, and give themselves up to the unlimited accumulation of wealth. That, Socrates, will be inevitable. And so we shall go to war, Glaucon, shall we not? Most certainly, he replied. Then, without determining as yet whether war does good or harm, thus much we may affirm, that now we have discovered war to be derived from causes which are also the causes of almost all evil in states, private as well as public, undoubtedly. And our state must once more enlarge, and this time the enlargement will be nothing short of a whole army, which will have to go out and fight with the invaders for all that we have, as well as for things and persons whom we were describing above. Why, he said, are they not capable of defending themselves? No, I said, not if we were right that the principle which was acknowledged by all of us when we were framing the state, the principle, as you will remember, was that one man cannot practice many arts with success. Very true, he said. But is not war an art? Certainly. And an art requiring as much attention as shoemaking? Quite true. And the shoemaker was not allowed by us to be a husbandman, or a weaver, or a builder, in order that we might have our shoes well made. But to him and to every other worker was assigned one work for which he was by nature fitted, and at that he was to continue working all his life long and at no other. He was not to let opportunity slip, and then he would become a good workman. Now nothing can be more important than that the work of a soldier should be well done. But is war an art so easily acquired that a man may be a warrior who is also a husbandman, or shoemaker, or other artisan? Although no one in the world would be a good dice or draught player who merely took up the game as a recreation, and had not from his earliest years devoted himself to this and nothing else, no tools will make a man a skilled workman, or master of defense, nor be of any use to him who has not learned how to handle them, and has never bestowed any attention upon them. How then will he who takes up a shield or other implement of war become a good fighter all in a day, whether with heavy armed or any other kind of troops? Yes, he said. The tools which would teach men their own use would be beyond price and the higher the duties of the guardian, I said, the more time and skill and art and application will be needed by him. No doubt, he replied. Will he not also require natural aptitude for his calling? Certainly. Then it will be our duty to select, if we can, natures which are fitted for the task of guarding the city. It will. And the selection will be no easy matter, I said. But we must be brave and do our best. We must. Is not the noble youth very like a well-bred dog in respect of guarding and watching? What do you mean? I mean that both of them ought to be quick to see, and swift to overtake the enemy when they see him. And strong, too, if, when they have caught him, they have to fight with him. All these qualities, he replied, will certainly be required by them. Well, and your guardian must be brave if he is to fight well. Yes. And is he likely to be brave who has no spirit, whether horse or dog or any other animal? Have you never observed how invincible and unconquerable is spirit, and how in the presence of it makes the soul of any creature to be absolutely fearless and indomitable? I have. Then we now have a clear notion of the bodily qualities which are required in the guardian. True. And also of the mental ones. His soul is to be full of spirit? Yes. But are not these spirited natures apt to be savage with one another and with everybody else? A difficulty by no means easy to overcome, he replied. Whereas, I said, they ought to be dangerous to their enemies and gentle to their friends. If not, they will destroy themselves without waiting for their enemies to destroy them. True, he said. What is to be done, then? I said, how shall we find a gentle nature which has also a great spirit? For the one is the contradiction of the other. True. He will not be a good guardian who is wanting either of these two qualities, and yet the combination of them appears to be impossible, and hence we must infer that to be a good guardian is impossible. I am afraid that what you say is true, he replied. Here feeling perplexed, I began to think over what had proceeded. My friend, I said, no wonder that we are in a perplexity, for we have lost sight of the image which we had before us. 
What do you mean, he said? I mean to say that there do exist natures gifted with these opposite qualities. And where do you find them? Many animals, I replied. Furnish examples of them. Our friend the dog is a very good one. You know that well-bred dogs are perfectly gentle to their familiars and acquaintances, and the reverse to strangers. Yes, I know. Then there is nothing impossible or out of the order of nature in our finding a guardian who has a similar combination of qualities? Certainly not. Would not he who is fitted to be a guardian, besides the spirited nature, need to have the qualities of a philosopher? I do not apprehend your meaning. The trait of which I am speaking, I replied, may be also seen in the dog, and is remarkable in the animal. What trait? Why, a dog, whenever he sees a stranger, is angry. When an acquaintance, he welcomes him. Although the one has never done him any harm, nor the other any good. Did this never strike you as curious? The matter never struck me before, but I quite recognize the truth of your remark. And surely this instinct of the dog is very charming. Your dog is a true philosopher. Why? Why? Because he distinguishes the face of a friend and of an enemy only by the criterion of knowing and not knowing. And must not an animal be a lover of learning who determines what he likes and dislikes by the test of knowledge and ignorance? Most assuredly. And is not the love of learning the love of wisdom, which is philosophy? They are the same, he replied. And may we not say confidently of man also, that he who is likely to be gentle to his friends and acquaintances, must by nature be a lover of wisdom and knowledge? That we may safely affirm. Then he is to be a really good and noble guardian of the state will require to unite in himself philosophy, and spirit, and swiftness, and strength? Undoubtedly. Then we have found the desired natures. And now that we have found them, how are they to be reared and educated? Is this not an inquiry which may be expected to throw light on the greater inquiry which is our final end? How do justice and injustice grow up in states? For we do not want either to omit what is the point, or to draw out the argument to an inconvenient length. Idomentus thought that the inquiry would be of great service to us. Then I said, my dear friend, the task must not be given up, even if somewhat long. Certainly not. End of Book 2, Part 3 Recording by Jim Allman, Houston, Texas Book 2, Part 4 of Plato's Republic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jim Allman The Republic by Plato Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 2, Part 4. Come then, and let us pass a leisure hour in storytelling, and our story shall be the education of our heroes. By all means, and what shall be their education? Can we find a better than the traditional sort? And this has two divisions, gymnastic for the body and music for the soul. True. Shall we begin education with music and go on to gymnastic afterwards? By all means. And when you speak of music, do you include literature or not? I do. And literature may be either true or false. Yes. And the young shall be trained in both kinds, and we begin with the false. I do not understand your meaning, he said. You know, I said, that we begin by telling children stories which, though not wholly destitute of truth, are in the main fictitious. And these stories are told to them when they are not of age to learn gymnastics. Very true. That was my meaning when I said that we must teach music before gymnastics. Quite right, he said. You know also that the beginning is the most important part of any work, especially in the case of a young and tender thing. For that is the time at which character is being formed and the desired impression is more readily taken. Quite true. And shall we just carelessly allow children to hear any casual tales which may be devised by casual persons, and to receive into their minds ideas for the most part the very opposite of those which we should wish them to have when they are grown up? We cannot then the first thing will be to establish a censorship of the writers of fiction, and let the censors receive any tale of fiction which is good, and reject the bad. And we will desire mothers and nurses to tell their children the authorized ones only. Let them fashion the mind with such tales, even more fondly than they would mold the body with their hands. But most of those which are now in use must be discarded. Of which tales are you speaking? he said. You may find a model of the lesser and the greater, I said for they are necessarily of the same type, and there is the same spirit in both of them. Very likely, he replied, but I do not as yet know what you would term the greater. 
those, I said, which are narrated by Homer and Hesiod, and the rest of the poets, which have ever been the great storytellers of mankind. But which stories do you mean, he said, and what fault do you find with them? A fault which is most serious, I said, the fault of telling a lie, and, what is more, a bad lie. But when is this fault committed? Whenever an erroneous representation is made of the nature of gods and heroes, as when a painter paints a portrait not having the shadow of a likeness to the original. Yes, he said, that sort of thing is certainly very blamable. But what are the stories which you mean? First of all, I said, there was that greatest of all lies in high places, which the poet told about Uranus, and which was a bad lie, too. I mean what Hesiod says that Uranus did, and how Cronus retaliated on him. The doings of Cronus, and the sufferings which in turn his son inflicted upon him, even if they were true, ought certainly not to be lightly told to young and thoughtless persons. If possible, they had better be buried in silence. But if there is an absolute necessity for their mention, a chosen few might hear them in a mystery, and they should sacrifice not a common Elysian pig, but some huge and unprocurable victim, and then the number of the hearers will be very few indeed. Why, yes, he said, those stories are extremely objectionable. Yes, Adamantus, they are stories not to be repeated in our state. The young man should not be told that in committing the worst of crimes he is far from doing anything outrageous, and that even if he chastises his father when he does wrong, in whatever manner, he will only be following the example of the first and greatest among the gods. I entirely agree with you, he said. In my opinion, those stories are quite unfit to be repeated. Neither, if we mean future guardians to regard the habit of quarrelling among themselves as of all things the basest, should anything be said to them of the wars in heaven, and of the plots and fightings of the gods against one another, for they are not true. No, we shall never mention the battles of the giants, or let them be embroidered on garments, and we shall be silent about the innumerable other quarrels of gods and heroes with their friends and relatives. If they would only believe us, we would tell them that quarrelling is unholy, and that never up to this time has there been any quarrel between citizens. This is what old men and old women should begin telling children, and when they grow up the poets also should be told to compose for them in a similar spirit. But the narrative of Hephaestus binding Hera his mother, or how on another occasion Zeus sent him flying for taking her part when she was being beaten, and all the battles of the gods in Homer, these tales must not be admitted into our state whether they are supposed to have an allegorical meaning or not. For a young person cannot judge what is allegorical and what is literal. Anything that he receives into his mind at that age is likely to become indelible and unalterable, and therefore it is most important that the tales which the young first hear should be models of virtuous thoughts. There you are right, he replied. But if any one asks where are such models to be found, and of what tales are you speaking, how shall we answer him? I said to him, You and I, Adamantus, at this moment are not poets, but founders of a state. Now the founders of a state ought to know the general forms in which poets should cast their tales, and the limits which must be observed by them. But to make the tales is not their business. Very true, he said. But what are these forms of theology which you mean? Something of this kind, I replied. God is always to be represented as he truly is, whatever be the sort of poetry, epic, lyric, or tragic, in which the representation is given. Right. And is he not truly good? And must he not be represented as such? Certainly. And no good thing is hurtful. No, indeed. And that which is not hurtful hurts not. Certainly not. And that which hurts not does no evil. No. And can that which does no evil be a cause of evil? Impossible. And the good is advantageous. Yes. And therefore the cause of well-being. Yes. It follows, therefore, that the good is not the cause of all things, but of the good only. Assuredly. Then God, if he be good, is not the author of all things, as the many assert, but he is the cause of a few things only, and not of most things that occur to men. For few are the goods of human life, and many are the evils, and the good is to be attributed to God alone. Of the evils the causes are to be sought elsewhere, and not in him. That appears to me to be most true, he said. Then we must not listen to Homer or to any other poet who is guilty of the folly of saying that two castes lie at the threshold of Zeus, full of lots, one of good, the other of evil lots, and that he to whom Zeus gives a mixture of the two sometimes meets with evil fortune, at other times with good, but that he to whom is given the cup of unmingled ill, him wild hunger drives o'er the beauteous earth, and again, Zeus, who is the dispenser of good and evil to us. 
and if any one asserts that the violation of oaths and treaties, which was really the work of Pandarus, was brought about by Athene and Zeus, or that the strife and contention of the gods was instigated by Themis and Zeus, he shall not have our approval. Neither will we allow our young men to hear the words of Aeschylus thus, God plants guilt among men when he desires utterly to destroy a house. And if a poet writes of the sufferings of Niobe, the subject of the tragedy in which these iambic verses occur, or of the house of Pelops, or of the Trojan War, or on any similar theme, either we must not permit him to say that these are the works of God, or if they are of God, he must devise some explanation of them such as we are seeking. He must say that God did what was just and right, and that they were the better for being punished, but that those who are punished are miserable, and that God is the author of their misery, the poet is not to be permitted to say. Though he may say that the wicked are miserable because they require to be punished, and are benefited by receiving punishment from God, but that God being good is the author of evil to any one is to be strenuously denied, and not to be said or sung or heard in verse or prose by any one, whether old or young, in any well-ordered commonwealth. Such a fiction is suicidal, ruinous, impious. I agree with you, he replied, and am ready to give my assent to the law. Let this then be one of our rules and principles concerning the gods, to which our poets and reciters will be expected to conform, that God is not the author of all things, but of good only. That will do, he said. And what do you think of a second principle? Shall I ask whether God is a magician, and of a nature to appear insidiously now in one shape, and now in another, sometimes himself changing and passing into many forms, sometimes deceiving us with the semblance of such transformations? Or is he one and the same immutably fixed in his own proper image? I cannot answer you, he said, without more thought. Well, I said, but if we suppose a change in anything, that change must be effected either by the thing itself, or by some other thing? Most certainly. And things which are at their best are also least liable to be altered or discomposed. For example, when healthiest and strongest, the human frame is least liable to be affected by meats and drinks, and the plant which is in the fullest vigor also suffers least from winds or the heat of the sun or any similar causes. Of course. And will not the bravest and wisest soul be least confused or deranged by any external influence? True. And the same principle, as I should suppose, applies to all composite things. Furniture, houses, garments. When good and well made, they are least altered by time and circumstances. Very true then everything which is good, whether made by art or nature, or both, is least liable to suffer change from without. True. But surely God and the things of God are in every way perfect? Of course they are. Then he can hardly be compelled by external influence to take many shapes. He cannot. But may he not change and transform himself? Clearly, he said, that must be the case if he is changed at all. And will he then change himself for the better and fairer, or for the worse and more unsightly? If he changes at all, he can only change for the worse, for we cannot suppose him to be deficient either in virtue or beauty. Very true, Adamantus. But then would any one, whether God or man, desire to make himself worse? Impossible. Then it is impossible that God should ever be willing to change, being, as is supposed, the fairest and best that is conceivable. Every God remains absolutely and forever in his own form. That necessarily follows, he said, in my judgment. Then, I said, my dear friend, let none of the poets tell us, the gods, taking the disguise of strangers from other lands, walk up and down cities in all sorts of forms. And let no one slander Proteus and Thetis, neither let any one, either in tragedy or in any other kind of poetry, introduce Hera disguised in the likeness of a priestess asking an alms, for the life-giving daughters of Inachus the river of Argos. Let us have no more lies of that sort. Neither must we have mothers under the influence of the poets scaring their children with a bad version of these myths, telling how certain gods, as they say, go about by night in the likeness of so many strangers in diverse forms. But let them take heed lest they make cowards of their children, and at the same time speak blasphemy against the gods. Heaven forbid, he said. But although the gods themselves are unchangeable, Still, by witchcraft and deception, they make us think that they appear in various forms? Perhaps, he replied. Well, but can you imagine that God will be willing to lie, whether in word or deed, or to put forth a phantom of himself? I cannot say, he replied. 
Do you not know, I said, that the true lie, if such an expression may be allowed, is hated of gods and men? What do you mean, he said? I mean that no one is willingly deceived in that which is the truest and highest part of himself, or about the truest and highest matters. There, above all, he is most afraid of a lie having possession of him. Still, he said, I do not comprehend you. The reason is, I replied, that you attribute some profound meaning to my words, but I am only saying that deception, or being deceived or uninformed about the highest realities in the highest part of themselves, which is the soul, and in that part of them to have and to hold the lie, is what mankind like least. That, I say, is what they utterly detest. There is nothing more hateful to them. And, as I was just now remarking, this ignorance in the soul of him who is deceived may be called the true lie for the lie in words is only a kind of imitation and shadowy image of a previous affection of the soul, not pure, unadulterated falsehood. Am I not right? Perfectly right. The true lie is hated not only by the gods, but also by men? Yes. Whereas the lie in words is in certain cases useful and not hateful. In dealing with enemies, that would be an instance. Or again, when those whom we call our friends in a fit of madness or illusion are going to do some harm, then it is useful and is a sort of medicine or preventive. Also in the tales of mythology, of which we were just now speaking. Because we do not know the truth about ancient times, we make falsehood as much like truth as we can, and so turn it to account. Very true, he said. But can any of these reasons apply to God? Can we suppose that he is ignorant of antiquity, and therefore has recourse to invention? That would be ridiculous, he said. Then the lying poet has no place in our idea of God? I should say not. Or perhaps he may tell a lie because he is afraid of enemies. That is inconceivable. But he may have friends who are senseless or mad. But no mad or senseless person can be a friend of God. Then no motive can be imagined why God should lie? None whatever. Then the superhuman and divine is absolutely incapable of falsehood? Yes. Then is God perfectly simple and true both in word and deed? He changes not. He deceives not, either by sign or word, by dream or waking vision. Your thoughts, he said, are the reflection of my own. You agree with me, then, I said, that this is the second type or form in which we should write and speak about divine things. The gods are not magicians who transform themselves, neither do they deceive mankind in any way. I grant that. Then, although we are admirers of Homer, we do not admire the lying dream which Zeus sends to Agamemnon. Neither will we praise the verses of Aeschylus in which Thetis says that Apollo at her nuptials was celebrating in song her fair progeny whose days were to be long, and to know no sickness. And when he had spoken of my lot as in all things blessed of heaven, he raised a note of triumph and cheered my soul. And I thought that the world of Phoebus, being divine and full of prophecy, would not fail. And now he himself, who uttered the strain, he who was present at the banquet, he who said this, he it is who has slain my son. These are the kind of sentiments about the gods which will arouse our anger. And he who utters them shall be refused a course. Neither shall we allow teachers to make use of them in the instruction of the young, meaning, as we do, that our guardians, as fair as men can be, should be true worshippers of the gods and like them. I entirely agree, he said, in these principles, and promise to make them by laws. End of Book Two Recording by Jim Allman, Houston, Texas. Book Three, Part One of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Allman. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Three, Part One. Such, then, I said, are our principles of theology. Some tales are to be told, and others are not to be told to our disciples from their youth upwards, if we mean them to honor the gods and their parents, and to value friendship with one another. Yes, and I think that our principles are right, he said. But if they are to be courageous, must they not learn other lessons besides these, and lessons of such a kind as will take away the fear of death? Can any man be courageous while he has the fear of death in him? Certainly not, he said. And can he be fearless of death 
or will he choose death in battle rather than defeat in slavery, who believes the world below to be real and terrible? Impossible. Then we must assume a control over the narrators of this class of tales as well as over the others, and beg them not simply to revile but rather to commend the world below, intimating to them that their descriptions are untrue and will do harm to our future warriors. That will be our duty, he said. Then, I said, we shall have to obliterate many obnoxious passages, beginning with the verses. I would rather be a serf on the land of a poor and portionless man than rule over all the dead who have come to naught. We must also expunge the verse, which tells us how Pluto feared, lest the mansions grim and squalid which the gods abhor should be seen both of mortals and immortals. And again, O oh heavens! Verily in the house of Hades there is soul and ghostly form, but no mind at all. Again of Tiresias, to him even after death did Persephone grant mind, that he alone should be wise. But the other souls are flitting shades, again. The soul flying from the limbs has gone to Hades, lamenting her fate, leaving manhood and youth. Again. And the soul, with shrilling cry, passed like smoke beneath the earth. And, as bats in hollow of mystic cavern, whenever any of them has dropped out of the string and falls from the rock, fly shrilling and cling to one another, so did they with shrilling cry hold together as they moved. And we must beg Homer and the other poets not to be angry if we strike out these and similar passages, not because they are unpoetical or unattractive to the popular ear, but because the greater the poetical charm of them, the lesser they meet for the ears of boys and men who are meant to be free and who should fear slavery more than death undoubtedly. Also we shall have to reject all the terrible and appalling names which describe the world below. Cossetus and Styx, Ghosts Under the Earth, and Sapless Shades, and any similar words of which the very mention causes a shudder to pass through the inmost soul of him who hears them. I do not say that these horrible stories may not have a use of some kind, but there is a danger that the nerves of our guardians may be rendered too excitable and effeminate by them. There is a real danger, he said. Then we must have no more of them. True. Another and nobler strain must be composed and sung by us. Clearly. And shall we proceed to get rid of the weepings and wailings of famous men? They will go with the rest. But shall we be right in getting rid of them? Reflect. Our principle is that the good man will not consider death terrible to any other good man who is his comrade. Yes, that is our principle and therefore he will not sorrow for his departed friend as though he had suffered anything terrible. He will not. Such a one, as we further maintain, is sufficient for himself and his own happiness, and therefore is least in need of other men. True, he said. And for this reason the loss of a son or brother, or the deprivation of fortune, is to him of all men least terrible, assuredly. And therefore he will be least likely to lament, and will bear with the greatest equanimity any misfortune of this sort which may befall him. Yes, he will feel such misfortune far less than another. Then we shall be right in getting rid of the lamentations of famous men, and making them over to women, and not even to women who are good for anything, or to men of a baser sort, that those who are being educated by us to be the defenders of their country may scorn to do the like. That will be very right. And then we will once more entreat Homer and the other poets not to depict Achilles, who is the son of a goddess, first lying on his side, then on his back, and then on his face, then starting up and sailing in a frenzy along the shores of the barren sea, now taking the sooty ashes in both his hands and pouring them over his head, or weeping and wailing in the various modes which Homer has delineated. Nor should he describe Priam, the kinsman of the gods, as praying and beseeching, rolling in the dirt calling each man loudly by his name. Still more earnestly will we beg of him at all events not to introduce the gods lamenting and saying, Alas, my misery, alas, that I bore the bravest to my sorrow. But if he must introduce the gods, at any rate let him not dare so completely to misrepresent the greatest of the gods, as to make him say, O oh heavens, with my eyes verily I behold a dear friend of mine chased round and round the city, and my heart is sorrowful. Or again, Woe is me that I am fated to have Sarpedon, dearest of men to me, subdued at the hands of Patroclus the son of Maeotius. For if, my sweet Adamantus, 
our youth seriously listen to such unworthy representations of the gods, instead of laughing at them as they ought, hardly will any of them deem that he himself, being but a man, can be dishonoured by similar actions. Neither will he rebuke any inclination which may arise in his mind to say and do the like, and instead of having any shame or self-control, he will be always whining and lamenting on slight occasions. Yes, he said, that is most true. Yes, I replied, but that surely is what ought not to be, as the argument has just proved to us, and by that proof we must abide until it is disproved by a better. It ought not to be. Neither ought our guardians to be given to laughter, for a fit of laughter which has been indulged to excess almost always produces a violent reaction. So I believe. Then persons of worth, even if only mortal men, must not be represented as overcome by laughter and still less must such a representation of the gods be allowed. Still less of the gods, as you say, he replied. Then we shall not suffer such an expression to be used about the gods as that of Homer when he described how inextinguishable laughter arose among the blessed gods when they saw Hephaestus bustling about the mansion. On your views, we must not admit them. On my views, if you like to father them on me, that we must not admit them is certain. Again, truth should be highly valued. If, as we were saying, a lie is useless to the gods, and useful only as medicine to men, then the use of such medicine should be restricted to physicians. Private individuals have no business with them. Clearly not, he said. Then if any one at all is to have the privilege of lying, the rulers of the state should be the persons, and they, in their dealings either with enemies or with their own citizens, may be allowed to lie for the public good but nobody else should meddle with anything of the kind, and although the rulers have this privilege, for a private man to lie to them in return is to be deemed a more heinous fault than for the patient or the pupil of a gymnasium not to speak the truth about his own bodily illness to the physician or to the trainer, or for a sailor not to tell the captain what is happening about the ship and the rest of the crew, and how things are going with himself or his fellow sailors. Most true, he said. If, then, the ruler catches anybody besides himself lying in the state, any of the craftsmen, whether he be priest or physician or carpenter, he will punish him for introducing a practice which is equally subversive and destructive of ship or state. Most certainly, he said, if our idea of the state is ever carried out. In the next place, our youth must be temperate? Certainly. Are not the chief elements of temperance, generally speaking, obedience to commanders and self-control and sensual pleasures? True then we shall approve such language as that of Diomede and Homer. Friend, sit still and obey my word. And the verses which follow. The Greeks marched breathing prowess in silent awe of their leaders. And other sentiments of the same kind. We shall. What of this line? O oh, heavy with wine, who has the eyes of a dog and the heart of a stag? And of the words which follow. Would you say that these or any similar impertinences which private individuals are supposed to address their rulers, whether in verse or prose, are well or ill-spoken? They are ill-spoken. They may very possibly afford some amusement, but they do not conduce to temperance, and therefore they are likely to do harm to our young men. Would you agree with me there? Yes. And then, again, to make the wisest of men say that nothing in his opinion is more glorious than when the tables are full of bread and meat, and the cup-bearer carries round wine which he draws from the bowl and pours into the cups. Is it fit or conducive to temperance for a young man to hear such words? Or the verse, The saddest of fates is to die and meet destiny from hunger. What would you say again to the tale of Zeus, who, while other gods and men were asleep and he the only person awake, lay devising plans, but forgot them all in a moment through his lust, and was so completely overcome with the sight of Harry that he would not even go into the hut, but wanted to lie with her on the ground, declaring that he had never been in such a state of rapture before, even when they first met one another, without the knowledge of their parents. Or that other tale of how Hephaestus, because of similar goings-on, cast a chain around Ares and Aphrodite? Indeed, he said, I am strongly of opinion that they ought not to hear that sort of thing. But any deeds of endurance which are done are told by famous men, these they ought to see and hear, as, for example, what is said in the verses. He smote his breast, and thus reproached his heart. Endure, my heart, far worse hast thou endured. Certainly, he said. 
In the next place, we must not let them be receivers of gifts or lovers of money. Certainly not. Neither must we sing to them of gifts persuading gods and persuading reverend kings. Neither is Phoenix, the tutor of Achilles, to be approved or deemed to have given his pupil good counsel when he told him that he should take the gifts of the Greeks and assist them, but that without a gift he should not lay aside his anger. Neither will we believe or acknowledge Achilles himself to have been such a lover of money that he took Agamemnon's gifts, or that when he had received payment he restored the dead body of Hector, but that without payment he was unwilling to do so. Undoubtedly, he said, these are not sentiments which can be approved. Loving Homer as I do, I hardly like to say that in attributing these feelings to Achilles, or in believing that they are truly attributed to him, he is guilty of downright impiety. As little can I believe the narrative of his insolence to Apollo, where he says, Thou hast wronged me, O far darter, most abominable of deities. Verily I would be even with thee, if I only had the power. Or his insubordination to the river god, on whose divinity he is ready to lay hands. Or his offering to the dead Patroclus of his own hair, which had been previously dedicated to the other river gods Perchaeus, and that he actually performed this vow or that he dragged Hector round the tomb of Patroclus, and slaughtered the captives at the pyre. Of all this I cannot believe that he was guilty, any more than I can allow our citizens to believe that he, the wise Charon's pupil, the son of a goddess and of Pelus, who was the gentlest of men and third in descent from Zeus, was so disordered in his wits as to be at one time the slave of two seemingly inconsistent passions, meanness not untainted by avarice, combined with overweening contempt of gods and men. You are quite right, he replied. And let us equally refuse to believe, or allow to be repeated, the tale of Theseus, son of Poseidon, or of Perithous, son of Zeus, going forth as they did to perpetrate a horrid rape, or of any other hero or son of a god daring to do such impious and dreadful things as they falsely ascribe to them in our day. And let us further compel the poets to declare either that these acts were not done by them, or that they were not the sons of gods. Both in the same breath they shall not be permitted to affirm. We will not have them trying to persuade our youth that the gods are the authors of evil, and that heroes are no better than men, sentiments which, as we were saying, are neither pious nor true, for we have already proved that evil cannot come from the gods. Assuredly not. And further they are likely to have a bad effect on those who hear them, for everybody will begin to excuse his own vices when he is convinced that similar wickednesses are always being perpetrated by the kindred of the gods, the relatives of Zeus, whose ancestral altar, the altar of Zeus, is aloft in the air on the peak of Ida, and who have the blood of deities yet flowing in their veins. And therefore let us put an end to such tales, lest they engender laxity of morals among the young. By all means, he said, but now that we are determining what classes of subjects are or are not to be spoken of, let us see whether any have been omitted by us. The manner in which gods and demigods and heroes in the world below should be treated has already been laid down. Very true. And what shall we say about men? That is clearly the remaining portion of our subject. Clearly so. But we are not in a condition to answer this question at present, my friend. Why not? Because, if I am not mistaken, we shall have to say that about men— Poets and storytellers are guilty of making the gravest misstatements when they tell us that wicked men are often happy and the good miserable, and that injustice is profitable when undetected, but that justice is a man's own loss and another's gain. These things we shall forbid them to utter, and command them to sing and say the opposite. To be sure we shall, he replied. But if you admit that I am right in this, then I shall maintain that you have implied the principle for which I have been all along contending. I grant the truth of your inference. That such things are, or are not, to be said about men is a question which we cannot determine until we have discovered what justice is, and how naturally advantageous to the possessor, whether he seems to be just or not. Most true, he said. End of Book 3, Part 1 Recording by Jim Allman, Houston, Texas Book Three, Part Two of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Allman. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. 
Book Three, Part Two. Enough of the subjects of poetry. Let us now speak of the style, and when this has been considered, both matter and manner will have been completely treated. I do not understand what you mean, said Adamantus. Then I must make you understand, and perhaps I may be more intelligible if I put the matter this way. You are aware, I suppose, that all mythology and poetry is a narration of events, either past, present, or to come? Certainly, he replied. And narration may be either simple narration, or imitation, or a union of the two? That again, he said, I do not quite understand. I fear that I must be a ridiculous teacher when I have so much difficulty in making myself apprehended. Like a bad speaker, therefore, I will not take the whole of the subject, but will break a piece off in illustration of my meaning. You know the first lines of the Iliad, in which the poet says that Chrysus prayed Agamemnon to release his daughter, and that Agamemnon flew into a passion with him. Whereupon Croesus, failing of his object, invoked the anger of the god against the Achaeans. Now as far as these lines, and he prayed all the Greeks, but especially the two sons of Atreus, the chiefs of the people. The poet is speaking in his own person. He never leads us to suppose that he is any one else. But in what follows he takes the person of Croesus, and then he does all that he can to make us believe that the speaker is not Homer, but the aged priest himself. And in this double form he has cast the entire narrative of the events which occurred at Troy and in Ithaca and throughout the Odyssey. Yes, and a narrative it remains both in the speeches which the poet recites from time to time and in the intermediate passages. Quite true. But when the poet speaks in the person of another, may we not say that he assimilates his style to that of the person who, as he informs you, is going to speak? Certainly. And this assimilation of himself to another either by the use of voice or gesture, is the imitation of the person whose character he assumes? Of course. Then in this case the narrative of the poet may be said to proceed by way of imitation. Very true. Or, if the poet everywhere appears and never conceals himself, then again the imitation is dropped, and his poetry becomes simple narration. However, in order that I may make my meaning quite clear, and that you may no more say, I don't understand, I will show how the change might be effected. If Homer had said, The priest came, having his daughter's ransom in his hands, supplicating the Achaeans, and above all the kings, and then if, instead of speaking in the person of Crisis, he had continued in his own person, the words would have been, not imitation, but simple narration. The passage would have run as follows. I am no poet, and therefore I drop the meter. The priest came and prayed the gods on behalf of the Greeks that they might capture Troy and return safely home, but begged that they would give him back his daughter, and take the ransom which he brought, and respect the god. Thus he spoke, and the other Greeks revered the priest and assented, but Agamemnon was wroth, and bade him depart and not come again, lest the staff and chaplets of the god should be of no avail to him. The daughter of Chrysus should not be released, he said. She should grow old with him in Argos. And then he told him to go away and not provoke him, if he intended to get home unscathed. And the old man went away in fear and silence, and when he had left the camp, he called upon Apollo by his many names, reminding him of everything which he had done pleasing to him, whether in building his temples, or in offering sacrifices, and praying that his good deeds might be returned to him, and that the Achaeans might expiate his tears by the arrows of the god, and so on. In this way the whole becomes simple narrative. I understand, he said. Or you may suppose the opposite case, that the intermediate passages are omitted, and the dialogue only left. That also, he said, I understand. You mean, for example, as in tragedy. You have conceived my meaning perfectly. And if I mistake not, what you failed to apprehend before is now made clear to you, that poetry and mythology are, in some cases, wholly imitative. Instances of these are supplied by tragedy and comedy. There is likewise the opposite style, in which the poet is the only speaker. Of this the dithyram affords the best example, and the combination of both is found in epic and in several other styles of poetry. Do I take you with me? Yes, he said, I see now what you meant. I will ask you to remember also what I began by saying, that we had done with the subject and might proceed to the style. Yes, I remember. In saying this, I intended to imply that we must come to an understanding about the mimetic art, whether the poets, in narrating their stories, are to be allowed by us to imitate, and if so, whether in whole or in part, and if the latter, in what parts. 
or should all imitation be prohibited? You mean, I suspect, to ask whether tragedy and comedy shall be admitted into our state? Yes, I said. But there may be more than this in question. I really do not know as yet. But whither the argument may blow, thither we go. And go we will, he said. Then, Adamantus, let me ask you whether our guardians ought to be imitators, or rather, has not this question been decided by the rule already laid down that one man can only do one thing well, and not many, and that if he attempt many, he will altogether fail of gaining much reputation in any? Certainly. And this is equally true of imitation. No one man can imitate many things as well as he would imitate a single one. He cannot. Then the same person will hardly be able to play a serious part in life, and at the same time be an imitator, and imitate many other parts as well. For even when two species of imitation are nearly allied, the same person cannot succeed in both, as, for example, the writers of tragedy and comedy. Did you not just now call them imitations? Yes, I did. And you are right in thinking that the same persons cannot succeed in both, any more that they can be rhapsodist and actors at once? True. Neither are comic and tragic actors the same. Yet all these things are but imitations. They are so. And human nature, Adamantus, appears to have been coined into yet smaller pieces, and to be as incapable of imitating many things well, as of performing well the actions of which the imitations are copies. Quite true, he replied. If then we adhere to our original notion and bear in mind that our guardians, setting aside every other business, are to dedicate themselves wholly to the maintenance of freedom in the state, making this their craft, and engaging in no work which does not bear on this end, they ought not to practice or imitate anything else. If they imitate at all, they should imitate from youth upward only those characters which are suitable to their profession, the courageous, temperate, holy, free, and the like. But they should not depict or be skilful at imitating any kind of illiberality or baseness, lest from imitation they should come to be what they imitate. Did you never observe how imitations, beginning in early youth and continuing far into life, at length grow into habits and become a second nature, affecting body, voice, and mind? Yes, certainly, he said. Then, I said, we will not allow those for whom we profess a care and of whom we say they ought to be good men to imitate a woman, whether young or old, quarreling with her husband, or striving and vaunting against the gods in conceit of her happiness, or when she is in affliction, or sorrow, or weeping, and certainly not one who is in sickness, love, or labor. Very right, he said. Neither must they represent slaves, male or female, performing the offices of slaves? They must not. And surely not bad men, whether cowards or any others, who do the reverse of what we have just been prescribing, who scold or mock or revile one another in drink or out of drink, or who in any other manner sin against themselves and their neighbors in word or deed, as the manner of such is. Neither should they be trained to imitate the action or speech of men or women who are mad or bad, for madness, like vice, is to be known, but not to be practiced or imitated. Very true, he replied. Neither may they imitate smiths or other artificers, or oarsmen, or boatswains, or the like. How can they, he said, when they are not allowed to apply their minds to the calling of any of these? Nor may they imitate the neighing of horses, the bellowing of bulls, the murmur of rivers and roll of the ocean, thunder, and all that sort of thing. Nay, he said, if madness be forbidden, neither may they copy the behavior of madmen. You mean, I said, if I understand you aright, that there is one sort of narrative style which may be employed by a truly good man when he has anything to say, and that another sort will be used by a man of an opposite character in education. And which are these two sorts, he asked? Suppose, I answered, that a just and good man in the course of a narration comes upon some saying or action of another good man. I should imagine that he would like to personate him and will not be ashamed of this sort of imitation. He will be most ready to play the part of a good man when he is acting firmly and wisely, in a less degree when he is overtaken by illness or love or drink, or has met with any other disaster. But when he comes to a character which is unworthy of him, he will not make a study of that. He will disdain such a person, and will assume his likeness, if at all, for a moment only when he is performing some good action. At other times he will be ashamed to play a part which he has never practiced nor will he like to fashion and frame himself after the baser models. He feels the employment of such an art, unless in jest, to be beneath him, and his mind revolts at it. So I should expect, he replied. 
then he will adopt a mode of narration such as we have illustrated out of Homer. That is to say, his style will be both imitative and narrative. But there will be very little of the former, and a great deal of the latter. Do you agree? Certainly, he said. That is the model which such a speaker must necessarily take. But there is another sort of character who will narrate anything, and the worse he is, the more unscrupulous he will be. Nothing will be too bad for him, and he will be ready to imitate anything, not as a joke, but in right good earnest, and before a large company. As I was just now saying, he will attempt to represent the roll of thunder, the noise of wind and hail, or the creaking of wheels and pulleys, and the various sound of flutes, pipes, trumpets, and all sorts of instruments. He will bark like a dog, bleat like a sheep, or crow like a crock. His entire art will consist in imitation of voice and gesture, and there will be very little narration. That, he said, will be his mode of speaking. These, then, are the two kinds of style? Yes. And would you agree with me in saying that one of them is simple and has but slight changes, and if the harmony and rhythm are also chosen for their simplicity, the result is that the speaker, if he speaks correctly, is always pretty much the same in style, and he will keep within the limits of a single harmony, for the changes are not great, and in like manner he will make use of nearly the same rhythm? That is quite true, he said. Whereas the other requires all sorts of harmonies and all sorts of rhythms, if the music and the style are to correspond, because the style has all sorts of changes. That is also perfectly true, he replied. And do not the two styles, or the mixture of the two, comprehend all poetry, and every form of expression in words? No one can say anything except in one or the other of them, or in both together. They include all, he said. And shall we receive into our state all the three styles, or one only of the two unmixed styles? Or would you include the mixed? I should prefer only to admit the pure imitator of virtue. Yes, I said, Adamantus, but the mixed style is also very charming. And indeed the pantomimic, which is the opposite of the one chosen by you, is the most popular style with children and their attendants, and with the world in general. I do not deny it. But I suppose you would argue that such a style is unsuitable to our state, in which human nature is not twofold or manifold, for one man plays one part only, yes, quite unsuitable. And this is the reason why in our state, and in our state only, we shall find a shoemaker to be a shoemaker and not a pilot also, and a husbandman to be a husbandman and not a dykist also, and a soldier a soldier and not a trader also, and the same throughout. True, he said. And therefore when any one of these pantomimic gentlemen, who are so clever that they can imitate anything, comes to us, and makes a proposal to exhibit himself in his poetry, we will fall down and worship him as a sweet and holy and wonderful being. But we must also inform him that in our state such as he are not permitted to exist, the law will not allow them. And so when we have anointed him with myrrh, and set a garland of wool upon his head, we shall send him away to another city. For we mean to employ for our soul's health the rougher and severer poet or storyteller, who will imitate the style of the virtuous only, and will follow those models which we prescribed at first when we began the education of our soldiers. We certainly will, he said, if we have the power. Then now, my friend, I said, that part of music or literary education which relates to the story or myth may be considered to be finished, for the matter and manner have both been discussed. I think so, too, he said. Next in order will follow melody and song. That is obvious. Every one can see already what we ought to say about them, if we are to be consistent with ourselves. I fear, said Glaucon, laughing, that the word every one hardly includes me, for I cannot at the moment say what they should be, though I may guess. At any rate, you can tell me that a song or ode has three parts, the words, the melody, and the rhythm. That degree of knowledge I may presuppose? Yes, he said, so much as that you may. And as for the words, there will surely be no difference between words which are and which are not set to music. Both will conform to the same laws, and these have already been determined by us? Yes. And the melody and rhythm will depend upon the words? Certainly. We were saying, when we spoke of the subject matter, that we had no need of lamentation and strains of sorrow? True. And which are the harmonies expressive of sorrow? You are musical, and can tell me. The harmonies which you mean are the mixed or tenor Lydian, and the full tone or bass Lydian, and such like. These, then, I said, must be banished. Even to women who have a character to maintain, they are of no use, and much less to men. Certainly. 
In the next place, drunkenness and softness and indolence are utterly unbecoming the character of our guardians. Utterly unbecoming. And which are the softer drinking harmonies? The Ionian, he replied, and the Lydian. They are termed relaxed. Well, and are these of any military use? Quite the reverse, he replied. And if so, the Dorian and the Phrygian are the only ones which you have left. I answered, of the harmonies I know nothing. But I want to have one warlike, to sound the note or accent which a brave man utters in the hour of danger and stern resolve, or when his cause is failing, and he is going to wounds or death or is overtaken by some other evil, and at every such crisis meets the blows of fortune with firm step and a determination to endure, and another to be used by him in times of peace and freedom of action, when there is no pressure of necessity, and he is seeking to persuade God by prayer, or man by instruction and admonition, or on the other hand, when he is expressing his willingness to yield to persuasion or entreaty or admonition, and which represents him when by prudent conduct he has attained his end, not carried away by his success, but acting moderately and wisely under the circumstances, and acquiescing in the event. These two harmonies I ask you to leave, the strain of necessity and the strain of freedom, the strain of the unfortunate and the strain of the fortunate, the strain of courage and the strain of temperance. These, I say, leave. And these, he replied, are the Dorian and Phrygian harmonies of which I was just now speaking. Then, I said, if these and these only are to be used in our songs and melodies, shall we not want multiplicity of notes or a panharmonic scale? I suppose not. Then we shall not maintain the artificers of lyres with three corners and complex scales? Are the makers of any other many-strained, curiously harmonized instruments? Certainly not. But what do you say to flute-makers and flute-players? Would you admit them into our state when you reflect that in this composite use of harmony the flute is worse than all the stringed instruments put together? Even the panharmonic music is only an imitation of the flute? Clearly not. There remain only the lyre and the harp for use in the city, and the shepherds may have a pipe in the country. That is surely the conclusion to be drawn from the argument. The preferring of Apollo and his instruments to Marcius and his instruments is not at all strange, I said. Not at all, he replied. And so... By the dog of Egypt, we have been unconsciously purging the state, which not long ago we termed luxurious. And we have done wisely, he said. Then let us now finish the purgation, I said. Next, in order to harmonies, rhythms will naturally follow, and they should be subject to the same rules, for we ought not to seek out complex cisterns of meter, or meters of every kind, but rather to discover what rhythms are the expressions of a courageous and harmonious life, and when we have found them, we shall adopt the foot and the melody to words having a like spirit, not the words to the foot and melody. To say what these rhythms are will be your duty. You must teach me, as you have already taught me the harmonies. But indeed, he replied, I cannot tell you. I only know that there are some three principles of rhythm out of which metrical systems are framed, just as in sounds there are four notes out of which all the harmonies are composed. That is an observation which I have made. But what sort of lives they are, severally the imitations, I am unable to say. Then, I said, we must take Damon into our counsels, and he will tell us what rhythms are expressive of meanness, or insolence, or fury, or other unworthiness, and what are to be reserved for the expression of opposite feelings. And I think that I have an indistinct recollection of his mentioning a complex cretic rhythm, also a dactylic or heroic, and he arranged them in some manner which I do not quite understand, making the rhythms equal in the rise and fall of the foot, long and short alternating. And unless I am mistaken, he spoke of an iambic as well as of a trochaic rhythm, and assigned them the short and long quantities. Also in some cases he appeared to praise or censure the movement of the foot quite as much as the rhythm, or perhaps a combination of the two, for I am not certain what he meant. These matters, however, as I was saying, had better be referred to Damon himself for the analysis of the subject would be difficult, you know. Rather so, I should say. But there is no difficulty in seeing that grace, or the absence of grace, is an effect of good or bad rhythm. None at all. End of Book 3, Part 2. Recording by Jim Allman. Houston, Texas. Book 3, Part 3 of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Allman. The Republic by Plato. 
Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 3, Part 3. And also that good and bad rhythm naturally assimilate to a good and bad style, and that harmony and discord in like manner follow style. For our principle is that rhythm and harmony are regulated by the words, and not the words by them. Just so, he said, they should follow the words. And will not the words and the character of the style depend on the temper of the soul? Yes. And everything else on the style? Yes. The beauty of style and harmony and grace and good rhythm depend on simplicity. I mean the true simplicity of a rightly and nobly ordered mind and character, not that other simplicity which is only a euphemism for folly. Very true, he replied. And if our youth are to do their work in life, must they not make these graces and harmonies their perpetual aim? They must. And surely the art of the painter and every other creative and constructive art are full of them, weaving, embroidery, architecture, and every kind of manufacture, also nature, animal and vegetable. In all of them there is grace, or the absence of grace. And ugliness and discord and inharmonious motion are nearly allied to ill words and ill nature, as grace and harmony are the twin sisters of goodness and virtue and bear their likeness. That is quite true, he said. But shall our superintendents go no further, and are the poets only to be required by us to express the image of the good in their works, on pain, if they do anything else, of expulsion from our state? Or is the same control to be extended to other artists, and are they also to be prohibited from exhibiting the opposite forms of vice and intemperance and meanness and indecency in sculpture and building and the other creative arts? And is he who cannot conform to this rule of ours to be prevented from practicing his art in our state, lest the taste of our citizens be corrupted by him? We would not have our guardians grow up amid images of moral deformity, as in some noxious pasture, and their brows and feed upon many a baneful herb and flower day by day, little by little, until they silently gather a festering mass of corruption in their own soul. Let our artists rather be those who are gifted to discern the true nature of the beautiful and graceful. Then will our youth dwell in a land of health, amid fair sights and sounds, and receive the good in everything, and beauty, the effluence of fair works, shall flow into the eye and ear like a health-giving breeze from a purer region, and insensibly draw the soul from earliest years into likeness and sympathy with the beauty of reason. There can be no nobler training than that, he replied. And therefore, I said, Glaucon, musical training is a more potent instrument than any other, because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul, on which they mightily fasten, imparting grace, and making the soul of him who is rightly educated graceful, or of him who is ill-educated ungraceful and also because he who has received this true education of the inner being will most shrewdly perceive omissions or faults in art and nature, and with a true taste, while he praises and rejoices over and receives into his soul the good, and becomes noble and good, he will justly blame and hate the bad, now in the days of his youth, even before he is able to know the reason why, and when reason comes he will recognize and salute the friend with whom his education has made him long familiar. Yes, he said, I quite agree with you in thinking that our youth should be trained in music and on the grounds which you mention. Just as in learning to read, I said, we were satisfied when we knew the letters of the alphabet, which are very few, in all their recurring sizes and combinations, not sliding them as unimportant whether they occupy a space large or small, but everywhere either to make them out, and not thinking ourselves perfect in the art of reading until we recognized them wherever they are found. True or, as we recognize the reflection of letters in the water, or in a mirror, only when we know the letters themselves, the same art and study giving us the knowledge of both. Exactly. Even so, as I maintain, neither we, nor our guardians, whom we have to educate, can ever become musical until we and they know the essential forms of temperance, courage, liberality, magnificence, and their kindred, as well as the contrary forms in all their combinations and can recognize them in their images whenever they are found, not slighting them either in small things or great, but believing them all to be within the sphere of one art and study. Most assuredly. And when a beautiful soul harmonizes with a beautiful form, and the two are cast in one mold, that will be the fairest of sights to him who has an eye to see it? The fairest, indeed. And the fairest is also the loveliest? That may be assumed. 
and the man who has the spirit of harmony will be most in love with the loveliest, but he will not love him who is of an inharmonious soul. That is true, he replied, if the deficiency be in his soul. But if there be any merely bodily defect in another, he will be patient of it, and will love all the same. I perceive, I said, that you have or have had experiences of this sort, and I agree. But let me ask you another question. Has excess of pleasure any affinity to temperance? How can that be, he replied? Pleasure deprives a man of the use of his faculties quite as much as pain. Or any affinity to virtue in general? None whatever. Any affinity to wantonness and intemperance? Yes, the greatest. And is there any greater or keener pleasure than that of sensual love? No, nor a matter. Whereas true love is a love of beauty and order, temperate and harmonious? Quite true, he said. Then no intemperance or madness should be allowed to approach true love? Certainly not. Then mad or intemperate pleasure must never be allowed to come near the lover and his beloved. Neither of them can have any part in it if their love is of the right sort? No, indeed, Socrates, it must never come near them. Then I suppose that in the city which we are founding you would make a law to the effect that a friend should use no other familiarity to his love than a father would use to his son, and then only for a noble purpose, and he must first have the other's consent, and this rule is to limit him in all his intercourse, and he is never to be seen going further, or, if he exceeds, he is to be deemed guilty of coarseness and bad taste. I quite agree, he said. This much of music, which makes a fair ending. For what should be the end of music, if not the love of beauty? I agree, he said. After music comes gymnastic, in which our youth are next to be trained. Certainly. Gymnastic as well as music should begin in early years. The training in it should be careful and should continue throughout life. Now my belief is and this is a matter upon which I should like to have your opinion in confirmation of my own. But my belief is, not that the good body by any bodily excellence improves the soul, but, on the contrary, that the good soul, by her own excellence, improves the body as far as this may be possible. What do you say? Yes, I agree. Then to the mind, when adequately trained, we should be right in handing over the more particular care of the body, and in order to avoid prolixity we may now only give the general outlines of the subject. Very good. That they must abstain from intoxication has been already remarked by us. For of all persons a guardian should be the last to get drunk and not know where in the world he is. Yes, he said, that a guardian should require another guardian to take care of him is ridiculous indeed. But next, what shall we say of their food? For the men are in training for the greatest contest of all, are they not? Yes, he said. And will the habit of body of our ordinary athletes be suited to them? Why not? I am afraid, I said, that the habit of body such as they have is but a sleepy sort of thing, and rather perilous to health. Do you not observe that these athletes sleep away their lives, and are liable to most dangerous illnesses if they depart, in ever so slight a degree, from their customary regimen? Yes, I do. Then, I said, a finer sort of training will be required for our warrior athletes, who are to be like wakeful dogs, and to see and hear with the utmost keenness amid the many changes of water and also of food, of summer heat and winter cold, which they will have to endure when on a campaign, they must not be liable to break down in health. That is my view. The really excellent gymnastic is twin sister of that simple music which we were just now describing. How so? Why, I conceive that there is a gymnastic which, like our music, is simple and good, and especially the military gymnastic. What do you mean? My meaning may be learned from Homer. He, you know, feeds his heroes at their feasts, when they are campaigning on soldiers' fare. They have no fish, although they are on the shores of the Hellespont, and they are not allowed boiled meats but only roast, which is the food most convenient for soldiers, requiring only that they should light a fire, and not involving the trouble of carrying about pots and pans. True. And I can hardly be mistaken in saying that sweet sauces are nowhere mentioned in Homer. In proscribing them, however, he is not singular. All professional athletes are well aware that a man who is to be in good condition should take nothing of the kind. Yes, he said, and knowing this, they are quite right in not taking them. Then would you not approve of Syracusan dinners, and the refinement of Sicilian cookery? I think not. Nor, if a man is to be in condition, would you allow him to have a Corinthian girl as his fair friend? Certainly not. 
neither would you approve the delicacies, as they are thought, of Athenian confectionery? Certainly not. All such feeding and living may be rightly compared by us to melody and song composed in the panharmonic style, and in all the rhythms. Exactly. Their complexity engendered license, and here disease, whereas simplicity in music was the parent of temperance in the soul, and simplicity in gymnastic of health in the body. Most true, he said. But when intemperance and diseases multiply in a state, halls of justice and medicine are always being opened, and the arts of the doctor and the lawyer give themselves airs, finding how keen is the interest which not only the slaves but the freemen of a city take about them. Of course. And yet what greater proof can there be of a bad and disgraceful state of education than this, that not only artisans and the meaner sort of people need the skill of first-rate physicians and judges, but also those who would profess to have had a liberal education? Is it not disgraceful, and a great sign of want of good breeding, that a man should have to go abroad for his law and physic because he has none of his own at home, and must therefore surrender himself into the hands of other men whom he makes lords and judges over him? Of all things, he said, the most disgraceful. Would you say most, I replied, when you consider that there is a further stage of evil in which a man is not only a lifelong litigant, passing all his days in the courts, either as plaintiff or defendant, but is actually led by his bad taste to pride himself on his litigiousness. He imagines that he is a master in dishonesty, able to take every crooked turn, and wriggle into and out of every hole, bending like a withy and getting out of the way of justice. And all for what? In order to gain small points not worth mentioning. He not knowing that so to order his life as to be able to do without a napping judge is a far higher and nobler sort of thing. Is that not still more disgraceful? Yes, he said. That is still more disgraceful. Well, I said, and to require the help of medicine, not when a wound has to be cured, or on occasion of an epidemic, but just because, by indolence and a habit of life such as we have been describing, Men fill themselves with waters and winds, as if their bodies were a marsh, compelling the ingenious sons of Asclepius to find more names for diseases, such as flatulence and catarrh. Is this not, too, a disgrace? Yes, he said, they do certainly give very strange and newfangled names to diseases. Yes, I said, and I do not believe that there were any such diseases in the days of Asclepius, and this I infer from the circumstance that the hero Eurypylus, after he had been wounded in Homer, drinks a posset of premium wine well besprinkled with parley meal and grated cheese, which are certainly inflammatory. And yet the sons of Asclepius who were at the Trojan War do not blame the damsel who gives him the drink, or rebuke Patroclus, who is treating his case. Well, he said, that was surely an extraordinary drink to be given to a person in his condition. Not so extraordinary, I replied, if you bear in mind that in former days, as is commonly said, before the time of Herodicus, the guild of Asclepius did not practice our present system of medicine, which may be said to educate diseases. But Herodicus, being a trainer, and himself of a sickly constitution, by a combination of training and doctoring, found out a way of torturing, first and chiefly himself, and secondly the rest of the world. How was that, he said? By the invention of lingering death. For he had a mortal disease which he perpetually tended, and as recovery was out of the question, he passed his entire life as a valetudinarian. He could do nothing but attend upon himself, and he was in constant torment whenever he departed in anything from his usual regimen. And so dying hard, by the help of science he struggled on to old age. A rare reward of his skill. Yes, I said, a reward which a man might fairly expect who never understood that. If Asclepius did not instruct his descendants in valetudinarian arts, the omission arose, not from ignorance or inexperience of such a branch of medicine, but because he knew that in all well-ordered states every individual has an occupation to which he must attend, and has therefore no leisure to spend in continually being ill. This we remark in the case of the artisan, but, ludicrously enough, do not apply the same rule to people of the richer sort. How do you mean? he said. I mean this. When a carpenter is ill, he asks the physician for a rough and ready cure an emetic, or a purge, or a cautery, or the knife. These are his remedies. And if someone prescribes for him a course of dietetics, and tells him that he must swathe and swaddle his head, and all that sort of thing, he replies at once that he has no time to be ill, and that he sees no good in a life which is spent in nursing his disease to the neglect of his customary employment. 
and therefore bidding good-bye to this sort of physician, he resumes his ordinary habits, and either gets well and lives and does his business, or, if his constitution fails, he dies and has no more trouble. Yes, he said, a man in his condition of life ought to use the art of medicine thus far only. Has he not, I said, an occupation? And what profit would be there in his life if he were deprived of this occupation? Quite true, he said. But with the rich man this is otherwise. Of him we do not say that he has any specially appointed work which he must perform, if he would live. He is generally supposed to have nothing to do. Then you never heard of the saying of facilities, that as soon as a man has a livelihood he should practice virtue? Nay, he said, I think that he had better begin somewhat sooner. Let us not have a dispute about this, I said, but rather ask ourselves, is the practice of virtue obligatory on a rich man, or can he live without it? And if obligatory on him, then let us raise a further question, whether this dieting of disorders, which is an impediment to the application of the mind in carpentering and the mechanical arts, does not equally stand in the way of the sentiment of facilities? Of that, he replied, there can be no doubt. Such excessive care of the body, when carried beyond the rules of gymnastic, is most inimical to the practice of virtue. Yes, indeed, I replied, and equally incompatible with the management of a house, an army, or an office of state, and, what is most important of all, irreconcilable with any kind of study or thought or self-reflection. There is a constant suspicion that headache and giddiness are to be ascribed to philosophy, and hence all practicing or making trial of virtue in the higher sense is absolutely stopped, for a man is always fancying that he is being made ill, and is in constant anxiety about the state of his body. Yes, likely enough, and therefore our politic Asclepius may be supposed to have exhibited the power of his art only to persons who, being generally of healthy constitution and habits of life, had a definite ailment. Such as these he cured by purges and operations, and bade them live as usual, herein consulting the interest of the state. But bodies which diseases had penetrated through and through he would not have attempted to cure by gradual process of evacuation and infusion. He did not want to lengthen out good-for-nothing lives, or have weak fathers begetting weaker sons. If a man was not able to live in the ordinary way, he had no business to cure him. For such a cure would have been of no use either to himself or to the state. Then, he said, you regard Asclepius as a statesman. Clearly, and his character is further illustrated by his sons. Note that they were heroes in the days of old, and practiced the medicines of which I am speaking at the siege of Troy. You will remember how, when Pandarus wounded Menelaus, they sucked the blood out of the wound and sprinkled soothing remedies. But they never prescribed what the patient was afterwards to eat or drink in the case of Menelaus, any more than in the case of Eurypylus. The remedies, as they conceived, were enough to heal any man who, before he was wounded, was healthy and regular in his habits, and even though he did happen to drink a positive premium wine, he might get well all the same. But they would have nothing to do with unhealthy and intemperate subjects, whose lives were of no use either to themselves or others. The art of medicine was not designed for their good, and though they were as rich as Midas, the sons of Asclepius would have declined to attend them. They were very acute persons, these sons of Asclepius. Naturally so, I replied. Nevertheless, the tragedians and Pindar, disobeying our behests, although they acknowledge that Asclepius was the son of Apollo, say also that he was bribed into healing a rich man who was at the point of death, and for this reason he was struck by lightning. But we, in accordance with the principle already affirmed by us, will not believe them when they tell us both. If he was the son of a god, we maintain that he was not avaricious, or, if he was avaricious, he was not the son of a god. End of Book 3, Part 3 Recording by Jim Allman, Houston, Texas Book 3, Part 4, Plato's Republic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jim Allman The Republic by Plato Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 3, Part 4. All that, Socrates, is excellent. But I should like to put a question to you. Ought there not to be good physicians in a state? And are not the best those who have treated the greatest number of constitutions, good and bad? And are not the best judges in like manner those who are acquainted with all sorts of moral natures? Yes, I said. I too would have good judges and good physicians. But do you know whom I think good? 
will you tell me? I will if I can. Let me, however, note that in the same question you join two things which are not the same. How so? he asked. Why, I said, you join physicians and judges. Now the most skillful physicians are those who, from their youth upwards, have combined with the knowledge of their art the greatest experience of disease. They had better not be robust in health, and should have had all manner of diseases in their own persons. For the body, as I conceive, is not the instrument with which they cure the body. In that case we could not allow them ever to be or to have been sickly. But they cure the body with the mind, and the mind which has become and is sick can cure nothing. That is very true, he said. But with the judge it is otherwise. Since he governs mind by mind, he ought not, therefore, to have been trained among vicious minds, and to have associated with them from youth upwards, and to have gone through the whole calendar of crime, only in order that he may quickly infer the crimes of others as he might their bodily diseases from his own self-consciousness. The honorable mind which is to form a healthy judgment should have had no experience or contamination of evil habits while young. And this is the reason why, in youth, good men often appear to be simple, and are easily practiced upon by the dishonest, because they have no examples of what evil is in their own souls. Yes, he said, they are far too apt to be deceived. Therefore, I said, the judge should not be young. He should have learned to know evil, not from his own soul, but from late and long observation of the nature of evil in others. Knowledge should be his guide not personal experience. Yes, he said, that is the ideal of a judge. Yes, I replied, and he will be a good man, which is my answer to your question. For he is good who has a good soul, but the cunning and suspicious nature of which we spoke, he who has committed many crimes and fancies himself to be a master in wickedness, when he is amongst his fellows, is wonderful in the precautions which he takes, because he judges of them by himself. But when he gets into the company of men of virtue, who have the experience of age, he appears to be a fool again, owing to his unseasonable suspicions. He cannot recognize an honest man, because he has no pattern of honesty in himself. At the same time, as the bad are more numerous than the good, and he meets with them oftener, he thinks himself, and is by others thought to be, rather wise than foolish. Most true, he said then the good and wise judge whom we are seeking is not this man, but the other. For vice cannot know virtue too, but a virtuous nature, educated by time, will acquire a knowledge both of virtue and vice. The virtuous, and not the vicious, man has wisdom, in my opinion, and in mine also. This is the sort of medicine, and this is the sort of law which you will sanction in your state. They will minister to better natures, giving health of both soul and of body. But those who are diseased in their bodies they will leave to die, and the corrupt and incurable souls they will put an end to themselves. This is clearly the best thing both for the patients and for the state. And thus our youth, having been educated only in that simple music which, as we said, inspires temperance, will be reluctant to go to law. Clearly. And the musician, who, keeping to the same track, is content to practice the simple gymnastic, will have nothing to do with medicine unless in some extreme case. That I quite believe. The very exercises and tolls which he undergoes are intended to stimulate the spirited element of his nature, and not to increase his strength. He will not, like common athletes, use exercise and regimen to develop his muscles. Very right, he said. Neither are the two arts of music and gymnastic really designed, as is often supposed, the one for the training of the soul, the other for the training of the body. What, then, is the real object of them? I believe, I said, that the teachers of both have in view chiefly the improvement of the soul. How can that be? he asked. Did you never observe, I said, the effect on the mind itself of exclusive devotion to gymnastic, or the opposite effect of an exclusive devotion to music? In what way shown, he said. The one producing a temper of hardness and ferocity, the other of softness and effeminacy, I replied. Yes, he said, I am quite aware that the mere athlete becomes too much of a savage, and that the mere musician is melted and softened beyond what is good for him. Yet surely, I said, this ferocity only comes from spirit, which, if rightly educated, would give courage, but, if too much intensified, is liable to become hard and brutal. That I quite think. 
On the other hand, the philosopher will have the quality of gentleness. And this also, when too much indulged, will turn to softness, but, if educated rightly, will be gentle and moderate. True. And in our opinion the guardians ought to have both these qualities? Assuredly. And both should be in harmony? Beyond question. And the harmonious soul is both temperate and courageous? Yes. And the inharmonious is cowardly and boorish? Very true. And, when a man allows music to play upon him and to pour into his soul through the funnel of his ears those sweet and soft and melancholy airs of which we were just now speaking, and his whole life is passed in warbling and the delights of song, in the first stage of the process the passion or spirit which is in him is tempered like iron, and made useful instead of brittle and useless. But, if he carries on the softening and soothing process, in the next stage he begins to melt and waste, until he has wasted away his spirit and cut out the sinews of his soul, and he becomes a feeble warrior. Very true. If the element of spirit is naturally weak in him, the change is speedily accomplished. But if he have a good deal, then the power of music weakening the spirit renders him excitable. On the least provocation he flames up at once, and is speedily extinguished. Instead of having spirit, he grows irritable and passionate, and is quite impractical. Exactly. And so in gymnastics, if a man takes violent exercise and is a great feeder, and the reverse of a great student of music and philosophy, at first the high condition of his body fills him with pride and spirit, and he becomes twice the man that he was. Certainly. And what happens? If he do nothing else, and holds no converse with the muses, does not even that intelligence which there may be in him, having no taste of any sort of learning or inquiry or thought or culture, grow feeble and dull and blind, his mind never waking up or receiving nourishment, and his senses not being purged of their mists? True, he said. And he ends by being a hater of philosophy, uncivilized, never using the weapon of persuasion. He is like a wild beast, all violence and fierceness, and knows no other way of dealing. And he lives in all ignorance and evil conditions, and has no sense of propriety and grace. That is quite true, he said. And as there are two principles of human nature, one the spirited and the other the philosophical, some god, as I should say, has given mankind two arts answering to them, and only indirectly to the soul and body, in order that these two principles, like the strings of an instrument, may be relaxed or drawn tighter until they are duly harmonized. And that appears to be the intention. And he who mingles music with gymnastic in the fairest proportion and best attempers them to the soul, may be rightly called the true musician and harmonist in a far higher sense than the tuner of strings. You are quite right, Socrates. And such a presiding genius will always be required in our state if the government is to last. Yes, he will be absolutely necessary. Such, then, are our principles of nurture and education. Where would be the use of going into further details about the dances of our citizens, or about their hunting and coursing, their gymnastic and equestrian contests. For these all follow the general principle, and having found that, we shall have no difficulty in discovering them. I dare say that there will be no difficulty. Very good, I said. Then what is the next question? Must we not ask who are to be rulers and whose subjects? Certainly. There can be no doubt that the elder must rule the younger, clearly, and that the best of these must rule. That is also clear. Now are not the best husbandmen those who are most devoted to husbandry? Yes. And as we are to have the best guardians for our city, must they not be those who have most the character of guardians? Yes. And to this end they ought to be wise and efficient, and to have a special care of the state? True. And a man will be most likely to care about that which he loves? To be sure and he will be most likely to love that which he regards as having the same interest with himself, and that of which the good or evil fortune is supposed by him at any time most to affect his own? Very true, he replied. Then there must be a selection. Let us note among the guardians those who in their whole life show the greatest eagerness to do what is for the good of their country, and the greatest repugnance to do what is against her interests. These are the right men and they will have to be watched at every age, in order that we may see whether they preserve their resolution, and never, under the influence either of force or enchantment, 
forget or cast off their sense of duty to the state. How cast off, he said. I will explain to you, I replied. A resolution may go out of a man's mind either with his will or against his will. With his will when he gets rid of a falsehood and learns better, against his will whenever he is deprived of a truth. I understand, he said, the willing loss of a resolution. The meaning of the unwilling I have yet to learn. Why, I said, do you not see that men are unwillingly deprived of good and willingly of evil? Is not to have lost the truth an evil, and to possess the truth a good? And you would agree that to conceive things as they are is to possess the truth? Yes, he replied. I agree with you in thinking that mankind are deprived of truth against their will. And is not this involuntary deprivation caused either by theft, or force, or enchantment? Still, he replied, I do not understand you. I fear that I must have been talking darkly, like the tragedians. I only mean that some men are changed by persuasion, and that others forget. Argument steals away the hearts of one class, and time of the other. And this I call theft. Now you understand me? Yes. Those again who are forced are those whom the violence of some pain or grief compels to change their opinion. I understand, he said, and you are quite right. And you would also acknowledge that the enchanted are those who change their minds either under the softer influence of pleasure, or the sterner influence of fear. Yes, he said, everything that deceives may be said to enchant. Therefore, as I was just now saying, we must inquire who are the best guardians of their own conviction, that what they think the interest of the state is to be the rule of their lives. We must watch them from their youth upwards, and make them perform actions in which they are most likely to forget, or to be deceived. And he who remembers and is not deceived is to be selected. He who fails in the trial is to be rejected. That will be the way? Yes. And there should also be toils and pains and conflicts prescribed for them, in which they will be made to give further proof of the same qualities. Very right, he replied. And then, I said, we must try them with enchantments. That is the third sort of test. And see what will be their behavior. Like those who take colts amid noise and tumult to see if they are of a timid nature, so must we take our youth amid terrors of some kind, and again pass them into pleasures, and prove them more thoroughly than gold is proved in the furnace, that we may discover whether they are armed against all enchantments, and of a noble bearing always, good guardians of themselves and of the music which they have learned, and retaining under all circumstances a rhythmical and harmonious nature, such as will be most serviceable to the individual and to the state. And he who at every age, as boy and youth and in mature life, has come out of the trial victorious and pure, shall be appointed a ruler and guardian of the state. He shall be honored in life and death, and shall receive sepulture and other memorials of honor, the greatest that we have to give. But him who fails, we must reject. I am inclined to think that this is the sort of way in which our rulers and guardians should be chosen and appointed. I speak generally, and not with any pretension to exactness. And speaking generally, I agree with you, he said. And perhaps the word guardian in its fullest sense ought to be applied to this higher class only who preserve us against foreign enemies and maintain peace among our citizens at home, that the one may not have the will, or the others the power, to harm us. The young men whom we before called guardians may be more properly designated auxiliaries and supporters of the principles of the rulers. I agree with you, he said. How then may we devise one of those needful falsehoods of which we lately spoke? just one royal lie which may deceive the rulers, if that be possible, and at any rate the rest of the city. What sort of lie, he said, nothing new, I replied, only an old Phoenician tale of what has often occurred before now in other places, as the poets say, and have made the world believe, though not in our time, and I do not know whether such an event could ever happen again, or could now even be made probable if it did. How your words seem to hesitate on your lips! You will not wonder, I replied, at my hesitation when you have heard. Speak, he said, and fear not. Well, then, I will speak, although I really know not how to look you in the face, or in what words to utter the audacious fiction which I propose to communicate gradually, first to the rulers, then to the soldiers, and lastly to the people. They are to be told that their youth was a dream, and the education and training which they received from us an appearance only. In reality, during all that time, they were being formed and fed in the womb of the earth, where they themselves and their arms and appurtenances were manufactured. When they were completed, the earth, their mother, sent them up, 
and so, their country being their mother and also their nurse, they are bound to advise for her good, and to defend her against attacks, and her citizens they are to regard as children of the earth and their own brothers. You had good reason, he said, to be ashamed of the lie which you were going to tell. True, I replied, but there is more coming. I have only told you half. Citizens, we shall say to them in our tale, you are brothers, yet God has framed you differently. But some of you have the power of command, and in the composition of these he has mingled gold, wherefore also they have the greatest honor. Others he has made of silver to be auxiliaries. Others, again, who are to be husbandmen and craftsmen, he has composed of brass and iron, and the species will generally be preserved in the children. But as all are of the same original stock, a golden parent will sometimes have a silver son, or a silver parent a golden son. And God proclaims as a first principle to the rulers, and above all else, that there is nothing which they should so anxiously guard, or of which they are to be such good guardians, as the purity of the race. They should observe what elements mingle in their offspring. For if the son of a golden or silver parent has an admixture of brass and iron, then nature orders a transposition of ranks, and the eye of the ruler must not be pitiful toward the child because he has to descend in the scale and become a husbandman or artisan just as there may be sons of artisans who have an admixture of gold or silver in them, are raised to honor, and become guardians or auxiliaries. For an oracle says that when a man of brass or iron guards the state, it will be destroyed. Such is the tale. Is there any possibility of making our citizens believe in it? Not in this present generation, he replied. There is no way of accomplishing this. But their sons may be made to believe the tale, and their sons' sons, and posterity after them. I see the difficulty, I replied, yet the fostering of such a belief will make them care more for the city and for one another. Enough, however, of the fiction, which may now fly abroad upon the wings of rumor, while we arm our earth-born heroes, and lead them forth under the command of their rulers. Let them look round and select a spot whence they can best suppress insurrection, if any prove refractory within, and also defend themselves against enemies, who like wolves may come down on the fold from without. There let them encamp and when they have encamped, let them sacrifice to the proper gods and prepare their dwellings. Just so, he said, and their dwellings must be such as will shield them against the cold of winter and the heat of summer. I suppose you mean houses, he replied. Yes, I said, but they must be the houses of soldiers, and not of shopkeepers. What is the difference, he said? That I will endeavor to explain, I replied, to keep watchdogs who, from want of discipline or hunger, or some evil habit or other, would turn upon the sheep and worry them, and behave not like dogs but wolves, would be a foul and monstrous thing in a shepherd. Truly monstrous, he said. And therefore every care must be taken that our auxiliaries, being stronger than our citizens, may not grow to be too much for them and become savage tyrants instead of friends and allies. Yes, great care should be taken. And would not a really good education furnish the best safeguard? But they are well educated already, he replied. I cannot be so confident, my dear Glaucon, I said. I am much more certain that they ought to be, and that true education, whatever that may be, will have the greatest tendency to civilize and humanize them in their relations to one another, and to those who are under their protection. Very true, he replied. And not only their education, but their habitations, and all that belongs to them, should be such as will neither impair their virtue as guardians, nor tempt them to prey upon the other citizens. Any man of sense must acknowledge that. He must. Then now let us consider what will be their way of life, if they are to realize our idea of them. In the first place, none of them should have any property of his own beyond what is absolutely necessary. Neither should they have a private house or store closed against any one who has a mind to enter. Their provisions should be only such as are required by trained warriors, who are men of temperance and courage. They should agree to receive from the citizens a fixed rate of pay, enough to meet the expenses of the year, and no more. And they will go to mess and live together like soldiers in a camp. Gold and silver we will tell them that they have from God. The diviner metal is within them, and they have therefore no need of the dross which is current among men, and ought not to pollute the divine by any such earthly admixture. For that commoner metal has been the source of many unholy deeds, but their own is undefiled and they alone of the citizens may not touch or handle silver or gold, or be under the same roof with them, or wear them, or drink from them. And this will be their salvation, and they will be the saviors of the state. 
but should they ever acquire homes or lands or monies of their own, they will become housekeepers and husbandmen instead of guardians, enemies and tyrants instead of allies of the other citizens. Hating and being hated, plotting and being plotted against, they will pass their whole life in much greater terror of internal than of external enemies, and the hour of ruin, both to themselves and to the rest of the state, will be at hand. For all which reasons may we not say that thus shall our state be ordered, and that these shall be the regulations appointed by us for guardians concerning their houses, and all other matters? Yes, said Glaucon. End of Book 3 Recording by Jim Allman, Houston, Texas Book 4, Part 1 of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by B. G. Oxford. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Joet. Book 4, Part 1. Here, Ademantus interposed a question. How would you answer, Socrates, said he, if a person were to say that you are making these people miserable, and that they are the cause of their own unhappiness? The city, in fact, belongs to them, but they are none the better for it. Whereas other men acquire lands, and build large and handsome houses, and have everything handsome about them, offering sacrifices to the gods on their own account, and practicing hospitality. Moreover, as you were saying just now, they have gold and silver, and all that is usual among the favorites of fortune. But our poor citizens are no better than mercenaries, who are quartered in the city, and are always mounting guard. Yes, I said, and you may add that they are only fed and not paid in addition to their food, like other men, and therefore they cannot, if they would, take a journey of pleasure. They have no money to spend on a mistress, or any other luxurious fancy, which, as the world goes, is thought to be happiness, and many other accusations of the same nature might be added. But, he said, let us suppose all this to be included in the charge. You mean to ask, I said, what will be our answer? Yes. If we proceed along the old path, my belief, I said, is that we shall find the answer, and our answer will be that, even as they are, our guardians may very likely be the happiest of men, but that our aim in founding the state was not the disproportionate happiness of any one class, but the greatest happiness of the whole. We thought that in a state which is ordered with a view to the good of the whole, we should be most likely to find justice, and in the ill-ordered state, injustice. And, having found them, we might then decide which of the two is the happier. At present, I take it, we are fashioning the happy state, not piecemeal or with a view of making a few happy citizens, but as a whole. And by and by, we will proceed to view the opposite kind of state. Suppose that we are painting a statue, and someone came up to us and said, Why do you not put the most beautiful colors on the most beautiful parts of the body? The eyes ought to be purple, but you have made them black. To him we might fairly answer, Sir, you would not surely have us beautify the eyes to such a degree that they are no longer eyes? Consider rather whether by giving this and the other features their due proportion we make the whole beautiful. And so, I say to you, do not compel us to assign to the guardians a sort of happiness which will make them anything but guardians. For we too can clothe our husbandmen in royal apparel, and set crowns of gold on their heads, and bid them till the ground as much as they like, and no more. Our potters also might be allowed to repose on couches, and feast by the fireside, passing round the wine cup while their wheel is conveniently at hand, and working at pottery only as much as they like. In this way we might make every class happy, and then, as you imagine, the whole state would be happy. But do not put this idea into our heads, 
For if we listen to you, the husbandman will be no longer a husbandman. The potter will cease to be a potter, and no one will have the character of any distinct class in the state. Now this is not of much consequence, where the corruption of society and pretensions to be what you are not is confined to cobblers. But when the guardians of the laws and of the government are only seeming and not real guardians, then see how they turn the state upside down. And on the other hand, they alone have the power of giving order and happiness to the state. We mean our guardians to be true saviors and not the destroyers of the state, whereas our opponent is thinking of peasants at a festival who are enjoying a life of revelry, not of citizens who are doing their duty to the state. But if so, we mean different things, and he is speaking of something which is not a state. And therefore, we must consider whether in appointing our guardians we would look to their greatest happiness individually, or whether this principle of happiness does not rather reside in the state as a whole. But if the latter be the truth, then the guardians and auxiliaries, and all others equally with them, must be compelled or induced to do their own work in the best way, and thus the whole state will grow up in a noble order, and the several classes will receive the proportion of happiness which nature assigns to them. I think that you are quite right. I wonder whether you will agree with another remark which occurs to me. What may that be? There seem to be two causes of the deterioration of the arts. What are they? Wealth, I said, and poverty. How do they act? The process is as follows. When a potter becomes rich, will he, think you, any longer take the same pains with his art? Certainly not. He will grow more and more indolent and careless? Very true. And the result will be that he becomes a worse potter? Yes, he greatly deteriorates. But, on the other hand, if he has no money, and cannot provide himself with tools or instruments, he will not work equally well himself, nor will he teach his sons or apprentices to work equally well. Certainly not. Then, under the influence of either poverty or of wealth, workmen and their work are equally liable to degenerate. That is evident. Here, then, is a discovery of new evils, I said, against which the guardians will have to watch, or they will creep into the city unobserved. What evils? Wealth, I said, and poverty. The one is the parent of luxury and indolence, and the other of meanness and viciousness, and both of discontent. That is very true, he replied. But still I should like to know, Socrates, how our city will be able to go to war, especially against an enemy who is rich and powerful, if deprived of the sinews of war. There would certainly be a difficulty, I replied, in going to war with one such enemy. But there is no difficulty where there are two of them, how so? he asked. In the first place, I said, if we have to fight, our side will be trained warriors fighting against an army of rich men. That is true, he said. And do you not suppose, Ademantus, that a single boxer who is perfect in his art would easily be a match for two stout and well-to-do gentlemen who were not boxers? Hardly, if they came upon him at once. What now? I said, if he were able to run away, and then turn and strike at the one who first came up, and supposing he were to do this several times under the heat of a scorching sun, might he not, being an expert, overturn more than one stout personage? Certainly, he said, there would be nothing wonderful in that. And yet rich men probably have a greater superiority in the science and practice of boxing than they have in military qualities. Likely enough. Then we may assume that our athletes will be able to fight with two or three times their own number? I agree with you, for I think you are right. And supposing that, before engaging, our citizens send an embassy to one of the two cities telling them what is the truth, 
silver and gold we neither have nor are permitted to have but you may do you therefore come and help us in war and take the spoils of the other city who on hearing these words would choose to fight against lean wiry dogs rather than with the dogs on their side against the fat and tender sheep that is not likely and yet there might be a danger to the poor state if the wealth of many states were to be gathered into one but how simple of you to use the term state at all of any but our own why so you ought to speak of other states in the plural number not one of them is a city but many cities as they say in the game for indeed any city however small is in fact divided into two one the city of the poor the other of the rich these are at war with one another and in either there are many smaller divisions and you would be altogether beside the mark if you treated them all as a single state but if you deal with them as many and give the wealth or power or persons of the one to the others you will always have a great many friends and not many enemies and your state while the wise order which has now been prescribed continues to prevail in her will be the greatest of states i do not mean to say in reputation or appearance but in deed and truth though she number not more than a thousand defenders a single state which is her equal you will hardly find either among hellens or barbarians though many that appear to be as great and many times greater that is most true he said and what i said will be the best limit for our rulers to fix when they are considering the size of the state and the amount of territory which they are to include and beyond which they will not go what limit would you propose i would allow the state to increase so far as is consistent with unity that i think is the proper limit very good he said here then i said is another order which will have to be conveyed to our guardians let our city be accounted neither large nor small but one and self-sufficing and surely he said this is not a very severe order which we impose upon them and the other said i of which we are speaking before is lighter still i mean the duty of degrading the offspring of the guardians when inferior and of elevating into the rank of guardians the offspring of the lower classes when naturally superior the intention was that in the case of the citizens generally each individual should be put to the use for which nature intended him one to one work and then every man would do his own business and be one and not many and so the whole city would be one and not many yes he said that is not so difficult the regulations which we are prescribing my good adimantos are not as might be supposed a number of great principles but trifles all if care be taken as the saying is of the one great thing a thing however which i would rather call not great but sufficient for our purpose what may that be he asked education i said and nurture if our citizens are well educated and grow into sensible men they will easily see their way through all these as well as other matters which i omit such for example as marriage the possession of women and the procreation of children which will all follow the general principle that friends have all things in common as the proverb says that will be the best way of settling them also i said the state if once started well moves with accumulating force like a wheel for good nurture and education implant good constitutions and these good constitutions taking root in a good education improve more and more and this improvement affects the breed in man as in other animals very possibly he said then to sum up this is the point to which above all the attention of our rulers should be directed that music and gymnastic be preserved in their original form and no innovation made they must do their utmost to maintain them intact and when any one says that mankind most regard the newest song which the singers have 
they will be afraid that he may be praising not new songs, but a new kind of song, and this ought not to be praised, or conceived to be the meaning of the poet. For any musical innovation is full of danger to the whole state, and ought to be prohibited. So Damon tells me, and I can quite believe him, he says that when modes of music change, the fundamental laws of the state always change with them. Yes, said Ademantus, and you may add my suffrage to Damon's and your own. Then, I said, our guardians must lay the foundations of their fortress in music? Yes, he said, the lawlessness of which you speak too easily steals in. Yes, I replied, in the form of amusement, and at first sight it appears harmless. Why, yes, he said, and there is no harm, were it not that little by little this spirit of license, finding a home, imperceptibly penetrates into manners and customs, whence, issuing with greater force, it invades contracts between man and man, and from contracts goes on to laws and constitutions in utter recklessness, ending at last, Socrates, by an overthrow of all rights, private as well as public. Is that true? I said. That is my belief, he replied. Then, as I was saying, our youth should be trained from the first in a stricter system, for if amusements become lawless, and the youths themselves become lawless, they can never grow up into well-conducted and virtuous citizens. Very true, he said. And when they have made a good beginning in play, and by the help of music have gained the habit of good order, then this habit of order, in a manner, how unlike the lawless play of the others, will accompany them in all their actions, and be a principle of growth to them, and if there be any fallen places in the state, will raise them up again. Very true, he said. Thus educated, they will invent for themselves any lesser rules which their predecessors have altogether neglected. What do you mean? I mean such things as these, when the young are to be silent before their elders, how they are to show respect to them by standing and making them sit, what honor is due to parents, what garments or shoes are to be worn, the mode of dressing, the hair, deportment, and manners in general. You would agree with me? Yes. But there is, I think, small wisdom in legislating about such matters. I doubt if it is ever done, nor are any precise written enactments about them likely to be lasting. Impossible. It would seem, Ademantis, that the direction in which education starts a man will determine his future life. Does not like always attract like? To be sure until some one rare and grand result is reached, which may be good, and may be the reverse of good? That is not to be denied. And for this reason, I said, I shall not attempt to legislate further about them. Naturally enough, he replied. End of Book 4, Part 1 Recording by B. G. Oxford, December 2008「Four, Part Two of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by B. G. Oxford. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Four, Part Two. Well, and about the business of the Agora and the ordinary dealings between man and man, or again about agreements with artisans, about insult and injury, or the commencement of actions, and the appointment of juries, what would you say? There may also arise questions about any impositions, and exactions of market and harbor dues which may be required, and in general about the regulations of markets, police, harbors, and the like. But, oh heavens, Shall we condescend to legislate on any of these particulars? I think, he said, that there is no need to impose laws about them on good men. What regulations are necessary, they will find out soon enough for themselves. Yes, I said, my friend, 
if god will only preserve to them the laws which we have given them and without divine help said ademantus they will go on for ever making and mending their laws and their lives in the hope of attaining perfection you would compare them i said to those invalids who having no self-restraint will not leave off their habits of intemperance exactly yes i said and what a delightful life they lead they are always doctoring and increasing and complicating their disorders and always fancying that they will be cured by any nostrum which anybody advises them to try such cases are very common he said with invalids of this sort yes i replied and the charming thing is that they deem him their worst enemy who tells them the truth which is simply that unless they give up eating and drinking and wenching and idling neither drug nor cautery nor spell nor amulet nor any other remedy will avail charming he replied i see nothing charming in going into a passion with a man who tells you what is right these gentlemen i said do not seem to be in your good graces assuredly not nor would you praise the behavior of states which act like the men whom i was just now describing for are there not ill-ordered states in which the citizens are forbidden under pain of death to alter the constitution and yet he who most sweetly courts those who live under this regime and indulges them and fawns upon them and is skilful in anticipating and gratifying their humours is held to be a great and good statesman do not these states resemble the persons whom i was describing yes he said the states are as bad as the men and i am very far from praising them but do you not admire i said the coolness and dexterity of these ready ministers of political corruption yes he said i do but not all of them for there are some whom the applause of the multitude has deluded into the belief that they are really statesmen and these are not much to be admired what do you mean i said you should have more feeling for them when a man cannot measure and a great many others who cannot measure declare that he is four cubits high can he help believing what they say nay he said certainly not in that case well then do not be angry with them for are they not as good as a play trying their hand at paltry reforms such as i was describing they are always fancying that by legislation they will make an end of frauds in contracts and other rascalities which i was mentioning not knowing that they are in reality cutting off the heads of a hydra yes he said that is just what they are doing i conceive i said that the true legislator will not trouble himself with this class of enactments whether concerning laws or the constitution either in an ill-ordered or in a well-ordered state for in the former they are quite useless and in the latter there will be no difficulty in devising them and many of them will naturally flow out of our previous regulations what then he said is still remaining to us of the work of legislation nothing to us i replied but to apollo the god of delphi there remains the ordering of the greatest and noblest and chiefest things of all which are they he said the institution of temples and sacrifices and the entire service of gods demigods and heroes also the ordering of the repositories of the dead and the rites which have to be observed by him who would propitiate the inhabitants of the world below these are matters of which we are ignorant ourselves and as founders of a city we should be unwise in trusting them to any interpreter but our ancestral deity he is the god who sits in the centre on the navel of the earth and he is the interpreter of religion to all mankind you are right and we will do as you propose but where amid all this is justice son of ariston tell me where now that our city has been made habitable light a candle and search and get your brother and polymarchus and the rest of our friends to help and let us see where in it we can discover justice and where injustice and in what they differ from one another and which of them the man who would be happy should have for his portion whether seen or unseen, by gods and men. Nonsense, said Glaucon. 
did you not promise to search yourself saying that for you not to help justice in her need would be an impiety i do not deny that i said so and as you remind me i will be as good as my word but you must join we will he replied well then i hope to make the discovery in this way i mean to begin with the assumption that our state if rightly ordered is perfect that is most certain and being perfect is therefore wise and valiant and temperate and just that is likewise clear and whichever of these qualities we find in the state the one which is not found will be the residue very good if there were four things and we were searching for one of them wherever it might be the one sought for might be known to us from the first and there would be no further trouble or we might know the other three first and then the fourth would clearly be the one left very true he said and is not a similar method to be pursued about the virtues which are also four in number clearly first among the virtues found in the state wisdom comes into view and in this i detect a certain peculiarity what is that the state which we have been describing is said to be wise as being good in counsel very true and good counsel is clearly a kind of knowledge for not by ignorance but by knowledge do men counsel well clearly and the kinds of knowledge in a state are many and diverse of course there is the knowledge of the carpenter but is that the sort of knowledge which gives a city the title of wise and good in counsel certainly not that would only give a city the reputation of skill in carpentering then a city is not to be called wise because possessing a knowledge which counsels for the best about wooden implements certainly not nor by reason of a knowledge which advises about brazen pots i said nor as possessing any other similar knowledge not by reason of any of them he said nor yet by reason of a knowledge which cultivates the earth that would give the city the name of agricultural yes well i said and is there any knowledge in our recently founded state among any of the citizens which advises not about any particular thing in the state but about the whole and considers how a state can best deal with itself and with other states there certainly is and what is this knowledge and among whom is it found i asked it is the knowledge of the guardians he replied and is found among those whom we were just now describing as perfect guardians and what is the name which the city derives from the possession of this sort of knowledge the name of good in counsel and truly wise and will there be in our city more of these true guardians or more smiths the smiths he replied will be far more numerous will not the guardians be the smallest of all the classes who receive a name from the profession of some kind of knowledge much the smallest and so by reason of the smallest part or class and of the knowledge which resides in this presiding and ruling part of itself the whole state being thus constituted according to nature will be wise and this which has the only knowledge worthy to be called wisdom has been ordained by nature to be of all classes the least most true thus then i said the nature and place in the state of one of the four virtues has somehow or other been discovered and in my humble opinion very satisfactorily discovered he replied again i said there is no difficulty in seeing the nature of courage and in what part that quality resides which gives the name of courageous to the state how do you mean why i said every one who calls any state courageous or cowardly will be thinking of the part which fights and goes out to war on the state's behalf no one he replied would ever think of any other the rest of the citizens may be courageous or may be cowardly but their courage or cowardice will not as i conceive 
have the effect of making the city either the one or the other? Certainly not. The city will be courageous in virtue of a portion of herself, which preserves under all circumstances that opinion about the nature of things to be feared and not to be feared, in which our legislator educated them. And this is what you term courage. I should like to hear what you are saying once more, for I do not think that I perfectly understand you. I mean that courage is a kind of salvation. Salvation of what? Of the opinion respecting things to be feared, what they are and of what nature, which the law implants through education, and I mean by the words under all circumstances, to intimate that in pleasure or in pain, or under the influence of desire or fear, a man preserves and does not lose this opinion. Shall I give you an illustration? If you please. You know, I said, that dyers when they want to dye wool for making the true sea purple, begin by selecting their white color first. This they prepare and dress with much care and pains in order that the white ground may take the purple hue in full perfection. The dyeing then proceeds, and whatever is dyed in this manner becomes a fast color, and no washing, either with lies or without them, can take away the bloom. But when the ground has not been duly prepared, you will have noticed how poor is the look either of purple or of any other color. Yes, he said, I know that they have a washed out and ridiculous appearance. Then now, I said, you will understand what our object was in selecting our soldiers and educating them in music and gymnastic. We were contriving influences which would prepare them to take the dye of the laws in perfection and the color of their opinion about dangers and of every other opinion was to be indelibly fixed by their nurture and training not to be washed away by such potent lies as pleasure mightier agent far in washing the soul than any soda or lie or by sorrow fear and desire the mightiest of all other solvents and this sort of universal saving power of true opinion in conformity with law about real and false dangers I call and maintain to be courage, unless you disagree. But I agree, he replied, for I suppose that you mean to exclude mere uninstructed courage, such as that of a wild beast or of a slave. This, in your opinion, is not the courage which the law ordains, and ought to have another name. Most certainly then may i infer courage to be such as you describe why yes i said you may and if you add the words of a citizen you will not be far wrong hereafter if you like we will carry the examination further but at present we are seeking not for courage but justice and for the purpose of our inquiry we have said enough you are right he replied two virtues remain to be discovered in the state First, temperance, and then justice, which is the end of our search. Very true. Now, can we find justice without troubling ourselves about temperance? I do not know how that can be accomplished, he said, nor do I desire that justice should be brought to light and temperance lost sight of, and therefore I wish that you would do me the favor of considering temperance first. Certainly, I replied. I should not be justified in refusing your request. Then consider, he said. Yes, I replied, I will. And as far as I can at present see, the virtue of temperance has more of the nature of harmony and symphony than the preceding. How so, he asked. Temperance, I replied, is the ordering or controlling of certain pleasures and desires. This is curiously enough implied in the saying of a man being his own master, and other traces of the same notion may be found in language. No doubt, he said. There is something ridiculous in the expression master of himself, for the master is also the servant, and the servant the master, and in all these modes of speaking the same person is denoted. Certainly. The meaning is, I believe, that in the human soul 
there is a better and also a worse principle and when the better has the worse under control then a man is said to be master of himself and this is a term of praise but when owing to evil education or association the better principle which is also the smaller is overwhelmed by the greater mass of the worse in this case he is blamed and is called the slave of self and unprincipled yes there is reason in that and now i said look at our newly created state and there you will find one of these two conditions realized for the state as you will acknowledge may be justly called master of itself if the words temperance and self-mastery truly express the rule of the better part over the worse yes he said i see that what you say is true let me further note that the manifold and complex pleasures and desires and pains are generally found in children and women and servants and in the free men so called who are of the lowest and more numerous class certainly he said whereas the simple and moderate desires which follow reason and are under the guidance of mind and true opinion are to be found only in a few and those the best born and best educated very true these two as you may perceive have a place in our state and the meaner desires of the many are held down by the virtuous desires and wisdom of the few that i perceive he said then if there be any city which may be described as master of its own pleasures and desires and master of itself ours may claim such a designation certainly he replied it may also be called temperate and for the same reason yes and if there be any state in which rulers and subjects will be agreed as to the question who are to rule that again will be our state undoubtedly and the citizens being thus agreed among themselves in which class will temperance be found in the rulers or in the subjects in both as i should imagine he replied do you observe that we are not far wrong in our guess that temperance was a sort of harmony why so why because temperance is unlike courage and wisdom each of which resides in a part only the one making the state wise and the other valiant not so temperance which extends to the whole and runs through all the notes of the scale and produces a harmony of the weaker and the stronger and the middle class whether you suppose them to be stronger or weaker in wisdom or power or numbers or wealth or anything else most truly then may we deem temperance to be the agreement of the naturally superior and inferior as to the right to rule of either both in states and individuals i entirely agree with you and so i said we may consider three out of the four virtues to have been discovered in our state the last of those qualities which make a state virtuous must be justice if we only knew what that was the inference is obvious end of book four Part 2. Recording by B.G. Oxford. December 2008. Book 4. Part 3. Of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by B. G. Oxford. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 4, Part 3. The time then has arrived, Glaucon, when, like huntsmen, we should surround the cover and look sharp that justice does not steal away and pass out of sight and escape us. For beyond a doubt, she is somewhere in this country. Watch, therefore, and strive to catch a sight of her, and if you see her first, let me know. Would that I could, but you should regard me rather as a follower, who has just eyes enough to see what you show him. That is about as much as I am good for. Offer up a prayer with me, and follow. I will, but you must show me the way. 
there is no path i said and the wood is dark and perplexing still we must push on let us push on here i saw something hallo i said i began to perceive a track and i believe that the quarry will not escape good news he said truly i said we are stupid fellows why so why my good sir at the beginning of our inquiry ages ago there was justice tumbling out at our feet and we never saw her nothing could be more ridiculous like people who go about looking for what they have in their hands that was the way with us we looked not at what we were seeking but at what was far off in the distance and therefore i suppose we missed her what do you mean i mean to say that in reality for a long time past we have been talking of justice and have failed to recognize her i grow impatient at the length of your exordium well then tell me i said whether i am right or not you remember the original principle which we were always laying down at the foundation of the state that one man should practice one thing only the thing to which his nature was best adapted now justice is this principle or part of it yes we often said that one man should do one thing only further we affirmed that justice was doing one's own business and not being a busybody we said so again and again and many others have said the same to us yes we said so then to do one's own business in a certain way may be assumed to be justice can you tell me whence i derive this inference i cannot but i should like to be told because i think that this is the only virtue which remains in the state when the other virtues of temperance and courage and wisdom are abstracted and that this is the ultimate cause and condition of the existence of all of them and while remaining in them is also their preservative and we were saying that if the three were discovered by us justice would be the fourth or remaining one that follows of necessity if we are asked to determine which of these four qualities by its presence contributes most to the excellence of the state whether the agreement of rulers and subjects or the preservation in the soldiers of the opinion which the law ordains about the true nature of dangers or wisdom and watchfulness in the rulers or whether this other which i am mentioning and which is found in children and women slave and freeman artisan ruler subject the quality i mean of every one doing his own work and not being a busybody would claim the palm the question is not so easily answered certainly he replied there would be a difficulty in saying which then the power of each individual in the state to do his own work appears to compete with the other political virtues wisdom temperance courage yes he said and the virtue which enters into this competition is justice exactly let us look at the question from another point of view are not the rulers in a state those to whom you would entrust the office of determining suits at law certainly and are suits decided on any other ground but that a man may neither take what is another's nor be deprived of what is his own yes that is their principle which is a just principle yes then on this view also justice will be admitted to be the having and doing what is a man's own and belongs to him very true think now and say whether you agree with me or not suppose a carpenter to be doing the business of a cobbler or a cobbler of a carpenter and suppose them to exchange their implements or their duties or the same person to be doing the work of both or whatever be the change do you think that any great harm would result to the state not much but when the cobbler or any other man whom nature designed to be a trader having his heart lifted up by wealth or strength or the number of his followers or any like advantage attempts to force his way into the class of warriors or a warrior into that of legislators 
and guardians, for which he is unfitted, and either to take the implements or the duties of the other, or when one man is traitor, legislator, and warrior, all in one, then I think you will agree with me in saying that this interchange and this meddling of one with another is the ruin of the state. Most true. Seeing then, I said, that there are three distinct classes, any meddling of one with the other, or the change of one to another, is the greatest harm to the state, and may be most justly termed evil-doing? Precisely. And the greatest degree of evil-doing to one's own city would be termed by you injustice? Certainly. This, then, is injustice. And on the other hand, when the trader, the auxiliary, and the guardian each do their own business, that is justice, and will make the city just. I agree with you. We will not, I said, be over-positive as yet. But if on trial this conception of justice be verified in the individual, as well as in the state, there will be no longer any room for doubt. If it be not verified, we must have a fresh inquiry. First, let us complete the old investigation, which we began, as you remember, under the impression that if we could previously examine justice on the larger scale, there would be less difficulty in discerning her in the individual. That larger example appeared to be the state, and accordingly we constructed as good a one as we could, knowing well that in the good state justice would be found. Let the discovery which we made be now applied to the individual. If they agree, we shall be satisfied." or if there be a difference in the individual, we will come back to the state and have another trial of the theory. The friction of the two, when rubbed together, may possibly strike a light in which justice will shine forth, and the vision which is then revealed we will fix in our souls. That will be in regular course. Let us do as you say. I proceeded to ask, When two things, a greater and less, are called by the same name, are they like or unlike, in so far as they are called the same? Like, he replied. The just man, then, if we regard the idea of justice only, will be like the just state? He will. And the state was thought by us to be just when the three classes in the state severally did their own business, and also thought to be temperate, and valiant and wise by reason of certain other affections and qualities of these same classes? True, he said. And so, of the individual, we may assume that he has the same three principles in his own soul, which are found in the state, and he may be rightly described in the same terms, because he is affected in the same manner? Certainly, he said. Once more, then, O oh my friend, we have alighted upon an easy question, whether the soul has these three principles or not. An easy question? Nay, rather, Socrates, the proverb holds that hard is the good. Very true, I said, and I do not think that the method which we are employing is at all adequate to the accurate solution of this question. The true method is another and a longer one. Still we may arrive at a solution not below the level of the previous inquiry. May we not be satisfied with that, he said. Under the circumstance, I am quite content. I too, I replied, shall be extremely well satisfied. Then faint not in pursuing the speculation, he said. Must we not acknowledge, I said, that in each of us there are the same principles and habits which there are in the state? and that from the individual they pass into the state? How else can they come there? Take the quality of passion or spirit. It would be ridiculous to imagine that this quality, when found in states, is not derived from the individuals who are supposed to possess it. For example, the Thracians, Scythians, and in general the northern nations. And the same may be said of the love of knowledge, which is the special characteristic of our part of the world, or of the love of money, which may with equal truth be attributed to the Phoenicians and Egyptians. Exactly so, he said. There is no difficulty in understanding this. None whatever. 
but the question is not quite so easy when we proceed to ask whether these principles are three or one whether that is to say we learn with one part of our nature are angry with another and with a third part desire the satisfaction of our natural appetites or whether the whole soul comes into play in each sort of action to determine that is the difficulty yes he said there lies the difficulty then let us now try and determine whether they are the same or different how can we he asked i replied as follows the same thing clearly cannot act or be acted upon in the same part or in relation to the same thing at the same time in contrary ways and therefore whenever this contradiction occurs in things apparently the same we know that they are really not the same but different good for example i said can the same thing be at rest and in motion at the same time in the same part impossible still i said let us have a more precise statement of terms lest we should hereafter fall out by the way imagine the case of a man who is standing and also moving his hands and his head and suppose a person to say that one and the same person is in motion and at rest at the same moment to such a mode of speech we should object and should rather say that one part of him is in motion while another is at rest very true and suppose the objector to refine still further and to draw the nice distinction that not only parts of tops but whole tops when they spin around with their pegs fixed on the spot are at rest and in motion at the same time and he may say the same of anything which revolves in the same spot his objection would not be admitted by us because in such cases things are not at rest and in motion in the same parts of themselves we should rather say that they have both an axis and a circumference and that the axis stands still for there is no deviation from the perpendicular and that the circumference goes round but if while revolving the axis inclines either to the right or left forwards or backwards then in no point of view can they be at rest that is the correct mode of describing them he replied then none of these objections will confuse us or incline us to believe that the same thing at the same time in the same part or in relation to the same thing can act or be acted upon in contrary ways certainly not according to my way of thinking yet i said that we may not be compelled to examine all such objections and prove at length that they are untrue let us assume their absurdity and go forward on the understanding that hereafter if this assumption turn out to be untrue all the consequences which follow shall be withdrawn yes he said that will be the best way well i said would you not allow that assent and dissent desire and aversion attraction and repulsion are all of them opposites whether they are regarded as active or passive for that makes no difference in the fact of their opposition yes he said they are opposites well i said and hunger and thirst and the desires in general and again willing and wishing all these you would refer to the classes already mentioned you would say would you not that the soul of him who desires is seeking after the object of his desire or that he is drawing to himself the thing which he wishes to possess or again when a person wants anything to be given him his mind longing for the realization of his desire intimates his wish to have it by a nod of assent as if he had been asked a question very true and what would you say of unwillingness and dislike and the absence of desire should not these be referred to the opposite class of repulsion and rejection certainly admitting this to be true of desire generally let us suppose a particular class of desires and out of these we will select hunger and thirst as they are termed which are the most obvious of them let us take that class he said 
The object of one is food, and of the other drink? Yes. And here comes the point. Is not thirst the desire which the soul has of drink, and of drink only, not of drink qualified by anything else? For example, warm or cold, or much or little, or, in a word, drink of any particular sort? But if the thirst be accompanied by heat, then the desire is of cold drink, or, if accompanied by cold, then of warm drink, or, if the thirst be excessive, then the drink, which is desired, will be excessive, or, if not great, the quantity of drink will also be small. But thirst pure and simple will desire drink pure and simple, which is the natural satisfaction of thirst, as food is of hunger? Yes, he said. The simple desire is, as you say, in every case of the simple object, and the qualified desire of the qualified object. But here a confusion may arise, and I should wish to guard against an opponent starting up and saying that no man desires drink only, but good drink, or food only, but good food. For good is the universal object of desire, and thirst being a desire will necessarily be thirst after good drink and the same is true of every other desire. Yes, he replied, the opponent might have something to say. Nevertheless, I should still maintain that of relatives some have a quality attached to either term of the relation. Others are simple, and have their correlatives simple. I do not know what you mean. Well, you know, of course, that the greater is relative to the less? Certainly. And the much greater to the much less? Yes, and the sometime greater to the sometime less, and the greater that is to be to the less that is to be? Certainly, he said, and so of more and less, and of other correlative terms, such as the double and the half, or again the heavier and the lighter, the swifter and the slower, and of hot and cold, and of any other relatives, is not this true of them all? Yes. And does not the same principle hold in the sciences? The object of science is knowledge, assuming that to be the true definition. But the object of a particular science is a particular kind of knowledge. I mean, for example, that the science of house-building is a kind of knowledge, which is defined and distinguished from other kinds, and is therefore termed architecture. Certainly because it has a particular quality which no other has yes and it has this particular quality because it has an object of a particular kind and this is true of the other arts and sciences yes end of book four part three recorded by b g oxford book four Part 4 of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by B.G. Oxford. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 4, Part 4. Now then, if I have made myself clear, you will understand my original meaning in what I said about relatives. My meaning was that if one term of a relation is taken alone, the other is taken alone. If one term is qualified, the other is also qualified. I do not mean to say that relatives may not be disparate, or that the science of health is healthy, or of disease necessarily diseased, or that the sciences of good and evil are therefore good and evil, but only that when the term science is no longer used absolutely, but has a qualified object, which in this case is the nature of health and disease, it becomes defined, and is hence called not merely science, but the science of medicine. I quite understand, and I think as you do. Would you not say that thirst is one of these essentially relative terms, having clearly a relation? Yes, thirst is relative to drink. And a certain kind of thirst is relative to a certain kind of drink. But thirst taken alone 
is neither of much nor little nor of good nor bad nor of any particular kind of drink but of drink only certainly then the soul of the thirsty one in so far as he is thirsty desires only drink for this he yearns and tries to obtain it that is plain and if you suppose something which pulls a thirsty soul away from drink that must be different from the thirsty principle which draws him like a beast to drink for as we were saying the same thing cannot at the same time with the same part of itself act in contrary ways about the same impossible no more than you can say that the hands of the archer push and pull the bow at the same time but what you say is that one hand pushes and the other pulls exactly so he replied and might a man be thirsty and yet unwilling to drink yes he said it constantly happens and in such a case what is one to say would you not say that there was something in the soul bidding a man to drink and something else forbidding him which is other and stronger than the principle which bids him i should say so and the forbidding principle is derived from reason and that which bids and attracts proceeds from passion and disease clearly then we may fairly assume that they are two and that they differ from one another the one with which a man reasons we may call the rational principle of the soul the other with which he loves and hungers and thirsts and feels the flutterings of any other desire may be termed the irrational or appetitive the ally of sundry pleasures and satisfactions yes he said we may fairly assume them to be different then let us finally determine that there are two principles existing in the soul and what of passion or spirit is it a third or akin to one of the preceding i should be inclined to say akin to desire well i said there is a story which i remember to have heard and in which i put faith the story is that leontios the son of aglion coming up one day from the piraeus under the north wall on the outside observed some dead bodies lying on the ground at the place of execution he felt a desire to see them and also a dread and abhorrence of them for a time he struggled and covered his eyes but at length the desire got the better of him and forcing them open he ran up to the dead bodies saying look ye wretches take your fill of the fair sight i have heard the story myself he said the moral of the tale is that anger at times goes to war with desire as though they were two distinct things yes that is the meaning he said and are there not many other cases in which we observe that when a man's desires violently prevail over his reason he reviles himself and is angry at the violence within him and that in this struggle which is like the struggle of factions in a state his spirit is on the side of his reason but for the passionate or spirited element to take part with the desires when reason decides that she should not be opposed is a sort of thing which i believe that you never observed occurring in yourself nor as i should imagine in any one else certainly not suppose that a man thinks he has done wrong to another the nobler he is the less able he is to feel indignant at any suffering such as hunger or cold or any other pain which the injured person may inflict upon him these he deems to be just and as i say his anger refuses to be excited by them true he said but when he thinks that he is the sufferer of the wrong then he boils and chafes and is on the side of what he believes to be justice and because he suffers hunger or cold or other pain he is only the more determined to persevere and conquer his noble spirit will not be quelled until he either slays or is slain or until he hears the voice of the shepherd that is reason bidding his dog bark no more the illustration is perfect he replied and in our state as we were saying the auxiliaries were to be dogs and to hear the voice of the rulers who are their shepherds i perceive i said that you quite understand me there is however a further point 
which I wish you to consider. What point? You remember that passion or spirit appeared at first sight to be a kind of desire. But now we should say quite the contrary, for in the conflict of the soul, spirit is arrayed on the side of the rational principle. Most assuredly. But a further question arises. Is passion different from reason also, or only a kind of reason, in which latter case, instead of three principles in the soul, there will only be two, the rational and the concupiscent, or rather, as the state was composed of three classes, traitors, auxiliaries, counsellors, so may there not be in the individual soul a third element, which is passion or spirit, and, when not corrupted by bad education, is the natural auxiliary of reason? Yes, he said, there must be a third. Yes, I replied if passion which has already been shown to be different from desire turn out also to be different from reason but that is easily proved we may observe even in young children that they are full of spirit almost as soon as they are born whereas some of them never seem to attain the use of reason and most of them late enough excellent i said and you may see passion equally in brute animals which is a further proof of the truth of what you are saying and we may once more appeal to the words of Homer, which have been already quoted by us. He smote his breast, and thus rebuked his soul. For in this verse, Homer has clearly supposed the power which reasons about the better and worse to be different from the unreasoning anger which is rebuked by it. Very true, he said. And so, after much tossing, we have reached land, and are fairly agreed that the same principles which exist in the state exist also in the individual, and that they are three in number. Exactly. Must we not then infer that the individual is wise in the same way, and in virtue of the same quality which makes the state wise? Certainly. Also, that the same quality which constitutes courage in the state constitutes courage in the individual and that both the state and the individual bear the same relation to all the other virtues assuredly and the individual will be acknowledged by us to be just in the same way in which the state is just that follows of course we cannot but remember that the justice of the state consisted in each of the three classes doing the work of its own class we are not very likely to have forgotten, he said. We must recollect that the individual in whom the several qualities of his nature do their own work will be just and will do his own work. Yes, he said, we must remember that too. And ought not the rational principle, which is wise and has the care of the whole soul, to rule and the passionate or spirited principle to be the subject and ally? Certainly and as we were saying the united influence of music and gymnastic will bring them into accord nerving and sustaining the reason with noble words and lessons and moderating and soothing and civilizing the wildness of passion by harmony and rhythm quite true he said and these two thus nurtured and educated and having learned truly to know their own functions will rule over the concupiscent which in each of us is the largest part of the soul and by nature most insatiable of gain over this they will keep guard lest waxing great and strong with the fullness of bodily pleasures as they are termed the concupiscent soul no longer confined to her own sphere should attempt to enslave and rule those who are not her natural-born subjects and overturn the whole life of man very true he said both together will they not be the best defenders of the whole soul and the whole body against attacks from without the one counselling and the other fighting under his leader and courageously executing his commands and counsels true and he is to be deemed courageous whose spirit retains in pleasure and in pain the commands of reason about what he ought or ought not to fear right he replied and him we call wise who has in him that little part which rules and which proclaims these commands 
that part too being supposed to have a knowledge of what is for the interest of each of the three parts and of the whole assuredly and would you not say that he is temperate who has these same elements in friendly harmony in whom the one ruling principle of reason and the two subject ones of spirit and desire are equally agreed that reason ought to rule and do not rebel certainly he said that is the true account of temperance whether in the state or the individual and surely i said we have explained again and again how and by virtue of what quality a man will be just that is very certain and is justice dimmer in the individual and is her form different or is she the same which we found her to be in the state there is no difference in my opinion he said because if any doubt is still lingering in our minds a few commonplace instances will satisfy us of the truth of what i am saying what sort of instances do you mean if the case is put to us must we not admit that the just state or the man who is trained in the principles of such a state will be less likely than the unjust to make away with a deposit of gold or silver would any one deny this no one he replied will the just man or citizen ever be guilty of sacrilege or theft or treachery either to his friends or to his country never neither will he ever break faith where there have been oaths or agreements impossible no one will be less likely to commit adultery or to dishonor his father and mother or to fail in his religious duties no one and the reason is that each part of him is doing its own business whether in ruling or being ruled exactly so are you satisfied then that the quality which makes such men and such states is justice or do you hope to discover some other not i indeed then our dream has been realized and the suspicion which we entertained at the beginning of our work of construction that some divine power must have conducted us to a primary form of justice has now been verified yes certainly and the division of labor which required the carpenter and the shoemaker and the rest of the citizens to be doing each his own business and not another's was a shadow of justice and for that reason it was of use clearly but in reality justice was such as we were describing being concerned however not with the outward man but with the inward which is the true self and concernment of man for the just man does not permit the several elements within him to interfere with one another or any of them to do the work of others he sets in order his own inner life and is his own master and his own law and at peace with himself and when he has bound together the three principles within him which may be compared to the higher lower and middle notes of the scale and the intermediate intervals when he has bound all these together and is no longer many but has become one entirely temperate and perfectly adjusted nature then he proceeds to act if he has to act whether in a matter of property or in the treatment of the body or in some affair of politics or private business always thinking and calling that which preserves and cooperates with this harmonious condition just and good action and the knowledge which presides over it wisdom and that which at any time impairs this condition he will call unjust action and the opinion which presides over it ignorance you have said the exact truth socrates very good and if we were to affirm that we had discovered the just man and the just state and the nature of justice in each of them we should not be telling a falsehood most certainly not may we say so then let us say so and now i said injustice has to be considered clearly must not injustice be a strife which arises among the three principles a meddlesomeness and interference and rising up of a part of the soul against the whole an assertion of unlawful authority which is made by a rebellious subject against a true prince of whom he is the natural vassal 
what is all this confusion and delusion but injustice and intemperance and cowardice and ignorance and every form of vice exactly so and if the nature of justice and injustice be known then the meaning of acting unjustly and being unjust or again of acting justly will also be perfectly clear what do you mean he said why i said they are like disease and health being in the soul just what disease and health are in the body how so he said why i said that which is healthy causes health and that which is unhealthy causes disease yes and just actions cause justice and unjust actions cause injustice that is certain and the creation of health is the institution of a natural order and government of one by another in the parts of the body and the creation of disease is the production of a state of things at variance with this natural order true and is not the creation of justice the institution of a natural order and government of one by another in the parts of the soul and the creation of injustice the production of a state of things at variance with the natural order exactly so he said then virtue is the health and beauty and well-being of the soul and vice the disease and weakness and deformity of the same true and do not good practices lead to virtue and evil practices to vice assuredly still our old question of the comparative advantage of justice and injustice has not been answered which is the more profitable to be just and act justly and practice virtue whether seen or unseen of gods and men or to be unjust and act unjustly if only unpunished and unreformed in my judgment socrates the question has now become ridiculous we know that when the bodily constitution is gone life is no longer endurable though pampered with all kinds of meats and drinks and having all wealth and power and shall we be told that when the very essence of the vital principle is undermined and corrupted life is still worth having to a man if only he be allowed to do whatever he likes with the single exception that he is not to acquire justice and virtue or to escape from injustice and vice assuming them both to be such as we have described yes i said the question is as you say ridiculous still as we are near the spot at which we may see the truth in the clearest manner with our own eyes let us not faint by the way certainly not he replied come up hither i said and behold the various forms of vice those of them i mean which are worth looking at i am following you he replied proceed i said the argument seems to have reached a height from which as from some tower of speculation a man may look down and see that virtue is one but that the forms of vice are innumerable there being four special ones which are deserving of note what do you mean he said i mean i replied that there appear to be as many forms of the soul as there are distinct forms of the state how many there are five of the state and five of the soul i said what are they the first i said it is that which we have been describing and which may be said to have two names monarchy and aristocracy accordingly as rule is exercised by one distinguished man or by many true he replied but i regard the two names as describing one form only for whether the government is in the hands of one or many if the governors have been trained in the manner which we have supposed the fundamental laws of the state will be maintained that is true he replied end of book four recording by b g oxford december two thousand eight book five part one of plato's republic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the republic by plato 
Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Part One. Such is the good and true city or state, and the good and true man is of the same pattern. And if this is right, every other is wrong, and the evil is one which affects not only the ordering of the state, but also the regulation of the individual soul, and is exhibited in four forms. What are they? he said. I was proceeding to tell the order in which the four evil forms appeared to me to succeed one another, when Polemarchus, who was sitting a little way off, just beyond Adamantus, began to whisper to him, stretching forth his hand, he took hold of the upper part of his coat by the shoulder, and drew him towards him, leaning forward himself so as to be quite close, and saying something in his ear, of which I only caught the words, "'Shall we let him off, or what shall we do?' "'Certainly not,' said Adamantus, raising his voice. "'Who is it,' I said, "'to whom you are refusing to let off?' "'You,' he said. I repeated, "'Why am I especially not to be let off?' Why, he said, we think that you are lazy, and mean to cheat us out of a whole chapter, which is a very important part of the story, and you fancy that we shall not notice your airy way of proceeding, as if it were self-evident to everybody, that in the matter of women and children, friends have all things in common. And was I not right, Adamantus? Yes, he said, but what is right in this particular case, like everything else, requires to be explained, for community may be of many kinds. Please, therefore, to say what kind of community you mean. We have been long expecting that you would tell us something about the family life of your citizens, how they will bring children into the world, and rear them when they have arrived, and, in general, what is the nature of this community of women and children, for we are of opinion that the right or wrong management of such matters will have a great and paramount influence on the state for good or for evil. And now, since the question is still undetermined, and you are taking in hand another state, we have resolved, as you heard, not to let you go, until you give an account of all this. To that resolution, said Glaucon, you may regard me as saying agreed. And without more ado, said Thrasymachus, you may consider us all to be equally agreed. I said, you know not what you are doing in thus assailing me. What an argument you are raising about the state! Just as I thought that I had finished, and was only too glad that I had laid this question to sleep, and was reflecting how fortunate I was in your acceptance of what I then said, you asked me to begin again at the very foundation, ignorant of what a hornet's nest of words you are stirring. Now I foresaw this gathering trouble, and avoided it. For what purpose do you conceive that we have come here, said Thrasymachus, to look for gold or to hear discourse? Yes, but discourse should have a limit. Yes, Socrates, said Glaucon, and the whole of life is the only limit which wise men assign to the hearing of such discourses. But never mind about us. Take heart yourself, and answer the question in your own way. What sort of community of women and children is this which is to prevail among our guardians? And how shall we manage the period between birth and education, which seems to require the greatest care? Tell us how these things will be. Yes, my simple friend, but the answer is the reverse of easy. Many more doubts arise about this than about our previous conclusions. For the practicability of what is said may be doubted, and looked at in another point of view, whether the scheme, if ever so practicable, would be for the best, is also doubtful. Hence I feel a reluctance to approach the subject, lest our aspiration, my dear friend, should turn out to be a dream only. Fear not, he replied, for your audience will not be hard upon you. They are not sceptical or hostile. I said, My good friend, I suppose that you mean to encourage me by these words. Yes, he said. Then let me tell you that you are doing just the reverse. The encouragement which you offer would have been all very well, had I myself believed that I knew what I was talking about, to declare the truth about matters of high interest which a man honours and loves among wise men, who love him, need occasion no fear or faltering in his mind. But to carry on an argument, when you are yourself only a hesitating inquirer, which is my condition, is a dangerous and slippery thing, and the danger is not that I shall be laughed at, of which the fear would be childish, but that I shall miss the truth where I have most need to be sure of my footing, and drag my friends after me in my fall. And I pray, Nemesis, not to visit upon me the words which I am going to utter, for I do indeed believe that to be an involuntary homicide is less crime than to be a deceiver about beauty or goodness or justice in the matter of laws, 
and that is a risk which I would rather run among enemies than among friends, and therefore you do well to encourage me. Glaucon laughed and said, Well then, Socrates, in case you and your argument do us any serious injury, you shall be acquitted beforehand of the homicide, and shall not be held to be a deceiver. Take courage, then, and speak. Well, I said, the law says that when a man is acquitted he is free from guilt, and what holds at law may hold an argument. Then why should you mind? Well, I replied, I suppose that I must retrace my steps and say what I perhaps ought to have said before in the proper place. The part of the men has been played out, and now, properly enough, comes the turn of the women. Of them I will proceed to speak, and the more readily since I am invited by you. For men born and educated like our citizens, the only way, in my opinion, of arriving at a right conclusion about the possession and use of women and children, is to follow the path on which we originally started, when we said that the men were to be the guardians and the watchdogs of the herd. True. Let us further suppose the birth and education of our women to be subject to similar or nearly similar regulations. Then we shall see whether the result accords with our design. What do you mean? What I mean may be put in the form of a question. I said, Are dogs divided into he's and she's, or do they both share equally in hunting and in keeping watch and in all the other duties of dogs? Or do we entrust the males to the entire and exclusive care of the flocks, while we leave the females at home, under the idea that the bearing and suckling their puppies is labour enough for them? No, he said, they share alike. The only difference between them is that the males are stronger and the females weaker. But can you use different animals for the same purpose, unless they are bred and fed in the same way? You cannot. Then, if women are to have the same duties as men, they must have the same nurture and education. Yes. The education which was assigned to the men was music and gymnastic. Yes. Then women must be taught music and gymnastic, and also the art of war, which they must practice like the men. That is the inference, I suppose. I should rather expect, I said, that several of our proposals, if they are carried out, being unusual, may appear ridiculous. No doubt of it. Yes, and the most ridiculous thing of all will be the sight of women naked in the palestra, exercising with the men, especially when they are no longer young. They will certainly not be a vision of beauty, any more than the enthusiastic old men who, in spite of wrinkles and ugliness, continue to frequent the gymnasia. Yes, indeed, he said, according to present notions the proposal will be thought ridiculous. But then, I said, as we have determined to speak our minds, we must not fear the jests of the wits which will be directed against this sort of innovation, how they will talk of women's attainments both in music and gymnastic, and above all about their wearing armour and riding upon horseback. Very true, he replied. Yet having begun we must go forward to the rough places of the law, at the same time begging of these gentlemen, for once in their life, to be serious. Not long ago, as we shall remind them, the Hellenes were of the opinion, which is still generally received among the barbarians, that the sight of a naked man was ridiculous and improper, and when first the Cretans and then the Lacedaemonians introduced the custom, the wits of that day might equally have ridiculed the innovation. No doubt. But when experience showed that to let all things be uncovered was far better than to cover them up, and the ludicrous effect to the outward eye vanished before the better principle which reason asserted, then the man was perceived to be a fool who directs the shafts of his ridicule at any other sight but that of folly and vice, or seriously inclines to weigh the beautiful by any other standard but that of the good. Very true, he replied. First, then, whether the question is to be put in jest or in earnest, let us come to an understanding about the nature of woman. Is she capable of sharing either wholly or partially in the actions of men, or not at all? And is the art of war one of those arts in which she cannot share? That will be the best way of commencing the inquiry, and will probably lead to the fairest conclusion. That will be much the best way. Shall we take the other side first, and begin by arguing against ourselves? In this manner the adversary's position will not be undefended. Why not? he said. Then let us put a speech into the mouths of our opponents. They will say, Socrates and Glaucon, no adversary need convict you, for you yourselves, at the first foundations of the state, admitted the principle that everybody was to do the one work suited to his own nature. And certainly, if I am not mistaken, such an admission was made by us. And do not the natures of men and women differ very much indeed? 
and we shall reply, of course they do. Then we shall be asked, whether the tasks assigned to men and to women should not be different, and such as are agreeable to their different natures? Certainly they should. But if so, have you not fallen into a serious inconsistency, in saying that men and women, whose natures are so entirely different, ought to perform the same actions? What defence will you make for us, my good sir, against any one who offers these objections? That is not an easy question to answer when asked suddenly, and I shall and do beg of you to draw out the case on our side. These are the objections, Glaucon, and there are many others of a like kind, which I foresaw long ago. They made me afraid and reluctant to take in hand any law about the possession and nurture of women and children. By Zeus, he said, the problem to be solved is anything but easy. Why, yes, I said, but the fact is that when a man is out of his depth, whether he has fallen into a little swimming-bath or into mid-ocean, he has to swim all the same. Very true. And must we not swim and try to reach the shore? We will hope that Arian's dolphin or some other miraculous help may save us? I suppose so, he said. Well, then, let us see if any way of escape can be found. We acknowledge, did we not, that different natures ought to have different pursuits, and that men's and women's natures are different. And now what are we saying? that different natures ought to have the same pursuits. This is the inconsistency which is charged upon us. Precisely. Verily, Glaucon, I said, glorious is the power of the art of contradiction. Why do you say so? Because I think that many a man falls into the practice against his will. When he thinks that he is reasoning, he is really disputing, just because he cannot define and divide, and so know that of which he is speaking, and he will pursue a merely verbal opposition in the spirit of contention, and not a fair discussion. Yes, he replied, such is very often the case, but what has that to do with us and our argument? A great deal, for there is certainly a danger of our getting unintentionally into a verbal opposition. In what way? Why, we valiantly and pugnaciously insist upon the verbal truth, that different natures ought to have different pursuits, but we never considered at all what was the meaning of sameness or difference of nature, or why we distinguish them when we assign different pursuits to different natures, and the same to the same natures. Why, no, he said, that was never considered by us. I said, suppose that by way of illustration we were to ask the question whether there is not an opposition in nature between bald men and hairy men, and if this is admitted by us, then if bald men are cobblers, we should forbid the hairy men to be cobblers, and conversely? That would be a jest, he said. Yes, I said, a jest, and why? Because we never meant, when we constructed the state, that the opposition of nature should extend to every difference, but only to those differences which affected the pursuit in which the individual is engaged. We should have argued, for example, that a physician and one who is in mind a physician may be said to have the same nature. True. Whereas the physician and the carpenter have different natures. Certainly. And if, I said, the male and female sex appear to differ in their fitness for any art or pursuit, we should say that such pursuit or art ought to be assigned to one or the other of them. But if the difference consists only in women bearing and men begetting children, this does not amount to a proof that a woman differs from a man in respect of the sort of education she should receive, and we shall therefore continue to maintain that our guardians and their wives ought to have the same pursuits. Very true, he said. Next, we shall ask our opponent how, in reference to any of the pursuits or arts of civic life, the nature of a woman differs from that of a man. That will be quite fair. And perhaps he, like yourself, will reply that to give a sufficient answer on the instant is not easy, but after a little reflection there is no difficulty. Yes, perhaps. Suppose, then, that we invite him to accompany us in the argument, and then we may hope to show him that there is nothing peculiar in the constitution of women, which would affect them in the administration of the state. By all means. Let us say to him, Come now, and we will ask you a question. When you spoke of a nature gifted or not gifted in any respect, did you mean to say that one man will acquire a thing easily, another with difficulty? A little learning will lead the one to discover a great deal, whereas the other, after much study and application, no sooner learns than he forgets. Or, again, did you mean— that the one has a body which is a good servant to his mind, while the body of the other is a hindrance to him. Would not these be the sort of differences which distinguish the man gifted by nature from the one who is ungifted? No one will deny that. 
And can you mention any pursuit of mankind in which the male sex has not all these gifts and qualities in a higher degree than the female? Need I waste time in speaking of the art of weaving, and the management of pancakes and preserves, in which womankind does really appear to be great, and in which for her to be beaten by a man is of all things the most absurd? You are quite right, he replied, in maintaining the general inferiority of the female sex, although many women are in many things superior to many men, yet on the whole what you say is true. And if so, my friend, I said, there is no special faculty of administration in a state which a woman has because she is a woman, or which a man has by virtue of his sex, but the gifts of nature are alike diffused in both. All the pursuits of men are the pursuits of women also, but in all of them a woman is inferior to a man. Very true. Then are we to impose all our enactments on men and none of them on women? That will never do. If a woman has a gift of healing, another not, one is a musician, and the other has no music in her nature? Very true. And one woman has a turn for gymnastic and military exercises, and another is unwarlike and hates gymnastics? Certainly. And one woman is a philosopher, and another is an enemy of philosophy. One has spirit, and another is without spirit? That is also true. Then one woman will have the temper of a guardian, and another not. Was not the selection of the male guardians determined by differences of this sort? Yes. Men and women alike possess the qualities which make a guardian. They differ only in their comparative strength or weakness. Obviously. And those women who have such qualities are to be selected as the companions and colleagues of men who have similar qualities, and whom they resemble in capacity and in character? Very true. And ought not the same natures to have the same pursuits? They ought. Then, as we were saying before, there is nothing unnatural in assigning music and gymnastic to the wives of the guardians. To that point we come round again. Certainly not. The law which we then enacted was agreeable to nature, and therefore not an impossibility or mere aspiration, and the contrary practice, which prevails at present, is in reality a violation of nature. That appears to be true. We had to consider, first, whether our proposals were possible, and, secondly, whether they were the most beneficial? Yes. And the possibility has been acknowledged? Yes. The very great benefit has next to be established? Quite so. You will admit that the same education which makes a man a good guardian will make a woman a good guardian, for their original nature is the same? Yes. End of Book 5, Part 1《Book Five, Part Two of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Republic by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Part Two. I should like to ask you a question. What is it? Would you say that all men are equal in excellence, or is one man better than another? The latter. And in the commonwealth which we were founding, do you conceive the guardians who have been brought up in our model system to be more perfect men, or the cobblers whose education has been cobbling? What a ridiculous question! You have answered me. I replied, Well, and may we not further say that our guardians are the best of our citizens? By far the best. And will not their wives be the best women? Yes, by far the best. And can there be anything better for the interests of the State than that the men and women of a State should be as good as possible? There can be nothing better. And this is what the arts of music and gymnastic, when present in such a manner as we have described, will accomplish? Certainly. Then we have made an enactment not only possible, but in the highest degree beneficial to the State? True. Then let the wives of our guardians strip, for their virtue will be their robe, and let them share in the toils of war and the defence of their country. Only in the distribution of labours the lighter are to be assigned to the women, who are the weaker natures, but in other respects their duties are to be the same. And as for the man who laughs at naked women exercising their bodies from the best of motives, in his laughter he is plucking, a fruit of unripe wisdom, and he himself is ignorant of what he is laughing at, or what he is about. For that is, and ever will be, the best of sayings, that the useful is the noble, and the hurtful is the base. Very true. Here, then, is one difficulty in our law about women, which we may say that we have now escaped. 
the wave has not swallowed us up alive for enacting that the guardians of either sex should have all their pursuits in common, to the utility and also to the possibility of this arrangement, the constancy of the argument with itself bears witness. Yes, that was a mighty wave which you have escaped. Yes, I said, but a greater is coming. You will not think much of this when you see the next. Go on, let me see. The law, I said, which is the sequel of this, and of all that has preceded, is to the following effect, that the wives of our guardians are to be common, and their children are to be common, and no parent is to know his own child, nor any child his parent. Yes, he said, that is a much greater wave than the other, and the possibility as well as the utility of such a law are far more questionable. I do not think, I said, that there can be any dispute about the very great utility of having wives and children in common. The possibility is quite another matter, and will be very much disputed. I think that a good many doubts may be raised about both. You imply that the two questions must be combined, I replied. Now I meant that you should admit the utility, and in this way, as I thought, I should escape from one of them, and then there would remain only the possibility. But that little attempt is detected, and therefore you will please to give a defence of both. Well, I said, I submit to my fate. Yet grant me a little favour. Let me feast my mind with a dream, as daydreamers are in the habit of feasting themselves when they are walking alone, for before they have discovered any means of effecting their wishes, that is a matter which never troubles them, they would rather not tire themselves by thinking about possibilities, but assuming that what they desire is already granted to them. They proceed with their plan, and delight in detailing what they mean to do when their wishes come true. That is a way which they have of not doing much good to a capacity which was never good for much. Now I myself am beginning to lose heart, and I should like with your permission to pass over the question of possibility at present. Assuming, therefore, the possibility of the proposal, I shall now proceed to inquire how the rulers will carry out these arrangements, and I shall demonstrate that our plan, if executed, will be of the greatest benefit to the State and to the guardians. First of all, then, if you have no objection, I will endeavour with your help to consider the advantages of the measure, and hereafter the question of possibility. I have no objection. Proceed. First, I think that if our rulers and their auxiliaries are to be worthy of the name which they bear, there must be willingness to obey in the one, and the power of command in the other. The guardians must themselves obey the laws, and they must also imitate the spirit of them in any details which are entrusted to their care. That is right, he said. You, I said, who are their legislator, having selected the men, will now select the women and give them to them. They must be as far as possible of like natures with them, and they must live in common houses and meet at common meals. None of them will have anything specially his or her own. They will be together, and will be brought up together, and will associate at gymnastic exercises. And so they will be drawn by a necessity of their natures to have intercourse with each other. Necessity is not too strong a word, I think. Yes, he said, necessity, not geometrical, but another sort of necessity which lovers know, and which is far more convincing and constraining to the mass of mankind. True, I said, and this, Glaucon, like all the rest, must proceed after an orderly fashion. In a city of the blessed, licentiousness is an unholy thing which the rulers will forbid. Yes, he said, and it ought not to be permitted. Then clearly the next thing will be to make matrimony sacred in the highest degree, and what is most beneficial will be deemed sacred. Exactly. And how can marriages be made most beneficial? That is a question which I put to you because I see in your house dogs for hunting, and of the nobler sort of birds not a few. Now, I beseech you, do tell me, have you ever attended to their pairing and breeding? In what particulars? Why, in the first place, although they are all of a good sort, are not some better than others? True. And do you breed from them all indifferently, or do you take care to breed only from the best? From the best. And do you take the oldest, or the youngest, or only those of ripe age? I choose only those of ripe age. And if care was not taken in the breeding, your dogs and birds would greatly deteriorate? Certainly. And the same of horses and animals in general? Undoubtedly. Good heavens, my dear friend, I said, what consummate skill will our rulers need if the same principle holds of the human species? Certainly, the same principle holds. But why does this involve any particular skill? Because, I said, our rulers will have often to practice upon the body corporate with medicines. 
Now you know that when patients do not require medicines, but have only to be put under a regimen, the inferior sort of practitioner is deemed to be good enough, but when medicine has to be given, then the doctor should be more of a man. That is quite true, he said, but to what are you alluding? I mean, I replied, that our rulers will find a considerable dose of falsehood and deceit necessary for the good of their subjects. We were saying that the use of all these things regarded as medicines might be of advantage. And we were very right. And this lawful use of them seems likely to be often needed in the regulations of marriages and births. How so? Why, I said, the principle has been already laid down that the best of either sex should be united with the best as often, and the inferior with the inferior as seldom as possible, and that they should rear the offspring of the one sort of union, but not of the other, if the flock is to be maintained in first-rate condition. Now these goings-on must be a secret which the rulers only know, or there will be a farther danger of our herd, as the guardians may be termed, breaking out into rebellion. Very true. Had we not better appoint certain festivals at which we will bring together the brides and bridegrooms, and sacrifices will be offered, and suitable hymeneal songs composed by our poets? The number of weddings is a matter which must be left to the discretion of the rulers, whose aim will be to preserve the average of population. There are many other things which they will have to consider, such as the effects of wars and diseases and any similar agencies, in order as far as this is possible to prevent the state from becoming either too large or too small. Certainly, he replied. We shall have to invent some ingenious kind of lots which the less worthy may draw on each occasion of our bringing them together, and then they will accuse their own ill luck and not the rulers. To be sure, he said. And I think that our braver and better youth, besides their other honours and rewards, might have greater facilities of intercourse with women given them. Their bravery will be a reason, and such fathers ought to have as many sons as possible. True and the proper officers, whether male or female or both, for offices are to be held by women as well as by men. Yes, the proper officers will take the offspring of the good parents to the pen or fold, and there they will deposit them with certain nurses who dwell in a separate quarter. But the offspring of the inferior, or of the better when they chance to be deformed, will be put away in some mysterious unknown place, as they should be. Yes, he said, that must be done if the breed of the guardians is to be kept pure." They will provide for their nurture, and will bring the mothers to the fold when they are full of milk, taking the greatest possible care that no mother recognizes her own child, and other wet nurses may be engaged if more are required. Care will also be taken that the process of suckling shall not be protracted too long, and the mothers will have no getting up at night or other trouble, but will hand over all this sort of thing to the nurses and attendants. You suppose the wives of our guardians to have a fine, easy time of it when they are having children. Why, said I, and so they ought. Let us, however, proceed with our scheme. We were saying that the parents should be in the prime of life. Very true. And what is the prime of life? May it not be defined as a period of about twenty years in a woman's life, and thirty in a man's? Which years do you mean to include? A woman, I said, at twenty years of age, may begin to bear children to the state, and continue to bear them until forty. A man may begin at five-and-twenty, when he has passed the point at which the pulse of life beats quickest, and continue to beget children until he be fifty-five. Certainly, he said, both in men and women those years are the prime of physical as well as of intellectual vigor. Any one above or below the prescribed ages who takes a part in the public hymenals shall be said to have done an unholy and unrighteous thing. The child of which he is the father, if he steals it into life, will have been conceived under auspices very unlike the sacrifices and prayers, which at each hymeneal priestesses and priests the whole city will offer, that the new generation may be better and more useful than their good and useful parents, whereas his child will be the offspring of darkness and strange lust. Very true, he replied. And the same law will apply to any one of those within the prescribed age, who forms a connection with any woman in the prime of life, without the sanction of the rulers, for we shall say that he is raising up a bastard to the state, uncertified and unconsecrated. Very true, he replied. This applies, however, only to those who are within the specified age. After that we will allow them to range at will, except that a man may not marry his daughter or his daughter's daughter, or his mother or his mother's mother, and women, on the other hand, are prohibited from marrying their sons or fathers, or son's son or father's father, and so on in either direction. 
and we grant all this, accompanying the permission with strict orders to prevent any embryo which may come into being from seeing the light, and if any force away to the birth, the parents must understand that the offspring of such an union cannot be maintained, and arrange accordingly. That so, he said, is a reasonable proposition. But how will they know who are fathers and daughters, and so on? They will never know. The way will be this. Dating from the day of the hymeneal, the bridegroom who was then married will call all the male children who are born in the seventh and tenth month afterwards his sons, and the female children his daughters, and they will call him father. And he will call their children his grandchildren, and they will call the elder generation fathers and grandmothers. All who were begotten at the time when their fathers and mothers came together will be called their brothers and sisters, and these, as I was saying, will be forbidden to intermarry. This, however, is not to be understood as an absolute prohibition of the marriage of brothers and sisters. If the lot favours them, and they receive the sanction of the Pythian oracle, the law will allow them. Quite right, he replied. Such is the scheme, Glaucon, according to which the guardians of our state are to have their wives and families in common. And now you would have the argument show that this community is consistent with the rest of our polity, and also that nothing can be better, would you not? Yes, certainly. Shall we try to find a common basis by asking of ourselves what ought to be the chief aim of the legislator in making laws, and in the organization of a state? What is the greatest good, and what is the greatest evil? and then consider whether our previous description has the stamp of the good or of the evil? By all means. Can there be any greater evil than discord and distraction and plurality where unity ought to reign? Or any greater good than the bond of unity? There cannot. And there is unity where there is community of pleasures and pains, where all the citizens are glad or grieved on the same occasions of joy and sorrow? No doubt. Yes, and where there is no common but only private feeling, a state is disorganized, when you have one half of the world triumphing and the other half plunged in grief at the same events happening to the city or the citizens? Certainly. Such differences commonly originate in a disagreement about the use of the terms mine and not mine, his and not his. Exactly so. And is not that the best ordered state in which the greatest number of persons apply the terms mine and not mine in the same way to the same thing? Quite true or that again which most nearly approaches to the condition of the individual, as in the body, but when a finger of one of us is hurt, the whole frame, drawn towards the soul as a centre and forming one kingdom under the ruling power therein, feels the hurt and sympathises altogether with the part affected, and we say that the man has a pain in his finger, and that the same expression is used about any other part of the body, which has a sensation of pain at suffering, or of pleasure at the alleviation of suffering. Very true, he replied, and I agree with you that in the best ordered state there is the nearest approach to this common feeling, which you describe. Then when any one of the citizens experiences any good or evil, the whole state will make his case their own, and will either rejoice or sorrow with him? Yes, he said, that is what will happen in a well-ordered state. It will now be time, I said, for us to return to our state, and see whether this, or some other, is most in accordance with these fundamental principles. Very good. Our state, like every other, has rulers and subjects? True. All of whom will call one another citizens? Of course. But is there not another name which people give to their rulers in other states? Generally they call them masters, but in democratic states they simply call them rulers. And in our state, what other name besides that of citizens do the people give the rulers? They are called saviors and helpers, he replied. And what do the rulers call the people? They are maintainers and foster fathers. And what do they call them in other states? Slaves. And what do the rulers call one another in other states? Fellow rulers. And what in ours? Fellow guardians. Did you ever know an example in any other state of a ruler who would speak of one of his colleagues as his friend, and of another as not being his friend? Yes, very often. And the friend he regards and describes as one in whom he has an interest, and the other as a stranger in whom he has no interest. Exactly. But would any of your guardians think or speak of any other guardian as a stranger? Certainly he would not, for every one whom they meet will be regarded by them as either brother or sister, or father or mother, or son or daughter, or as the child or parent of those who are thus connected with him. Capital, I said, but let me ask you once more. 
Shall they be a family in name only, or shall they in all their actions be true to the name? For example, in the use of the word father, would the care of a father be implied, and the filial reverence and duty and obedience to him, which the law commands, and is the violator of these duties to be regarded as an impious and unrighteous person, who is not likely to receive much good either at the hands of God or of man? Are these to be, or not to be, the strains which the children will hear repeated in their ears, by all the citizens, about those who are intimated to them to be their parents and the rest of their kinsfolk? These, he said, and none other, for what can be more ridiculous than for them to utter the names of family ties with the lips only, and not to act in the spirit of them? End of Book 5, Part 2《Book Five, Part Three of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Part Three. Then in our city the language of harmony and concord will be more often heard than in any other. As I was describing before, when any one is well or ill, the universal word will be, with me it is well, or it is ill. Most true. And agreeably to this mode of thinking and speaking, were we not saying that they will have their pleasures and pains in common? Yes, and so they will. And they will have a common interest in the same thing, which they will all alike call my own, and having this common interest they will have a common feeling of pleasure and pain. Yes, far more so than in other states." And the reason of this, over and above the general constitution of the state, will be that the guardians will have a community of women and children? That will be the chief reason. And this unity of feeling we admitted to be the greatest good, as was implied in our own comparison of a well-ordered state to the relation of the body and the members, when affected by pleasure or pain? That we acknowledge, and very rightly. Then the community of wives and children among our citizens is clearly the source of the greatest good to the state? Certainly. And this agrees with the other principle which we were affirming, that the guardians were not to have houses or lands, or any other property. Their pay was to be their food, which they were to receive from the other citizens, and they were to have no private expenses, for we intended them to preserve their true character of guardians. Right, he replied. Both the community of property and the community of families, as I am saying, tend to make them more truly guardians. They will not tear the city in pieces by differing about mine and not mine, each man dragging any acquisition which he has made into a separate house of his own, where he has a separate wife and children and private pleasures and pains. But all will be affected as far as may be by the same pleasures and pains, because they are all of one opinion about what is near and dear to them, and therefore they all tend toward a common end. Certainly, he replied, and as they have nothing but their persons which they can call their own, suits and complaints will have no existence among them. They will be delivered from all those quarrels of which money or children or relations are the occasion. Of course they will. Neither will trials for assault or insult ever be likely to occur among them. For that equals should defend themselves against equals we shall maintain to be honourable and right. We shall make the protection of the person a matter of necessity." That is good, he said. Yes, and there is a further good in the law, viz., that if a man has a quarrel with another, he will satisfy his resentment then and there, and not proceed to more dangerous lengths. Certainly. To the elder shall be assigned the duty of ruling and chastising the younger. Clearly. Nor can there be a doubt that the younger will not strike or do any other violence to an elder, unless the magistrates command him, nor will he slight him in any way. For there are two guardians, shame and fear, mighty to prevent him, shame which makes men refrain from laying hands on those who are to them in the relation of parents, fear that the injured one will be succoured by the others who are his brothers, sons, fathers. That is true, he replied. Then in every way the laws will help the citizens to keep the peace with one another. Yes, there will be no want of peace. And as the guardians will never quarrel among themselves, there will be no danger of the rest of the city being divided, either against them or against one another. None whatever. I hardly like even to mention the little meannesses of which they will be rid, for they are beneath notice, such, for example, as the flattery of the rich by the poor, and all the pains and pangs which men experience in bringing up a family, 
and in finding money to buy necessaries for their household, borrowing and then repudiating, getting how they can, and giving money into the hands of women and slaves to keep. The many evils of so many kinds, which people suffer in this way, are mean enough and obvious enough, and not worth speaking of. Yes, he said, a man has no need of eyes in order to perceive that. And from all these evils they will be delivered, and their life will be blessed as the life of Olympic victors, and yet more blessed. How so? The Olympic victor, I said, is deemed happy in receiving part only of the blessedness which is secured to our citizens, who have won a more glorious victory, and have a more complete maintenance at the public cost. For the victory which they have won is the salvation of the whole state, and the crown with which they and their children are crowned is the fullness of all that life needs. They receive rewards from the hands of their country while living, and after death have an honourable burial. Yes, he said, and glorious rewards they are. Do you remember, I said, how in the course of the previous discussion some one who shall be nameless accused us of making our guardians unhappy? They had nothing, and might have possessed all things. To whom we replied that, if an occasion offered, we might perhaps hereafter consider this question, but that, as at present advised, we would make our guardians truly guardians, and that we were fashioning the state with a view to the greatest happiness, not of any particular class, but of the whole. Yes, I remember. And what do you say, now that the life of our protectors is made out to be far better and nobler than that of Olympic victors? Is the life of shoemakers, or any other artisans, or of husbandmen, to be compared with it? Certainly not. At the same time I ought here to repeat what I have said elsewhere, that if any of our guardians shall try to be happy in such a manner that he will cease to be a guardian, and is not content with this safe and harmonious life, which in our judgment is of all lives the best, but infatuated by some youthful conceit of happiness which gets up into his head, shall seek to appropriate the whole state to himself, then he will have to learn how wisely Hesiod spoke, when he said, Half is more than the whole. If he were to consult me, I should say to him, Stay where you are, when you have the offer of such a life. You agree, then, I said, that men and women are to have a common way of life such as we have described, common education, common children, and they are to watch over the citizens in common, whether abiding in the city or going out to war. They are to keep watch together, and to hunt together like dogs. And always, and in all things, as far as they are able, women are to share with the men, and in so doing they will do what is best, and will not violate, but preserve the natural relation of the sexes. I agree with you, he replied. The inquiry, I said, has yet to be made, whether such a community be found possible, as among other animals, so also among men, and if possible, in what way possible? You have anticipated the question which I was about to suggest. There is no difficulty, I said, in seeing how war will be carried on by them. How? Why, of course they will go on expeditions together, and will take with them any of their children who are strong enough, that after the manner of the artisan's child they may look on at the work which they will have to do when they are grown up, and besides looking on they will have to help and be of use in war, and to wait upon their fathers and mothers. Did you never observe in the arts how the potter's boys look on and help, long before they touch the wheel? Yes, I have. And shall potters be more careful in educating their children, and in giving them the opportunity of seeing and practicing their duties, than our guardians will be? The idea is ridiculous, he said. There is also the effect on the parents, with whom, as with other animals, the presence of their young ones will be the greatest incentive to valor. That is quite true, Socrates, and yet if they are defeated, which may often happen in war, how great the danger is! The children will be lost as well as their parents, and the state will never recover. True, I said, but would you never allow them to run any risk? I am far from saying that. Well, but if they are ever to run a risk, should they not do so on some occasion when, if they escape disaster, they will be the better for it? Clearly. Whether the future soldiers do or do not see war in the days of their youth is a very important matter, for the sake of which some risk may be fairly incurred. Yes, very important. This, then, must be our first step, to make our children spectators of war, but we must also contrive that they shall be secured against danger, then all will be well. True. Their parents may be supposed not to be blind to the risks of war, but to know, as far as human foresight can, what expeditions are safe and what dangerous? 
that may be assumed. And they will take them on the safe expeditions and be cautious about the dangerous ones? True. And they will place them under the command of experienced veterans who will be their leaders and teachers? Very properly. Still, the dangers of war cannot be always foreseen. There is a good deal of chance about them. True. Then against such chances the children must be at once furnished with wings, in order that in the hour of need they may fly away and escape. What do you mean? he said. I mean that we must mount them on horses in their earliest youth, and when they have learnt to ride, take them on horseback to see war. The horses must not be spirited and warlike, but the most tractable and yet the swiftest that can be had. In this way they will get an excellent view of what is hereafter to be their own business, and if there is danger they have only to follow their elder leaders and escape. "'I believe you are right,' he said. "'Next, as to war, what are to be the relations of your soldiers to one another and to their enemies? I should be inclined to propose that the soldier who leaves his rank, or throws away his arms, or is guilty of any other act of cowardice, should be degraded into the rank of a husbandman and artisan. What do you think?' "'By all means, I should say. "'And he who allows himself to be taken prisoner "'may as well be made a present of to his enemies. "'He is their lawful prey, "'and let them do what they like with him. "'Certainly. "'But the hero who has distinguished himself, "'what shall be done to him? "'In the first place, he shall receive honour in the army "'from his youthful comrades. "'Every one of them in succession shall crown him. "'What do you say? "'I approve. "'And what do you say to his receiving the right hand of fellowship?' To that, too, I agree. But you will hardly agree to my next proposal. What is your proposal? That he should kiss and be kissed by them. Most certainly, and I should be disposed to go further, and say, let no one whom he has a mind to kiss refuse to be kissed by him while the expedition lasts, so that if there be a lover in the army, whether his love be youth or maiden, he may be more eager to win the prize of valour. Capital, I said, that the brave man is to have more wives than others has been already determined, and he is to have first choices in such matters more than others, in order that he may have as many children as possible. Agreed. Again, there is another manner in which, according to Homer, brave youths should be honoured, for he tells how Ajax, after he had distinguished himself in battle, was rewarded with long chains, which seems to be a compliment appropriate to a hero in the flower of his age, being not only a tribute of honour, but also a very strengthening thing. Most true, he said. Then in this, I said, Homer shall be our teacher, and we too, at sacrifices, and on the like occasions, will honour the brave according to the measure of their valour, whether men or women, with hymns and those other distinctions which we were mentioning, also with seats of precedence and meats and full cups, and in honouring them we shall be at the same time training them. That, he replied, is excellent. Yes, I said, and when a man dies gloriously in war, shall we not say, in the first place, that he is of the golden race? To be sure. Nay, have we not the authority of Hesiod for affirming that, when they are dead, they are holy angels upon the earth, authors of good, averters of evil, the guardians of speech-gifted men? Yes, and we accept his authority. We must learn of the God how we are to order the sepulture of divine and heroic personages, and what is to be their special distinction, and we must do as he bids? By all means. And in ages to come we will reverence them and kneel before their sepulchres as at the graves of heroes, and not only they, but any who are deemed pre-eminently good, whether they die from age, or in any other way, shall be admitted to the same honours. That is very right, he said. Next, how shall our soldiers treat their enemies? What about this? In what respect do you mean? First of all, in regard to slavery, do you think it right that Hellenes should enslave Hellenic states, or allow others to enslave them, if they can help? Should not their custom be to spare them, considering the danger which there is that the whole race may one day fall under the yoke of the barbarians? To spare them is infinitely better. Then no Hellene should be owned by them as a slave. That is a rule which they will observe, and advise the other Hellenes to observe. Certainly, he said, they will in this way be united against the barbarians, and will keep their hands off one another. Next, as to the slain, ought the conquerors, I said, to take anything but their armour? Does not the practice of despoiling an enemy afford an excuse for not facing the battle? Cowards skulk about the dead, pretending that they are fulfilling a duty, and many an army before now has been lost from this love of plunder. Very true. 
and is there not illiberality and avarice in robbing a corpse, and also a degree of meanness and womanishness in making an enemy of the dead body, when the real enemy has flown away, and left only his fighting gear behind him? Is not this rather like a dog who cannot get at his assailant, quarrelling with the stones which strike him instead? Very like a dog, he said. Then we must abstain from spoiling the dead or hindering their burial. Yes, he replied, we most certainly must. Neither shall we offer up arms at the temples of the gods, least of all the arms of Hellenes, if we care to maintain good feeling with other Hellenes, and, indeed, we have reason to fear that the offering of spoils taken from kinsmen may be a pollution unless commanded by the god himself? Very true. Again, as to the devastation of Hellenic territory, or the burning of houses, what is to be the practice? May I have the pleasure, he said, of hearing your opinion? Both should be forbidden, in my judgment. I would take the annual produce and no more. Shall I tell you why? Pray do. Why, you see, there is a difference in the names discord and war, and I imagine that there is also a difference in their natures. The one is expressive of what is internal and domestic, the other of what is external and foreign, and the first of the two is termed discord, and only the second war. That is a very proper distinction, he replied. And may I not observe with equal propriety that the Hellenic race is all united together by ties of blood and friendship, and alien and strange to the barbarians? Very good, he said. And therefore, when Hellenes fight with barbarians, and barbarians with Hellenes, they will be described by us as being at war when they fight, and by nature enemies, and this kind of antagonism should be called war. But when Hellenes fight with one another, we shall say that Hellas is then in a state of disorder and discord, they being by nature friends, and such enmity is to be called discord. I agree. Consider, then, I said, when that which we have acknowledged to be discord occurs, and a city is divided, if both parties destroy the lands and burn the houses of one another, how wicked does the strife appear! No true lover of his country would bring himself to tear in pieces his own nurse and mother. There might be reason in the conqueror depriving the conquered of their harvest, but still they would have the idea of peace in their hearts, and would not mean to go on fighting for ever. Yes, he said, that is a better temper than the other. And will not the city, which you are founding, be an Hellenic city? It ought to be, he replied. Then will not the citizens be good and civilized? Yes, very civilized. And will they not be lovers of Hellas, and think of Hellas as their own land, and share in the common temples? Most certainly. And any difference which arises among them will be regarded by them as discord only, a quarrel among friends, which is not to be called a war? Certainly not. Then they will quarrel as those who intend some day to be reconciled? Certainly. They will use friendly correction, but will not enslave or destroy their opponents. They will be correctors, not enemies? Just so. And as they are Hellenes themselves, they will not devastate Hellas, nor will they burn houses, nor ever suppose that the whole population of a city, men, women, and children, are equally their enemies, for they know that the guilt of war is always confined to a few persons, and that the many are their friends. And for all these reasons they will be unwilling to waste their lands, and raise their houses. Their enmity to them will only last until the many innocent sufferers have compelled the guilty few to give satisfaction? I agree, he said, that our citizens should thus deal with their Hellenic enemies, and with barbarians as the Hellenes now deal with one another. Then let us enact this law also for our guardians, that they are neither to devastate the lands of Hellenes, nor to burn their houses. Agreed, and we may agree also in thinking that these, like all our previous enactments, are very good. End of Book 5, Part 3book 5 part 4 of plato's republic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the republic by plato translated by benjamin joet book 5 part 4 but still i must say socrates that if you are allowed to go on in this way you will entirely forget the other question which at the commencement of this discussion you thrust aside is such an order of things possible, and how, if at all? For I am quite ready to acknowledge that the plan which you propose, if only feasible, would do all sorts of good to the State. 
I will add, what you have omitted, that your citizens will be the bravest of warriors, and will never leave their ranks, for they will all know one another, and each will call the other father, brother, son. And if you suppose the women to join the armies, whether in the same rank or in the rear, either as a terror to the enemy, or as auxiliaries in case of need, I know that they will then be absolutely invincible, and there are many domestic advantages which might also be mentioned, and which I also fully acknowledge. But as I admit all these advantages, and as many more as you please, if only this state of yours were to come into existence, we need say no more about them, assuming, then, the existence of the state. Now let us turn to the question of possibility and ways and means. The rest may be left." "'If I loiter for a moment, you instantly make a raid upon me,' I said, "'and have no mercy. I have hardly escaped the first and second waves, and you seem not to be aware that you are now bringing upon me the third, which is the greatest and heaviest. When you have seen and heard the third wave, I think you will be more considerate and will acknowledge that some fear and hesitation was natural, respecting a proposal so extraordinary as that which I have now to state and investigate. "'The more appeals of this sort which you make,' he said, the more determined are we that you shall teach us how such a state is possible. Speak out, and at once. Let me begin by reminding you that we found our way hither in the search after justice and injustice. True, he replied, but what of that? I was only going to ask whether, if we have discovered them, we are to require that the just man should in nothing fail of absolute justice, or may we be satisfied with an approximation, and the attainment in him of a higher degree of justice than is to be found in other men. The approximation will be enough. We were inquiring into the nature of absolute justice, and into the character of the perfectly just, and into injustice and the perfectly unjust, that we might have an idea. We were to look at these in order that we might judge of our own happiness and unhappiness according to the standard which they exhibited, and the degree in which we resembled them, but not with any view of showing that they could exist in fact. True, he said. Would a painter be any worse because, after having delineated with consummate art an ideal of a perfectly beautiful man, he was unable to show that any such man could ever have existed? He would be none the worse. Well, and were we not creating an ideal of a perfect state? To be sure. And is our theory a worse theory because we are unable to prove the possibility of a city being ordered in the manner described? Surely not, he replied. That is the truth, I said. But if at your request I am to try and show how and under what conditions the possibility is highest, I must ask you, having this in view, to repeat your former admissions. What admissions? I want to know whether ideals are ever fully realized in language. Does not the word express more than the fact, and must not the actual, whatever a man may think, always in the nature of things, fall short of the truth? What do you say? I agree. Then you must not insist on my proving that the actual state will, in every respect, coincide with the ideal. If we are only able to discover how a city may be governed as nearly as we proposed, you will admit that we have discovered the possibility which you demand, and will be contented." I am sure that I should be contented. Will not you? Yes, I will. Let me next endeavour to show what is that fault in states which is the cause of their present maladministration, and what is the least change which will enable a state to pass into the truer form, and let the change, if possible, be of one thing only, or if not, of two. At any rate, let the changes be as few and slight as possible. Certainly, he replied. I think, I said, that there might be a reform of the state, if only one change were made, which is not a slight or an easy, though a still possible one. What is it? he said. Now then, I said, I go to meet that which I liken to the greatest of the waves. Yet shall the word be spoken, even though the wave break and drown me in laughter and dishonour, and do you mark my words? Proceed. I said, Until philosophers are kings, or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy, and political greatness and wisdom meet in one, and those commoner natures who pursue either to the exclusion of the other are compelled to stand aside, cities will never have rest from their evils, nor the human race, as I believe, and then only will this our state have a possibility of life and behold the light of day. Such was the thought, my dear Glaucon, which I would fain have uttered if it had not seemed too extravagant, for to be convinced that in no other state can there be happiness, private or public, is indeed a hard thing. "'Socrates, what do you mean?' 
I would have you consider that the word which you have uttered is one at which numerous persons, and very respectable persons too, in a figure pulling off their coats all in a moment, and seizing any weapon that comes to hand, will run you at might and main, before you know where you are, intending to do heaven knows what, and if you don't prepare an answer, and put yourself in motion, you will be paired by their fine wits, and no mistake. "'You got me into a scrape,' I said. "'And I was quite right. However, I will do all I can to get you out of it. But I can only give you good will and good advice, and perhaps I might be able to fit answers to your questions better than another. That is all. And now, having such an auxiliary, you must do your best to show the unbelievers that you are right.' "'I ought to try,' I said, "'since you offer me such invaluable assistance. And I think that, if there is to be a chance of our escaping, we must explain to them whom we mean when we say that philosophers are to rule in the state. Then we shall be able to defend ourselves. There will be discovered to be some natures who ought to study philosophy, and to be leaders in the state, and others who are not born to be philosophers, and are meant to be followers rather than leaders. "'Then now for a definition,' he said. "'Follow me,' I said, "'and I hope that I may in some way or other be able to give you a satisfactory explanation. Proceed. I dare say that you remember, and therefore I need not remind you, that a lover, if he is worthy of the name, ought to show his love, not to some one part of that which he loves, but to the whole. I really do not understand, and therefore beg of you to assist my memory. Another person, I said, might fairly reply as you do, but a man of pleasure like yourself ought to know that all who are in the flower of youth do somehow or other raise a pang or emotion in a lover's breast, and are thought by him to be worthy of his affectionate regards. Is not this a way which you have with the fair? One has a snub nose, and you praise his charming face. The hook nose of another has, you say, a royal look, while he who is neither snub nor hooked has the grace of regularity. The dark visage is manly, the fair are children of the gods, and as to the sweet honey-pale, as they are called, what is the very name but the invention of a lover who talks in diminutives, and is not averse to paleness if appearing on the cheek of youth? In a word, there is no excuse which you will not make, and nothing which you will not say, in order not to lose a single flower that blooms in the springtime of youth. If you make me an authority in matters of love, for the sake of the argument I assent. And what do you say of lovers of wine? Do you not see them doing the same? They are glad of any pretext of drinking any wine." very good. And the same is true of ambitious men. If they cannot command an army, they are willing to command a file. And if they cannot be honoured by really great and important persons, they are glad to be honoured by lesser and mean people. But honour of some kind they must have. Exactly. Once more let me ask, does he who desires any class of goods desire the whole class or a part only? The whole. And may we not say of the philosopher that he is a lover, not of a part of wisdom only, but of the whole? yes, of the whole. And he who dislikes learning, especially in youth, when he has no power of judging what is good and what is not, such an one we maintain not to be a philosopher or lover of knowledge, just as he who refuses his food is not hungry, and may be said to have a bad appetite and not a good one? Very true, he said. Whereas he who has a taste for every sort of knowledge, and who is curious to learn and is never satisfied, may be justly termed a philosopher." Am I not right? Glaucon said, If curiosity makes a philosopher, you will find many a strange being will have a title to the name. All the lovers of sights have a delight in learning, and must therefore be included. Musical amateurs, too, are a folk strangely out of place among philosophers, for they are the last persons in the world who would come to anything like a philosophical discussion, if they could help, while they run about at the Dionysiac festivals as if they had let out their ears to hear every chorus whether the performance is in town or country, that makes no difference, there they are. Now are we to maintain that all these, and any who have similar tastes, as well as the professors of quite minor arts, are philosophers? Certainly not, I replied, they are only an imitation. He said, Who then are the true philosophers? Those, I said, who are lovers of the vision of truth. That is also good, he said, but I should like to know what you mean." To another, I replied, I might have a difficulty in explaining, but I am sure that you will admit a proposition which I am about to make. What is the proposition? That since beauty is the opposite of ugliness, they are two. Certainly. And inasmuch as they are two, each of them is one. True again. 
and of just and unjust, good and evil, and of every other class, the same remark holds. Taken singly, each one of them is one, but from the various combinations of them with actions and things, and with one another, they are seen in all sorts of lights, and appear many? Very true. And this is the distinction which I draw between the sight-loving, art-loving, practical class, and those of whom I am speaking, and who are alone worthy of the name of philosophers. How do you distinguish them? he said. The lovers of sounds and sights, I replied, are, as I conceive, fond of fine tones and colours, and forms, and all the artificial products that are made out of them. But their mind is incapable of seeing or loving absolute beauty. True, he replied. Few are they who are able to attain to the sight of this. Very true. And he who, having a sense of beautiful things, has no sense of absolute beauty, or who, if another lead him to a knowledge of that beauty, is unable to follow, of such an one, I ask, is he awake, or in a dream only? Reflect, is not the dreamer, sleeping or waking, one who likens dissimilar things, who puts the copy in the place of the real object? I should certainly say that such an one was dreaming. But take the case of the other, who recognizes the existence of absolute beauty, and is able to distinguish the idea from the objects which participate in the idea, neither putting the objects in the place of the idea, nor the idea in place of the objects. Is he a dreamer, or is he awake? He is wide awake. And may we not say that the mind of the one who has the knowledge, and that the mind of the other, who opines only, has opinion? Certainly. But suppose that the latter should quarrel with us and dispute our statement, can we administer any soothing cordial or advice to him, without revealing to him that there is sad disorder in his wits? We must certainly offer him some good advice, he replied. Come, then, and let us think of something to say to him. Shall we begin by assuring him that he is welcome to any knowledge which he may have, and that we are rejoiced at his having it? But we should like to ask him a question. Does he who has knowledge know something or nothing? You must answer for him. I answer that he knows something. Something that is or is not. Something that is, for how can that which is not ever be known? And are we assured, after looking at the matter from many points of view, that absolute being is or may be absolutely known, but that the utterly non-existent is utterly unknown? Nothing can be more certain. Good. But if there be anything which is of such a nature as to be and not to be, that will have a place intermediate between pure being and the absolute negation of being? Yes, between them. And, as knowledge corresponded to being and ignorance of necessity to not being, for that intermediate between being and not being, there has to be discovered a corresponding intermediate between ignorance and knowledge, if there be such? Certainly. Do we admit the existence of opinion? Undoubtedly. As being the same with knowledge, or another faculty? Another faculty. Then opinion and knowledge have to do with different kinds of matter corresponding to this difference of faculties? Yes. And knowledge is relative to being and knows being? but before I proceed further I will make a division. What division? I will begin by placing faculties in a class by themselves. They are powers in us, and in all other things, by which we do as we do. Sight and hearing, for example, I should call faculties. Have I clearly explained the class which I mean? Yes, I quite understand. Then let me tell you my view about them. I do not see them, and therefore the distinctions of figure, color, and the like, which enable me to discern the difference of some things, do not apply to them. In speaking of a faculty, I think only of its sphere and its result, and that which has the same sphere and the same result I call the same faculty, but that which has another sphere and another result I call different. Would that be your way of speaking? Yes. And will you be so very good as to answer one more question? Would you say that knowledge is a faculty, or in what class would you place it? Certainly knowledge is a faculty, and the mightiest of all faculties. And is opinion also a faculty? Certainly, he said, for opinion is that with which we are able to form an opinion. And yet you were acknowledging a little while ago that knowledge is not the same as opinion? Why, yes, he said, how can any reasonable being ever identify that which is infallible with that which errs? An excellent answer, proving, I said, that we are quite conscious of a distinction between them. Yes. Then knowledge and opinion, having distinct powers, have also distinct spheres or subject matters? That is certain. Being is the sphere or subject matter of knowledge, and knowledge is to know the nature of being. Yes. And opinion is to have an opinion? 
Yes. And do we know what we opine? Or is the subject matter of opinion the same as the subject matter of knowledge? Nay, he replied, that has been already disproven. If difference in faculty implies difference in the sphere or subject matter, and if, as we are saying, opinion and knowledge are distinct faculties, then the sphere of knowledge and of opinion cannot be the same. Then if being is the subject matter of knowledge, something else must be the subject matter of opinion? Yes, something else. Well, then, is not being the subject matter of opinion? Or, rather, how can there be an opinion at all about not being? Reflect. When a man has an opinion, has he not an opinion about something? Can he have an opinion which is an opinion about nothing? Impossible. He who has an opinion has an opinion about some one thing? Yes. And not being is not one thing, but, properly speaking, nothing? True. Of not being, ignorance was assumed to be the necessary correlative. Of being, knowledge? True, he said. Then opinion is not concerned either with being or with not being? Not with either. And can, therefore, neither be ignorance or knowledge? That seems to be true. But is opinion to be sought without and beyond either of them, in a greater clearness than knowledge? or in a greater darkness than ignorance? In neither. Then I suppose that opinion appears to you to be darker than knowledge, but lighter than ignorance? Both, and in no small degree. And also to be within and between them? Yes. Then you would infer that opinion is intermediate? No question. But were we not saying before, that if anything appeared to be a sort of which is and is not at the same time, that sort of thing would appear also to lie in the interval between pure being and absolute not-being, and that the corresponding faculty is neither knowledge nor ignorance, but will be found in the interval between them? True. And in that interval there has now been discovered something which we call opinion? There has. Then what remains to be discovered is the object which partakes equally of the nature of being and not-being, and cannot rightly be termed either, pure and simple. This unknown term, when discovered, we may truly call the subject of opinion, and assign each to their proper faculty, the extremes to the faculties of the extremes, and the mean to the faculty of the mean. True. This being premised, I would ask the gentleman who is of opinion that there is no absolute or unchangeable idea of beauty, in whose opinion the beautiful is the manifold, he, I say, your lover of beautiful sights, who cannot bear to be told that the beautiful is one, and the just is one, or that anything is one, to him I would appeal, saying, Will you be so very kind, sir, as to tell us whether, of all these beautiful things, there is one which will not be found ugly, or of the just which will not be found unjust, or of the holy which will not also be unholy? No, he replied, the beautiful will in some point of view be found ugly, and the same is true of the rest. And may not the many which are doubles also be halves, doubles, that is, of one thing and halves of another? Quite true. And things great and small, heavy and light, as they are termed, will not be denoted by these any more than by the opposite names? True, both these and the opposite names will always attach to all of them. And can any one of those many things which are called by particular names be said to be this, rather than not to be this? He replied, They are like the punning riddles which are asked at feasts, or the children's puzzle about the eunuch aiming at the bat, with what he hit him, as they say in the puzzle, and upon what the bat was sitting. The individual objects of which I am speaking are also a riddle, and have a double sense, nor can you fix them in your mind, either as being or not being, or both or neither. Then what will you do with them? I said. Can they have a better place than between being and not being? For they are clearly not in greater darkness or negation than not being, or more full of light and existence than being. That is quite true, he said. Thus, then, we seem to have discovered that the many ideas which the multitude entertain about the beautiful, and about all other things, are tossing about in some region which is halfway between pure being and pure not-being? We have. Yes, and we had before agreed that anything of this kind which we might find was to be described as matter of opinion, and not as matter of knowledge, being the intermediate flux which is caught and detained by the intermediate faculty. Quite true then those who see the many beautiful, and who yet neither see absolute beauty, nor can follow any guide who points the way thither, who see the many just, and not absolute justice, and the like, such persons may be said to have opinion, but not knowledge? That is certain. But those who see the absolute, and eternal, and immutable, may be said to know, and not to have opinion only? 
neither can that be denied. The one love and embrace the subjects of knowledge, the other those of opinion. The latter are the same, as I dare say you will remember, who listened to sweet sounds and gazed upon fair colours, but would not tolerate the existence of absolute beauty. Yes, I remember. Shall we then be guilty of any impropriety in calling them lovers of opinion, rather than lovers of wisdom, and will they be very angry with us for thus describing them? I shall tell them not to be angry. No man should be angry at what is true. But those who love the truth in each thing are to be called lovers of wisdom, and not lovers of opinion. Assuredly. End of Book 5